Hello, everyone. Good morning. Well, it's morning for me. I don't know what it is for you. Oh, Janice, look at that weird name you have on your account. So I was, didn't know exactly who that was. Ludge. No, that's my, my partner. I'm using my partner's computer. I'll change it. <laughs> we have a kitty. Well, sort of a kitty. How are you guys? I'm not upside down today. I was looking forward to you being upside down. I thought that would be really kind of cool. I'm I can make it work. Now I know how to do it. You could go sideways even. We could all go sideways on cue. We'll all go. Doo, 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 doo. We'll... Tell Mitchell what you what you did, Janice. I um, signed in. I was I was talking to a class. I only had twenty minutes, so it was a really quick thing, and. Uh, when I signed into Zoom, I was upside down. My picture was upside down. Mm -hmm. So I spent the whole time because I didn't know how to fix it. And I didn't, I spent the whole lecture upside down. <laughs> well, All these college kids going, why is she upside down? <laughs> yeah, no, like, uh, why should we be paying attention to somebody who's upside down? It was kind of funny. They were, they were I, I laughed. I laughed like heck. <laughs> so there's, all, there's all sorts of more complicated things you can do if you have plugins or if you have something like OBS you can just go crazy with what you show on uh, on um, on Zoom. Well, it was it was simple. It was a very simple thing, but we had uh, she she uh, had a couple of us. We had a couple of us sitting there trying to figure it out, and somebody goes, "Well, how about this?" I can't yeah. get us to broadcast to, to um, YouTube. I'm trying to get it to go, and it's saying live on YouTube. Hmm. Too many Google accounts, I guess. Really odd. Let's see here. I think I can shrink myself up like that. Oh, that's kind of weird. Yeah, I'm a floating head. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's a little odd. It's kind of surrealist. That is kind of weird. One of those in, in, in um, oh, no, okay, I guess I got it. Let's see. I had to check one of the permissions. All right, it's setting it up. Check one of the permissions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you guys are. Okay, so I guess we're we're live on. Oh, but it's it's live to my channel. All right, it's setting it up. Check one of the... I gotta mute it. How interesting. I thought I was gonna go to the other channel. I guess I'll broadcast it live from my channel and then we'll move it over to the, move the smaller videos over. I don't know, let me think. Think about that a minute. How to exit this. No, it's going to a SOW team. Okay. No, it's in the right place. Apparently. I'm waiting for a lot of things to go wrong. Here we go. <laughs> Here's Adrian. And YouTube doesn't show if your if your video is turned off. It doesn't show you. It's just the people who are on. That's interesting. I guess that's a nice way of keeping people from being on who don't want to be on. Here's the Happy New Year baby, Bob. Uh, Did you bring a chicken? Morning, Adrian. Look at her all set up with her beautiful sound equipment behind her and everything. All right, can we hear you? I, I didn't hear you. Oh, there you are. No, I can't hear you. Okay. Oh, okay. You were just waving. Oh. oh, that I've had my microphone turned way down. 
I was doing recording for Richard, so yeah, that's why. Oh, look, Bob's at the grocery store. Yeah, we're at Costco. Hey, Bob at Costco. <laughs> I guess you don't have a chicken with you. No. <laughs> hey, Janice. Mitchell. Hi. Oh, he's getting chicken nuggets. <laughs> Is that to terrorize your chickens with? Chicken nuggets. Oh, that's too funny. Uh, I'm, I'm, pa I'm a past the chicken. I'm past the chicken section. This mic on my Bluetooth doesn't work as well. Yeah, you but, probably uh, will have to sign him back in again. Yeah, but I'm not going to talk after the hearing the thing. So. Yeah, I'm not okay. I'm not seeing the YouTube video. Well, Todd, I I hit the um the YouTube link within the Monterey County Skeptics. Oh, maybe it's, maybe I've got it going to the wrong place. It's just going to the general page. Oh, it says it's going to GSOW team. Could I be sending it to the wrong place? I think I might be. You're just sending it to your general about time page. Oh, well, that's what I meant to. No, wait, it go. But it didn't go. It's on, it's it's going to GSOW. I think it's going to one of the other old accounts. Let me try to end it. And okay. try to end it. Okay. Okay, so let's in that. And I want it to go. Oh, coffee. Okay, so I've got four names here. Let me see. I gotta, I gotta mute. Let's try. Try that one. Oh, here we go. Oh, the server cannot process the request because it's malformed. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, whatever that means. Bad request. That's really strange. Let me try again. I mean, I could put every I can put the videos over there afterwards. Yeah. But I will need to change the um. I will need to change the um, where it's being broadcast for people to see. That's right. Yeah, it's giving me a bad error. Okay, so let me let me do that. I will put. <sighs> okay. I wish we could do Facebook and and um, Facebook and um, YouTube. YouTube at the same time. You've got it set up that way, right? Uh, we did for a while, uh, but you have to pay for the service. It's, it costs about $160 Canadian a year. Or maybe it was US, I don't remember. Go live. Okay, here it comes again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to our schedule for today. And just change it. Perfect. Once I get a good year. Okay, there we are. Here we go. Started streaming. So we are at, here comes Paula. So uh, Adrian, I have all of the sounds turned off for when somebody needs to be let in. Ooh, so we have so, to pay attention. So we kind of, <laughs> yeah, otherwise, and everybody's set so that they cannot, um, you know, they come in as a mute. Right. And nobody can take over the whiteboard. <laughs> Yay. No, I would find that amusing if someone did that on my. Like, oh, look, we yeah. have a troll. <laughs> <laughs> then trying to figure out who it is. Oh, that'd be very exciting. <laughs> yeah. If I, my guess is it's Rob Palmer. Well, he's oh, not here yet, so we can't blame no. him. No. <laughs> uh, he, he can be the, the scapegoat. Yeah, yeah, I, he's might as well. <laughs> okay, let's see. YouTube channel, join the conversation. Okay, I got to change that. Getting a weird hum. Do you hear that? I hear that, yes. Let me try. I just muted Lois to see if that was it. Oh, is Lois here? Well, her. Oh, yes, she is. Hi, Lois. Kitty is here. <laughs> she doesn't say anything. Oh, it's great. She's here. Hey, there's Lois. There yeah. Is. Oh, wow. There's Lois. I like that kitty cat. That was so sweet. 
YouTube channel. Join the conversation. So oh, you're you're muted, Lois. There we go. The, the kitty's in my lap. Oh, uh, I have one beside me. Ham. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. Oh. There's one right there. Where are the others? Are it's too early for them. They're shocked that I'm up as early as I am. <laughs> yeah, you've been sleeping in a lot lately. I don't think I got out of bed till eleven thirty yesterday. Um, Paula, I'm here. Just log in. Just waking up and stuff. <laughs> I'm about our I like it because you guys are an hour behind us, so I got to not have to get up too early. There you go. Okay, so now I've edited the page. Let's see that it did that. So we don't have to monitor YouTube, Ben? Yeah, but I, I mean, do. I have it there. Yeah. I will type something. Apparently we're, it's working. Oh, waiting room. There we go. Oh, Romero's here. Yeah. Uh. Okay, close that down. I've muted that. And I get rid of that. Here's our schedule. <clears throat> Our first up today is going to be Klaus and Sven. Is that how you say his name? I got to make sure I know how to say his name. Sven. You can't be out of character, though, Susan. Me? Yeah. What? How's it, how's it spelled? S T E E N. Oh, okay. Stein. Oh, Steen. Yeah, Steen. Steen. He's from Copenhagen. Mm. Something. <laughs> hopefully we'll hopefully we'll visit him this summer oh oh my goodness what a what a day what a what a world who would have ever thought <laughs> we'd be in this situation for two years yeah oh my gosh and yeah. more we thought we'd be way over this by now well mm -hmm. it's funny because I remember listening to Paul Offit at the very, very beginning. And maybe I saw some of his tweets and him saying, yeah, this is going to be a couple of years. <laughs> I think he knew. Nobody <laughs> wanted to listen to that. No. <laughs> but, you know, he's been doing this long enough. I think he knows how long it takes to, to do stuff. And Well, also at the very beginning, you have to remember, there's no way we believed we were going to get vaccines out that quickly. No. Oh, that's that right. Really odd. And then to have the hesitancy around it was unpredictable oh. too. Yeah, that's totally unpredictable. Yeah. So they probably thought vaccines wouldn't be out for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. You know, even at, at a rush, a couple of years yeah. would have been a lot. It would have been very good. Yeah. Paul Offit's going to be on something soon. I can't remember which, what it is. Was but he he's going to be on yeah, some. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing something too, Lois. I don't remember what it was really? either. Well, yeah. I'll be having my morning breakfast and all of a sudden he'll pop up on the on MSNBC, whatever I'm watching. I'll be like, mm. make my eggs. And then it's like, and we have an expert, Paul Offit. And you're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Paul, he Thank seems like joining me for breakfast this morning. He seems like such a nice guy. I read one of his books and I text, I Twittered him or whatever, messaged yeah. him. And he responded. I thought that was really nice because I don't expect responses. I just want to show my appreciation for the work they do. He must get thousands. Of, he must. You know, well, if I email him, he, he emails me back like yeah. the next morning. It's like, That's he's amazing. Got a, but I mean, I don't get a huge long response or anything. It's most no. Susan, thank you, sir, for everything you do. I, I keep him abreast of the stuff we do on, on uh, GSOW that's right. vaccine related and right. just to let him know. And he's, and he'll write back. But nice. he says, um, uh, I have a feeling that he and people like Stephen Navala and stuff like that, they just got the schedule and it's like, okay, I'm sitting down and responding on my email schedule. Cause you'll get it at the same time. You know, it's always, at, you can expect right. a response at a certain yeah. time. So you think that he's got it all like 
compartmentalized or something about how he does it. And he's like, okay, next, next, next. <laughs> I don't know. I'm he's responding on, to all the time. He's on Skeptical Inquirer. I think it's the 20th. Ah. Oh, of this month? Yeah. Of January. I'm on in February. Oh. I got a spot. They said they're going to, they want to catch up with me. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I said, okay. So I want her, to, I want um, Leanne to do a interview hmm. so that I can cover lots of little areas. Like, okay, so what's new in this area? What's new in that area? What's new in that area? Instead of just being like, I'm going to do a talk. Oh, here's Faith. What happened to Romero? Oh, Romero's there. I'm right here. <laughs> oh. Hi, Romero. <laughs> he has He's his own theme. Here, let me go over to the side so I can wave back. <laughs> but I got to look that way, too. Face <laughs> in another room? Yeah, she's downstairs. I think she's making food. <laughs> well, Bob's at uh, Costco. <laughs> Hi, Faith. Hey, Faith. Hello. She's making us breakfast. Actually, it's noon here, so I'm making dinner. Oh, well, fine. <laughs> well, yesterday I was just telling everybody I woke up at 11:30, so that was my uh, that was my um, uh, breakfast is like at noon. All right, we're steam. I just found out, as sad as it could be, is that the elementary school that I and my older siblings went to and my children went to is being torn down. Ooh. I just found that out. I was like. How do I feel about that? How do I feel about that? Well, it depends on your memories, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I just, yeah, I discovered that mine was torn down and I was devastated. Yeah. Oh. I thought it was the most fantastically well-designed elementary school in the world. And they tore it down. Wow. It was well, I, I felt Who they that replace way. it with? They haven't. Our school that I taught in for 13 years was deemed unsafe and they closed it down. Uh, that's the, at the Chinook Learning, right, Lois? At uh, oh. off Crow Child well, what there. What was unsafe about it? Like the structure or the, was it asbestos <laughs> or what? Uh, all of the above. <laughs> it was, oh, we've been, yeah. uh, we were there when I first, uh, when we moved here in 2005 and I got the job at Chinook and they said that year that we would be moving within the next two years and it never happened. In fact, what happened is they kind of got caught out every year I was there, there was a flood of some sort because there was a hole in a roof somewhere. Um, there, we would be walking down the halls and there's water dripping down into a bucket. I mean, it was pretty oh. sad that we actually worked in this, this building, but even though it was so decrepit and awful, it was such a wonderful place to work. It was very emotional to have. To was leave. it the people that were admitted? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it was, it, uh, and, and it was the students we, we were dealing with students who hadn't made it in the regular system. So they were a very special group and well, those are great memories yeah yeah it was a it was a very good place to work and I love my interview because it was all about if a student has these issues what will you do mm. and you know instead of the you know, what's your philosophy of education like they were very pointed about helping kids English as a second language was very common um a lot of them had severe anxiety obsessive compulsiveness ADHD there are lots of lots of issues, cancer survivors. So, you know, people oh. who couldn't graduate because they developed cancer in high school. So, it, you know, they were, it was a very unique population and it was, it was a great place to work and I miss it. <laughs> yeah. It's still standing, but it's boarded up and it, I don't know if it got sold, it was for sale and they're going to tear it down and probably build apartment buildings. Apartments. Yeah. So there's not room for a school in that area. I mean, it's not a need, I should say. Yeah. Oh, there's always, well, probably not because it's sort of central Calgary where there's not a lot of kid population, most likely, um, I'm guessing. So, uh, yeah, it was too, it became too expensive to maintain it. And it was basically condemned, I'm pretty sure. Lois, <laughs> <laughs> well, you said they tore your school down. Are they planning on putting something in the spot? I have no idea because it's, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not in touch with anybody back there. <laughs> mm. So I have no idea. 
And they tore down my high school too, which was the most beautiful high school building that ever happened. And they wow. did rebuild something there and it was just a normal, ordinary old, you know, nothing school. And they tore down this gorgeous stone. It looked like a castle. Mm -hmm. oh. And they tore it down. I was so, oh, everybody, there was a big, oh, crusade to save it, but yeah. they didn't, so. Probably looks just like um, uh, a Hogwarts. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we can't have that here, not in Kansas. Oh, it was beautiful. I loved it, yeah. We're getting the Calgary contingent Vincent's coming. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes. Calgary, boy, we're just really going to have a massive it's, Calgary. It's, it's awesome, is it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty, yeah. pretty, yeah. I'm pretty depressed right now. So. Aww. But, oh, well. We'll come here. So, Adrian. Yes. My mom was looking around Stan's place and she thought it was going to be pretty simple. Mm. It's not. Okay. This is a friend of uh, Vincent's yeah. who's died. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to be simple. We need a lot more help. Okay. Uh, we're going to do what we can do. Yep. We'll do what we You're can do. We're having an estate sale for somebody. And yeah. Mess, like, yeah. And, and my husband's coming tomorrow and Troy and maybe one of his friends is coming to help tomorrow. Good. Good. That there. would be yeah. great. Oh, Susan, I would love to see you. And Susan. <laughs> Susan <laughs> from, from Salinas, California to Calgary. In the that snow. would be a, that this, would the be flame of land skidding. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to me how there's very little weather where the airport shuts down here. They're so well prepared that we can get the biggest snowfall and the planes won't fly only because they haven't arrived from other airports. <laughs> but if they, if they can make it here, they're flying. <laughs> yeah, if your stomach can handle the, uh, yeah, the turbulence. <laughs> oh, my God. My, my son left for school one year. I was so afraid of him flying because we had hurricane, almost hurricane force winds here oh, and they geez. still were flying. And he said it was a little bumpy, but it wasn't too bad. <laughs> I, hurricane I was, force. Oh, yeah. Do you remember yeah, when I remember. They, they closed oh, the downtown? Oh, I remember it. Yeah, because stuff yeah. fell down off, like the, the, there was stuff being blown off buildings and it was falling down. So they closed the whole downtown area yeah. of Calgary, yeah. but they were still flying. <laughs> Yeah. One time I was in Boise in the airport waiting to take off. It was really bad winter blizzard. And this was many, many years ago. And I heard an announcement, you know, would anyone, everyone on flight, West Coast flight such and such come to the West Coast desk. So I went and I said, yeah, I'm on flight such and such. And they said, how much do you weigh? <laughs> they, they were literally your luggage and adding up whether or not they could take off uh-huh oh, that <laughs> that's scary uh-huh <laughs> oh, they that's wouldn't have me on there well they well it just has a balance i have been on flights where they have put us they didn't ask us how much we weighed but they put people on some side and then they take you out of your seat and put yeah. you on the other side of the plane so to balance the plane. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've seen that. And they're like, okay, then now you can move to your seat again. You're like, is it really that fickle? I mean, you know, that seems a little odd. Well, I wonder what that's, kind of plane that was. That's kind of scary. Well, we, we flew on a little, I think. Yeah, like that. Small, planes, small planes might be like that, but yeah. I don't know about big planes. It was a bigger plane. I think I was flying to New Zealand. Really? From California. So it was a big plane, I think. No, no maybe it, it wasn't, but it was a bigger plane. If it was going to New Zealand, it would be a bigger plane. Yeah, I, I would never fly a small, <laughs> tiny plane. No. Well, we, we had to fly in a small plane, a Dash 8, when Cam was getting interviewed by universities down mm -hmm. in the East Coast. And we had to fly from, uh, from New York to Albany. And there were, as it turned out, three people on the plane <laughs> and we were all bunched up in one on one side and they did they came and i had to be one side the other cam was on the other and the guy was at the back like we they they split us up to balance us and i think uh, what was it mitch who said that it's because it's a small plane and i think that was mm -hmm. it well the so one that, i was on from boise was a dc3 oh 
The aisle was like uphill. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. It was wild. Oh, and I don't even know if they fly those commercially anymore. I don't think so. Yeah. That Not was, in that North was America, the workhorse. Anyway. <laughs> it was the workhorse of airplanes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the skeptic camp. Social one here. Kept yeah, this is this is social. this is so Susan. The social. This is so that we iron out all the little bugs that might be coming up. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, and I, I should check the YouTube. Uh, oh, I haven't looked either. Yeah, I guess I could. I could put it on another monitor, but I have Facebook on that one. Oh, there yeah, it is. It. But it is up. You guys can see that we're there. Yeah, yeah now I can see it. It's funny to see you guys delayed. I know it is so weird, and it's so weird to see the my face reversed. Uh, oh, I have uh, <laughs> Adrian. So I have uh, more pictures for you if you'd like to see them. Of what? Pictures of, of what? Uh, Stan's uh, place. Oh yes, sure. Oh, send them. Oh, send them. That would be great. Like, I know my kids, my kid, my son would like is interested in those bookshelves. So we'll take a look at them tomorrow. Bookshelf. Hey, okay. Mitchell, since I've got you there, I didn't, uh, I didn't get to go to the New York City Skeptic. How did that go? Did you get the videos up online? Because I really would like to see it. Um, yeah, we don't have the videos up online yet, but it all went relatively well. We had a couple of little technical hiccups here and there, but it largely went very well. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to get the videos up relatively soon. But there's I other think I've subscribed to your channel, so I think I would get a notification when they upload. I think so. I, I listened and, to that one, Susan. Was that was pretty good. Wants, wants us to get out, but you went to it. Yeah, yeah, I said the one. Time. Yeah, some of the talks look real interesting, so I'm, I'm looking forward to. And going. the one, the guy with the audio pareidolia, it was hysterical. My God, who, who had that? Oh, he did. Did he do that know, last year? He, that was so fun. He played, um, um, you know, songs and singing, people singing in foreign languages, but then put up uh, captions that sounded, you know, and then you heard what, what the caption said. <laughs> it was just, yeah, that, you know, that was me. It was hysterical. It was you, Mitch. Oh, you did it? That was, me. That was you? mine. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you said that, Bob. <laughs> I, I, grew, I grew a beard since then, but it was me. I, I, well, I, it, you know, I, I have no memory for stuff like that, but uh, I speak from the heart. So, okay, I, I definitely got to see that then, <laughs> since that comes highly recommended. So, yeah, yeah we got to see I, that. I discovered, I discovered there's a K pop song with my name in it. Like my first name and my last name are in a K pop song. Re well, not, as, not really. It, it just sounds like. Oh, kind of sounds like you're saying your name. They're singing in Korean, hey, but to my name. ears, it sounds like they're singing Mitchell, and in another part, they're singing the, the name Lampert. Oh, not at, like, not, not, not at the same time. Not not at the same time. But um, a, I'll, maybe I'll share that video. Oh, that's point. very but, interesting. There's a TikTok trend going on with that right now. Like, there's one audio thing that. So I, the song is titled Pope is a Rock Star, but everybody tags it as Go Little Rock Star. So they're talking about things that they're doing and people go in the comments and they're correcting them that, no, that's not what the audio says. What's the title <laughs> called? Coke? Pope. Hey, Adrian, Pope is a rock star. getting it. Oh, is Pope a, a rapper? No, it's just they're talking about the Pope of the Catholic Church being a rock star. But the way she sings it, it sounds like Go Little right. Rock Star. Yeah. I guess and now I can't hear TikTok. Go Little Rock Star anymore. I hear Pope is a rock star every time. Oh, because yeah, they, I mean, these types of things have existed song. since the since the since the invention of recordings of songs. Oh yeah. Like um, they're, referred, they're, be... they're referred to as Mondegreens. Yeah. Uh, or, or Lady Mondegreens. 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 Mondegreen. Yeah. If you go back to the, like albino black sheep, the early days of internet memes, there was one um, trend that they did that was Colin Mockery and the French erotic film. And they would take French songs, German songs and create English words over what it sounded like they were saying. Yep, yep. <laughs> and like Colin Mockery was saving the world. Oh, interesting. I remember growing up, there was a song my sister had and it was Edie, I mean, that's what I thought it was. I don't know what it is. It's, it's by the Kinks, I think. Is yeah. it? And when, when I when I was when I was a child, I used to sing, uh, "Sweet dreams are made of cheese." <laughs> <laughs> when I disagree, yeah. 
<laughs> I disagree. <laughs> yes. no, I do. This is, I uh, the the, the, the Mondegreen thing, it comes from a, an old song where they killed yes. the Lord. Oh, yeah. So I was about so to explain. And laid him on the green. And it comes out as Lady Mondegreen. So that's right. the origin of the Mondegreen. Yeah, I was going to explain that too. Yeah, but um, what else is there? Uh, there's a bunch of things like that. So there, there's a whole, uh, in my presentation, I showed a whole uh, video. So, someone posted on the, on the internet a long time ago uh, an Indian pop song that, uh, uh, um, uh, that uh, it was called Benny, it was, to, to, to our ears, it was called Benny Lava. And uh, if you if you go to YouTube and look for Benny Lava, you'll probably find uh, copies of it. Benny Lava. Benny Lava. Well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll link you to the best. I'll link it to the best. There's several. The, the original copy of the of that video was taken off, and so what's on YouTube now are, are like copies of copies or recreations. So they they vary in quality, and I will uh, I'll link you to the uh, <clears throat> I'll link you to the uh, put the link in the description for like the better ones and straighten straighten the hat of because that was going to bug the heck out of me all day <laughs> i have the hat straight oh my gosh is anybody old enough to remember that little kid's song mersey dotes and dozy dotes oh a little lambsy divey yes i it was Lambsy years divey. before i knew that it was really words thank you for bringing really? back that memory <laughs> <laughs> Vincent, you'll just have it in your head for the rest of the yeah. year. <laughs> Dozy dotes. Love it, yeah. Dozy dotes. A little lambsy divey. I would eat ivy too. A kid will eat ivy too. Is that what it was? I, oh, a kid will eat ivy too. Yeah. Mary's oh, Jan. Oh. Hi, Jan. Jan is a, a longtime Monterey County skeptic. Uh, oh. member that moved to Podunk Nowhere, I think. Where'd you go, Jan? <laughs> Iowa? Indiana seems like it's an I word. Idaho. Oh no, that's not nowhere. Well, Penny Lava. Okay, thanks, Mitch. She moved a long ways away. She was in one of our first stings. She was in. <laughs> she was in Operation Bumblebee. We went to the Chip Coffee Show. Her and I and uh, Sheldon Helms. So we and we sat together and cried. <laughs> they pretended they knew each other for years and. And Chip Coffee got up there and started telling um, Jan about her sister who had died in 9-11. No, her, no, her. Yeah, something to his 9-11. I think her sister had something to his 9-11 and we just hugged each other and cried because he was just so accurate. <laughs> it was all fake, of course, but it was, so, it was so funny. I mean, not funny, funny. And then he was just going on and on. And then finally, after he read all three of us, I just kind of leaned way down in the seat. And I'm like, all right, you guys, we got to go. <laughs> I, can't, I can't handle any more of this. It was awful. Remember that, Jan? You're on mute. You're on mute, dear. Jan, you're on mute. OK. There now she I'm is. Okay. Yes, I remember it very clearly. <laughs> oh, what a what an adventure! What an adventure that was. That started me started us off really, and then we just kept going with more operations. But that was the first one. Bumblebee's the only one that doesn't have a food name in the in the title, and it's a one word. All the others have been two word operations to deal with food. <laughs> Very memorable experience for me. <laughs> Good old Chip. He's still around. That's too bad. I know. And we had a nice photo with him. Each of us took a photo with him. He held my little pink purse and he just, oh, what a nice purse. And he held it. And he took a picture of me and him and he's holding my purse. <laughs> Dude, you couldn't tell that I was there to scam you. Okay. Well, you're spirit. I think you still have a photo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we do somewhere. I know I have. Okay, I'm just double checking to make sure everything is all set here. So, 9:30. Over the rainbow. Oh, stop! <laughs> There's McGregor again. She's trying to get back in. Gail, 
Myrna. I don't know who Myrna is. Okay, we'll see. Sherry Miller. I wonder if that Sherry Miller, is that who that is? She's muted. I, I don't I don't see her, so she's not here. So we're I think you're not supposed to address people who aren't really here, who can't hear you, you know. That is her. Hey, did you I'm see your here. did you see your husband on the front page of the weekly uh, article? Yeah, we had a few phone calls from people. <laughs> no way, really? Yeah. <laughs> they said, I know you. I know that person. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. Usually he's on the news just because somebody's rescuing him from the water or something. So this time <laughs> it, was, it was a nice one. <laughs> somebody's rescuing him from the water. Yeah. Oh, he does he does do a, a, a kayak thing, right? Yeah, and, uh, there's been a few times when he's promised me when the 12 foot swells are out that he wouldn't go. And um things happened and he ended up on the news. So then he had to confess and. <laughs> Sorry, honey, I was out on the kayak and it was only, it was only 11 and a half foot swell. So I was okay. <laughs> I, I didn't really mean to go out. It just, you know, I was out there paddling and it just happened. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a couple of calls. That's interesting, you know? Yeah. Uh, did you get a couple calls? We had a we had a surge of people who joined the the group after it, so that I, I'm I'm pleased. <laughs> yeah, it was a good. It was that Coast Weekly is a good um, way to get the word out. The woman contacted Kathy, and so we didn't even do outreach, saying, "Hey, do an article on us." She she found us. Cool. I should have thought about that. I should have said you know, we should have done outreach. We've done it in the past, but always because it was physical. So, yeah. So I don't know. Good morning, Gail. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Where are you at? In, uh, Oregon City, Oregon. Oh, in Oregon City, in Oregon. I don't think I know where that is. What is it it's near? A, it's a suburb. It's uh, we're, we're part of the Portland metro area. Oh, if I say, but we're, city. yeah, we're we're a historic city in a uh, historic small town. Why would they name themselves Oregon City? I guess if it was a historic town, and that's where it's, when we're the uh, it's the end of the Oregon Trail. Oh, yeah, that is history city. All right, I'm at the end of the right, where I'm living right now is the end of the Oregon Trail. I'm looking up the Wikipedia page right now. <laughs> Oh yeah, look at that. On the Willamette River. Willamette. Willamette. Willamette, damn it. <laughs> oh, that's an easy way of remembering it, huh? It's the rhymes of damn it, Willamette. <laughs> oh, neat. Oh yeah, that's built up. Paper mill. Huh. I don't think I'd ever heard of that before. Look at all these notable people from there okay well yeah huh i, mean, I could just say i'm from portland but i'm not in portland so but it's uh the, no it's, i think you should give perfect. oregon city it's full do yeah. <laughs> maybe 12 or so miles from you know from the uh portland uh proper oh interesting yeah no that's well welcome i have i think i want to go check out that city that looks like a very historical place i love oregon oregon is oregon yeah, wonderful Terrific. Place. I love Oregon. Yeah. So you came over from uh, Janine's um, probably message that that um, are you part of the Oregonians yeah, for? I'm a part of several groups. Like human, I'm actually part of the Humanists of Greater Portland and also Freedom from Religion Foundation mm -hmm. um, and uh, CFI. Oh yeah. And I probably. I think this was just <laughs> one of the other things I was going to, and I sounded interesting, so I wanted to check it out. Well, we'll we'll try. <laughs> We'll try to get it interesting. I haven't heard from our first speaker at this moment. I, I mean, I've heard from them yesterday, but right now I'll have to do their talk for them. That'll be odd. <laughs> no, they know they're they're professionals. They'll be all right. And who just joined that I just saw? Come on, who was that? Was me, oh, Deborah. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um the um did you see the 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 you guys all i guess could see that the youtube's there right uh, it announced it yeah 
and I changed the I couldn't get it to go to the normal about time channel so I just said the heck with it it's going where it goes and we'll just move it and I changed the URL ah okay cool there much better so we're selling a car for nine thousand dollars. Anybody want to buy a car? Is that nine thousand Canadian? Nine thousand Canadian. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So that's not much. That's what seven thousand uh, here. Yeah. <laughs> that's you pay us to take it. So. Well, we'd have to go up to uh, Canada to get it. You'd have to go. You'd have to come and pick it up and uh, drive it across. Mm -hmm. Drive across the border. Ooh. That's the hardest part, yeah. probably. Yeah. <laughs> Where where we don't know how to switch the um, insurance and the uh, vehicle registration, mm -hmm. so that's going to be a tough part. Yeah, seems hmm. like that would be up to the whoever bought it. <laughs> no, 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 no. The person that bought it is uh, no longer. Oh no, but the person who buys it from you. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, but we have to sell it. So we have to incur the the cost of the vehicle registration and everything. We can't just so you don't own the car. Do you own the car yourself right now? No, we don't own oh. the car. He owns so, it. Yeah. Well, the dead person's so name the is the dead so person owns it. So oh. we're gonna have to try to get the car. Oh, it's it's well, all a mess. It's it's a mess and and uh, yeah, but and the people next of kin don't live in the country. <laughs> So <laughs> they're in Poland. They're in yeah. Poland. So How old is the car? What like, year is the car? The car is uh, 2008. Oh, wow. That is a good price. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Is and, it in good shape? It is in excellent shape. He, he didn't drive it, it that much, huh? He didn't drive it that much. We're going to try to get the mileage off of it. Um, and uh, it is in incredible good shape. And yeah, and that's the next thing to try to sell. No salt corrosion on the undercarriage or any of that? No salt corrosion on the undercarriage, no. Hmm. No, it's in excellent condition. Huh. Well, you have to live closer price. to wherever you are, probably. <laughs> I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think There's California. There's a few Calgarians here. Maybe somebody yeah, will pass it on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good advertising. Oh, but company. you gotta, but but you gotta know how to drive a standard. It's a standard. Oh, I can do that. Derek yeah, can do that. do that too. Yeah. I, I I finally got a non manual transmission the last time I bought a car, but I Same had here. all my life. I never owned an, an automatic until a couple of years ago. Yeah, I, I think yeah. that's pretty common for our generation, right? Because I mean, there wasn't a lot of choice, and it was a lot more expensive when we were growing up to have an automatic. Yeah. So. Well, my first car was a Volkswagen Square, a 1963 Volkswagen Squareback. Oh, I didn't know that. I had a 73 Fastback. And yeah, it's fun, okay. fun, fun. Yeah, Karen. Yeah, I love stick shifting. Mine had a sunroof. Oh, nice. oh, man. She was, she's a California girl. She's the original California girl. Hi, Jeff. Welcome. Hello. Good morning. Good to see you. And look, there's Craig. Hi, Craig. He's on the moon or the hoax moon. You're you're muted, Craig. Insufficient memory. That's hi, Craig. <laughs> and Jan is here. I haven't seen Jan hi. in forever. Hi, Jan. <laughs> yeah, Janice is here. Good. She's one of the first ones here. All right. I finally get to come to Skeptic Camp again. Yeah, Yay. finally. What 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 state are you in? Jan? Iowa. Yeah, Iowa. I knew it was an I named something. Iowa. What did the heck? It is must be freezing cold over there. Oh, it's about five degrees. <laughs> five degrees. Thank you. It's, oh, it's always a warm day there. Then. Spring, it's spring weather. <laughs> <laughs> it's <American> <laughs> <Netherlands>. <laughs> oh, 
I so. know, but it's still spring weather. The days are getting <laughs> longer did, every day. Even if you yeah. did the conversion, it's still spring weather to us. <laughs> We're below spring, freezing huh? here in North Carolina, and a week ago it was like summer weather or spring. Oh. Weather. Yeah, you well, gotta love the middle of the country for that variation, right? Yeah, we've had all, I think all four seasons. So it snowed on Monday, but didn't stick. <laughs> it makes life very interesting. Yeah. I know here we're minus 23 Celsius. And uh, we're supposed to be on uh, Tuesday, I think it is, plus 12. Wow, <laughs> bombing. <Yeah. So, laughs> that's we're, spring weather for sure. It's 46 <laughs> degrees here. Uh, yeah, 40, not, almost 50 here at my house. Nice. Closer to the uh, ocean, I guess, or something. Yeah, we're getting a little yeah. tired of this very, very cold weather. Our poor dog. Oh. Can't, I mean, could you imagine having to go to the toilet out in minus 30 weather? Yeah, you <laughs> well, Our ancestors you. did it all the time. They had to <laughs> walk down and do their, or they used a little convenience thing. A little honey pot. They called it a, a honey pot. pot. Honey pot or a chamber pot, yeah. But somebody had to go empty it. I mean, someone had to go out in the cold. I guess. It, well, I guess it was normal. I went to a. I think it was Indiana. I, I love historical places, and I went in and they had those recreated places where you recreate things, and you know that shows that they had one of the little chamber pots, but it was all crocheted and everything <laughs> at the top. And they said that the reason why they crocheted it is so that when they put the lid back on, you didn't hear a clink. So if it's the middle of the night, you know, you wouldn't be disturbed by the person next to you who had to go and use it. You're going to wake thought, everybody up. That's every clever. Time. Yeah. Well, it looks like everybody's muted almost for some weird reason. Yeah, as you enter. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, because my dog's barking. Other people are muted too, but okay. <laughs> I just turned myself on. All right. Oh, I have to go for a minute. <laughs> oh, the bread's done. Yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. She's on her, so everybody's party at, at Deborah's after this is all over. <laughs> In my humble opinion, everyone who isn't actually speaking at the time should be muted. It avoids dog barking, yeah, going off, and lots of other problems. Everybody will be once we get started. Started. You're absolutely right. Hello, Tracy, who's having a nice cup of something there. That's nice. Caffeine. <laughs> a cup of caffeine. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Hi. Where are you at? Monterey. Oh, okay, cool. Edward, Edward Gracie's here. Hello. I started talking to him as soon as he shoved something in his mouth. That's just <laughs> the way I am. Three people here from the same city. That's that's weird. Hi, that's Linda. Impressive. Linda's going to be one of our speakers today. Lots Not of too many here. other people here from Secularville, I don't imagine. Where are you at? Secularville. I don't know where that is. New Jersey. Oh. Oh, yay. Oh, well, welcome from New Jersey. New Jersey, is that what we're supposed oh, to say? Yeah, I'm on your friends list on Facebook, so I got the notice. Well, fantastic. We, who else is here that we haven't said hello to yet that I don't see? Eric, well, I mean, just that I do popped see. on. Looks like we've got four repping Raleigh now. Four from Raleigh? We're, oh, we're going to have a fight with who's got the most. What was that? Did I see? You're, you're in yeah, this. And I thought y'all were in Nightdale. No, we're in Raleigh. I'm 15 minutes from downtown. Mm -hmm. I'm using the term loosely. <laughs> I think uh, Noreen is in uh, Calgary, isn't she? Or in that area? No? Oregon? Mm -hmm. You're on mute, so I can't. See. I'm in San Jose. I went to the skeptic oh, camp right. in 2019. Oh, it's so confusing. I know people, I'm going, <laughs> I'm putting them in the wrong place. I met you at the San Jose Atheist community that's right absolutely gosh that was a hundred years ago wasn't it feels like it now anything before the pandemic <laughs> was way long ago look at all these people joining oh we're supposed to be starting right now okay 9 46 i'm letting people in mrs butterworth is almost here i see 9 46 9 49 9 46 all right everybody welcome to i guess i myself 
<clears throat> hey, is it just me, you guys? Did I do this correctly? I'm not hearing anything. I didn't get me, but I'll meet myself. So. Okay, I should be all, all you see right now is me. Just I all see, me. see you and uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, some people on the top and I hear you. Okay, good. So, all right. So we did this right. Well, welcome to Monterey County Skeptic Camp 2020. I did not think we would be doing this again um, alive. That's for sure. Because, uh, you know, I thought for sure the pandemic would be all over with by now. But no. So we have a really great schedule sketch, uh, for you here today. <clears throat> Just a little bit nervous because our first speaker hasn't shown up, <laughs> which is going to be interesting because oh. um, they're not here yet. So um, we may go with a plan, plan B if we have to, but um, that's fine. We'll roll with it. They're in um, Copenhagen. So maybe they've got their time zones a little mixed up or something like that. I've messaged them and we're hoping that they'll, they'll see here and get here really quickly. Anyway, this is our, we started doing skeptic camps in 2015 and we've always done them live. And our purpose is to get everybody together, hopefully in one room and to get people to start, um, you know, thinking about maybe uh, doing their own presentations in the future. We really like to encourage people who have not really been the type that have gone out and done a lot of speaking gigs um, that are more kind of like local. Here's something I'm very passionate about and let's go ahead and, and, um, <clears throat> and talk about it and, and introduce it. So that's the, been the history of a skeptic camp over the time, over the past, but as we have gone into this world that we're in right now, where we're able to go to Zoom, there is blessing and curses. Obviously, we're not meeting in person as much anymore, though we are still meeting for pizza this upcoming Wednesday and at Gianni's if you're local. <clears throat> and the the blessings of it are is that we do we are able to meet on Zoom and we are able to um, stay in the comfort zone of our nice home and not be in five degree weather outside to travel to one location to another and we're able to get speakers from far away which is really kind of nice because we're able to have people <clears throat> that are uh, normally wouldn't be able to speak at a Monterey County skeptic camp so that's always been really kind of fun oh here comes Klaus so I guess we'll be on time one of the things that I should mention also is that we do have a YouTube channel and our YouTube channel has all the talks from all the past um, conferences. And these are all bite-sized kind of talks. So they're uh, going to be about 20 minutes or so for each talk. And all of the videos will be up on our YouTube channel probably within a week. Because it takes me a little bit of time to get them formatted and, and so on and cut down into from one long thing to just short little bits because I'm recording everything. If you wanted to revisit Skeptic Camp again and just watch it from beginning to end because for whatever reason you want to do that. Some people do actually in the background like to just listen to us as if they're they're attending at the moment and that we're ignoring them whenever they talk to us because of course they're not watching a live video. You could do that because that's going to be right now. It's on our, on a YouTube channel that is there. Um, Deborah and Adrian are going to be our admins today and our co-hosts, and they're going to get everybody to keep the, everybody muted. And if there's anybody who needs to be thrown out um, or if there's a lot of movement, um, they're going to go ahead and, 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 turn off your video so it's nothing personal if they do it might be there's just something going on in the background we've got it set up today so that everything is um when people enter the room <clears throat> they're entering the room muted and also they're entering the room without a doorbell so i think that's kind of distracting so i've changed it so it's that way so hopefully anybody who's who's entering our waiting room isn't totally distracted because of the sound of a doorbell so those kinds of things, and hopefully they get in quickly. Other things I want to mention are we are a nonprofit that is called About Time. And that is a, a nonprofit that started whenever um, 
James Randi and the James Randi Educational Foundation decided that they would give us a grant and they to be able to become a nonprofit. And let me tell you, that is a project. <laughs> Deborah will tell you all about it. It is quite a project to get to get the paperwork and everything done for that. It took us, I think, two, two and a half years to get it all taken care of. Um, so it, it was an adventure. So we are a nonprofit. <clears throat> and if you'd like to make donations, we will be putting up our donation box as we go. A little, a little bottle that you shake, you know, that kind of thing. Um, even a few dollars is helpful. But um, we're not asking. We're not asking for a door, door amount for sure, because we want to make sure this is open to everybody possible. So maybe at the end or the middle, if you're having a very good time, you might want to um, give us a, throw us some money. That would be really appreciated. We are a nonprofit, so it is tax deductible if that matters to you. Our funding goes towards multiple projects that we run. <clears throat> the one you're on right now, we're at is Monterey County Skeptics at the moment, which is located in beautiful Monterey, California, Monterey, California area, Monterey County. We're at about 50 degrees here. So January is a wonderful time to visit if you like mild weather and nice weather. So hopefully 2023 we'll be meeting in person again. Um, the money, when we are having a in-person skeptic camp can be pr quite pricey. We have to rent a building, we have to have insurance, we have food for sale, but we usually take a little bit of a loss on the food for sale. Um, so we usually spend about $1,000 to run a skeptic camp and we usually make up maybe $600 of it. So we're always running at a loss. Um, so this year, obviously, this is, this is uh, not gonna run at a loss because we're already here. Another project that we run is the Gorilla Skeptics, which is the sting operation part that um, I run, where we sting different psychics. And um, we have been extremely successful in stinging psychics. We're going to be hearing from, um, I don't know, I think we're going to hear from anybody about any of our stings this time. I was just thinking that we would, but no, I have a lot of videos and a lot of articles up about all the different stings we've done. Um, Jan is here, which is really great from Iowa because she was in our first sting, Operation Bumblebee, that I ever did, which, which was on um, the psychic medium chip coffee. You can read all about that on our website. Everything's on our website, by the way, you guys. And we did, after that, we did ice, Operation Ice Cream Cone, Operation, uh, what was next? Operation Ice Cream Tater Tot, which was Tyler Henry, the Hollywood medium. Operation Ice Cream Cone with some no-name psychic that was very interesting. We did a phone reading and with him. Uh, Operation... trying to do them in order, but I guess I can't do them in order. Onion Ring, Operation Peach Pit, Operation Lemon Meringue, and the most recent one with Thomas John is Operation Onion Ring. That is Operation Onion Ring. We had also done Operation Pizza Roll with him. And the most recent one is Operation Onion Ring. <clears throat> and this is where a psychic on Zoom was giving readings to five-year-olds to 12-year-olds. So it was quite egregious. And that was $400 for each person who was in the event. And uh, we spent $800 on that sting. So these are the reasons why we have to have money is because we actually have to pay and we have to attend as a VIP when we go in person or if we can get into the Zoom call. And the, yeah, the event that uh, Jan went to, Operation... Um, Operation Bumblebee was $161 a person, I believe, or something like that. And we paid for all of the people who attended. So that gets quite expensive. I'll send it to Messenger. What was that? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I didn't <laughs> I know I was. Somehow I turned, had my, I'm not muted. I don't know what happened. Oh, well. I apologize. That's okay. We won't ban you. <laughs> So that was that. So the operation, uh, the stings with the psychics always cost a lot of money. Uh, we are also in the GSOW project, which is the largest Wikipedia editing group of any time in 
uh, we edit in all languages <clears throat> we can and um, I think we're going to be having a talk from somebody well, no I know we're having a talk from somebody today about that and she is um, one of our GSOW editors who will be talking about her experience with the team in Maine California I mean California Maine USA and uh, we are going to be giving scholarships this year hopefully which will to our GSOW members and our Girl Skeptic members and maybe our Monterey County Skeptic members to attend future conferences. So um, SciCon is the next big conference that's coming up, I believe in Las Vegas. And I think there's one in, um, in Manchester, England called QED. And that is also going to be, uh, we're hoping to be able to send people to those conferences. So we obviously need funds to be able to send people for those. So Anyway, it, uh, yeah, toss a coin to your skeptic. I like that. Okay, so Klaus is saying my video is either turned off or doesn't work. So Klaus. I can see Klaus. He you figured it out. Him. Oh, it might have been an older message when you. Yes. Him. Okay, so that's okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, great. So we are a little ahead of time. And um, I'm going to open this up. Let me unpin myself so that I'm not here. And I need to go back to gallery view, I think, to be able to do that right. Okay, there you guys are. Oh, look, at there's a whole bunch more people that were here when I before I started pinning. That's really great. Oh, there you go. Oh, I see Klaus. I see Steen. Okay, sounds great. Hi, Kyle. I see you now. I see Mono. I'm like on that... Uh, do you guys remember what was that show that be like he had like a tell us thing and he'd go i see rumper room, room. <laughs> genesis is like rumper room rumper room i, yeah. I prefer oh. to think it more like hollywood squares <laughs> <laughs> with a bunch of people or the start um, of the brady bunch oh that's that's good hi eric Hi. Nice to meet you there. See you there. Oh, look at this. This is so great. Uh, Deborah is um, the president of the uh, Monterey County Humanist Association, which is, you know, kind of our sister organization in the humanist world. Uh, Deborah, why don't you have a say of something or two? Let's see. Well, um, we ha actually haven't really been very active since COVID because our meeting place closed and we don't really have another meeting place. So, um, yeah, we still have our members, um, you know, they're still out there. I don't know. There's not a whole lot to say. We participated recently in first night Monterey, um, which is a, a, a new year's Eve. There's like a little really short parade down the Alvarado street in Monterey. It's like two blocks or something like that <laughs> and we had our peace banners because the peace group and our, our group isn't necessarily strictly a peace group but we're a member another member of another peace group so we did that and usually we do fourth of july but i don't they didn't have it the last two years so i don't know if we're going to have it this year but anyway get vaccinated <laughs> <laughs> Wear your mask. Stay away from people. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing that right now. We're staying away from people. I know. We're being very good. And we're, you know, we're spending a lot of time with our pets. I think which is people really are good. behaving. Maybe we can, you know, go to a conference one of these days. Oh, I know. We've got to get there someday. Yeah. So um, what else should I make sure I say? I wasn't prepared to be so, so early. I, I expected a whole bunch of problems. So, um, you know, that's usually what happens. And sorry it didn't happen oh we are broadcasting this live to a youtube if you are interested in seeing that together oh i see a couple people there uh allison oh okay that's she'll be a speaker later and um I see hamilton decided to join us yes this is hamilton and he was named hamilton thank you before the musical right ham long before <laughs> long before he's much older than that he was named after alexander hamilton believe it or not so we will be visited hopefully by multiple and hopefully they'll keep it clean whatever they're doing back here let me know if he's starting to do something that is inappropriate because they are cats and they love the internet as we all know <clears throat> um okay anything else i need to know 
or say, I can't think of anything. Um, we will be doing, there are going to be doing conferences throughout the whole year, hopefully in 2023. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys. There's so many wonderful things that are coming up in, in the year. I, I appreciate skeptical, skeptical conferences so much more now that we are, we are, um, um, have had this break from, from things. Um, is, if there's nothing else that anybody thinks that I need to, to cover, then I'm going to allow this to go over to um, our first speakers early only because we can and the topic is so interesting and if they if we have a little bit more in the um i'm also going to put the donate button in here and uh, susan before yeah. you do that would you post the youtube link in the chat sure well the other thing that can happen is you just click on the live on youtube at the top of the screen and it will take you to straight to oh that. hey you guys not not sure everybody with a phone can do that. I'm no, kind of, so okay. the link is still a good idea. Too. So we should probably just put links in the chat as we go as well. So many screens open. Okay, great. So I'm going to introduce our first speakers. Let me pin myself again. Okay. So I want to introduce our first speakers for today, a little early, so you have a little more time than you thought, which is great. And um, these are two, two old friends. Oh, I shouldn't say old friends. That makes it sound like you're old, doesn't it? These are two really interesting characters <laughs> that I've known for some time. That can cover a lot of territory. <laughs> it sure can. So let me tell you a few things about these guys. Um, they are in, um, oh, here comes somebody else. They are, they are in Copenhagen or in that vicinity. They have, Klaus has been attending to, uh, attending conferences in the United States for years. And he used to be a volunteer at the TAMs and the different kinds of events, the, the amazing meetings of the JREF. I got to make sure I'm mm -hmm. clear at the amazing meetings. He's also been to SciCon. And they were able to come out to SciCon in Vegas a few years ago to attend because they had sued someone. I hope I'm not giving away anything that they were gonna talk in their oh. talk who had oh. used their, their copyrights on their, on their channel for the 911 thing. And they were able to sue somebody and that person had to pay a fee had to pay, pay them and gave them enough money that they were both able to travel to, to Vegas to attend SciCon. And that just is like one of the most wonderful stories. I don't think anybody's ever had that happen. I, I, as far as I know, I've never heard of anybody actually winning an award from one of these, one of these people and, and then using it to, to come over here. Um, Mark Edward and I went to Copenhagen in 2019 and uh, Klaus took I'm not going to say class and don't freak out what it is, the surprise. No, I will never reveal that. He has a surprise. So anybody who comes to Copenhagen, yes, he will, he will put you, give you a tour of, it's a beautiful city. And um, there's a lot of historical sites there where, you know, that are the typical touristy kind of things, the typical um, neat, really amazing things that anybody can see. But Klaus has one stop on his tour that I can't talk about because it's a surprise, no. but it is relevant to the skeptic community. And it's really kind of cool. Yeah. Um, the, only, the only suggestion I would give to people who are going to Copenhagen in the future on a tour with Klaus is to make sure that you are, you get your stamina up because he is really got a tour set up. And those cobblestones are so uncomfortable on your feet. <laughs> you got to wear oh, good shoes. Got to wear good shoes. Yes. Lots of great things to see up there. Well, it's um, a big city. It, well, it's walkable. There's a Scientology building there that you that you can go see as well. Oh, yeah. Yes. Wonderful oh. parks. Don't see the little mermaid statue that's there. No. No. Mm -hmm. It's only like the, a few the, feet tall, isn't it? Why do you think it's called the Little Mermaid? Oh, <laughs> Because the tour and the tour bus is all stopped there and they take pictures yeah. of people by the, yeah. it's just, I, I've never seen it, but I, I've been warned off anyway. So let me pin you guys. 
let me uh, remove my pen. And I'm going to, let me see how I do this. If I pin. I can add while you look for it, that, that the amount that we won from the trial was in the neighborhood of $9,000. And, uh, and as we said, when we were there, we said it was the first time that someone went to, to join your, your meetings on a scholarship from a, from a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've, Spotlight okay. one. How do I do the other? Janice, can you tell oh me? No, Janice. Um, Adrian, can you? You know what? Maybe I should just do that. Adrian, can you spotlight the two? Okay. Uh, so Klaus and what's the other name? Steen. S. T. My name is Steen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking for it. It's uh. He's got a guitar behind him. Okay. Well, I'm I'm not... Steen. I've made them co-hosts so they can share their screens or whatever they need right. to do. I'm still looking, I'll, I'll give it a try. I could spotlight one, but I, I'm not sure how I spotlight You should be able to do two, because I've done that before, but it's been a while. Add spotlight. Okay, here, oh, oh I did it. Oh, okay, good, because I just was about to do that and then he disappeared. So I guess that's because you spotlighted him. Dun, da, da, da. So you guys can, uh, let's mute everybody, please. If you have questions, please go ahead and put them in your, um, in the chat. And YouTube also will keep track and see if there's anything there. And um, everybody will go ahead, Adrian or um, Deborah, if you'll mute everybody and then Klaus and Steen, you'll just have to unmute yourselves. And, and one other note for those, especially if you're on a PC, you want to make sure that when you go to view at the top right, it's under speaker, not gallery. Otherwise, you're going to just see everybody small still. Okay, put everybody under speaker. And then when we're done with that and we, we're ready to go to back to the group again, you I think you have to go to gallery so that you can see everybody in the little spot. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's also I'm all gonna, ready. There's also going to be a PowerPoint uh, as part of the picture. Just yeah, mixed. you've got uh, permissions to make it that way. So go for it. Yeah. And if you have yeah. audio that you want to show, make sure that you click the button at the bottom that says audio. show sound. Okay, let's see. How does that work? It looks great. Okie dokie. Adrian, can you mute us all? Yeah, I think everybody's muted. Oh, but I'm not. Hopefully I'm not either. No, I just kind of did it individually. So I just forgot okay. to do you. We really have to come up with a better term than do you. Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. Okay. Uh, just, just for starters, it's not that I want to postpone anything. I, I just want to let you know that I've spoken to some people who expect it to begin in 20 minutes. So, but... Um, on the other hand, they can see it uh, on True. YouTube. Yeah. So. yeah. Recording <laughs> in progress. Okay, let's go then. All Steve. right. Yeah. Go? Okay, sure. Okay. Ah, oh, here we go. Welcome to our lecture, Face Palm: The Absurdities of uh, the Truth Movement. My name is Klaus Larsen, which makes the other guy Steve Svenholm. And we have for more than 10 years uh, investigated conspiracy theories, mainly regarding 9-11, but also done more broad research into the subject. Conspiracy theorists present their alternative explanations as far better supported than the official accounts. The official accounts are all lies, you see, but in reality, the conspiracy theories are not only lacking in evidence, they are also absurd and often contradict each other. In this lecture, we will take a closer look at what the absurdities are. And we will also explain the thinking behind these problems and how the truth movement handles the absurdities in a truly Orwellian manner. We're not going to address the issue of whether the evidence claimed, by, claimed to exist by conspiracy theorists is real or not. That issue is already settled. 20 years after the terror attack on September 11, 2001 and counting, Conspiracy theorists haven't been able to present a coherent case that the terror attack was not planned and carried out by the Al-Qaeda as the official investigations have concluded. 
Instead, conspiracy theories claim that cabal, powerful politicians, high-ranking military personnel, the media, and so on and so forth were behind it. However, conspiracy theorists have only been able to present an incoherent case. And it's this incoherence that we will describe in this lecture where we examine how well the conspiracy theories about 9-11 hold up to a logical scrutiny. Now we can only include a fraction of the hundreds of claims. So we've focused on the major ones. Now the claims are not made by all members of the truth movement, but they are the, currently the trending ones. And to that effect, uh, Stein will play the role of the conspiracy theorist, while I will play the role of the party pooper skeptic. Now, please note that this mock conversation that follows, it's not a realistic one. We do it this way to illustrate that the claims uh, uh, and how absurd they are. It would never happen so smoothly in real life because the conspiracy theorists um, would never just accept that their claims are shown to be absurd. We would personally also uh, always leave them room to counter our responses. So in a world, word or a handful, we are cutting to the chase here, not to be arrogant, but to be pedagogic. So, Steen, yeah. donning your imaginary tinfoil hat, what happened on that fateful day more than 20 years ago? Well, the official account is a lie. It was not Osama bin Laden and 19 hijackers who planned and carried out the attack. There were no hijackers. The four planes were all remotely controlled. Flight 175 didn't hit the World Trade Center 2, Flight 77 didn't hit the Pentagon, and Flight 93 didn't crash in Pennsylvania. As for the events in New York, World Trade Center 1, 2, and 7 were destroyed by controlled demolitions. Explosives and nanothermite were placed in the buildings beforehand. After the attack, there was a massive cover-up. Okay, uh, that is a lot to process. Uh, maybe we better take it step by step. Could you tell me about Osama bin Laden? Well, of course. Did you, for instance, know that the bin Laden family and the Bush family are all business partners? And did you know that Osama bin Laden was trained and paid by the CIA? And did you know that Osama bin Laden's family was airlifted out of the US shortly after the day of the attack? Well, actually, yes, I did. But what I don't know is why you point to Osama bin Laden. Why is he relevant if he isn't behind the attack? A while ago, you dismissed Osama bin Laden as irrelevant. You said he didn't do it. And then you do your best to link him to the Bush family and to the attack itself. That makes no sense whatsoever. If you don't think that Osama bin Laden was behind the attack, any reference to him is nonsense. You are contradicting your own claim. Now, you said also said that there were no hijackers. I did. Oh, sorry. In, the, in the time leading up to the attack, the CIA ordered visas for the 15 of the 19 people claimed to be hijackers. And also, the government procedures regarding hijacking were changed. So it would take longer for the authorities to intervene in case of hijackings. Furthermore, Vice President Dick Cheney was in control of NORAD, so he could make sure that the military wouldn't prevent the planes from reaching their targets. Yeah, but if all of this is true, it means that there were hijackers and that the planes were in fa fact hijacked. Otherwise, it makes no sense to seek to make hijackings easier, only not to have hijackers at all. What happened during the 109 minutes between the first hijacking and the last plane crashing, Flight 93? Well, one of the passengers on board Flight 93 made a phone call saying that he saw a gun. And Dick Cheney, he issued a stand down order so that the planes heading towards their goals were not to be shut down, but were allowed to hit the targets. There was also plenty of time for the Air Force to shoot down the planes. And the air defense was even warned 20 minutes earlier than recorded. Yeah, but again, all, the, all this points to there being hijackers. Why would you issue a, a stand down order if the planes were not hijacked? Uh, what about some of the passengers who called in saying that the planes had been hijacked? 
You know, it was impossible in 2001 to use a cell phone from a passenger plane. The reports of phone calls from passengers and of hijackers were all hoaxes. But hold on, didn't you just say that one of the passengers on board flight 93 made a phone call saying that he ha saw a gun? You're contradicting yourself again. You know, uh, perhaps we should just move on to the planes. If okay. the planes weren't hijacked, what happened? Well, you know, all four planes were remotely controlled. As for Flight 93, it wasn't crashed by the hijackers as the official account claims. Instead, the plane was shut down. Did you know that debris wasn't, uh, was found at the crash site in Pennsylvania? No debris was found at the crash site in Pennsylvania. So Flight 93 was first remotely controlled, then shut down despite there was a stand down order not to shoot it down. And mm -hmm. then either they, whoever are behind it, removed the plane parts from Flight 93 from the crash site. Maybe it was shut down elsewhere where nobody discovered the debris while a crater suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Or perhaps, I mean, did they dig up the, cra uh, dig the crater in advance but fail to put plane parts in it? Um, it doesn't make any sense, okay? Why don't we move on to Flight 77? Was there no plane at the Pentagon either? No, there wasn't. No plane hit the Pentagon. Flight 77's route towards the Pentagon was impossible. Nobody could make that sharp right turn just before the plane was supposed to hit the Pentagon. And also Flight 77 couldn't fly so fast, so close to the ground. The most damning evidence, however, is that no surveillance cameras show that a plane hit the building. But what about the debris from a plane found on the lawn at the impact site, as well as inside the building? Ah, those plane parts didn't belong to a Boeing 757. They came from another type of plane. Let me get this right. You say that there was no plane at the Pentagon, but that something else caused the big explosion and the damage. Then they placed what was supposed to be plane debris from a Boeing 757, only they had prepared parts from a different type of plane. Why would they swap plane type? And, you know, also, why would they prepare and place plane debris at the Pentagon, but not at the crash site in Pennsylvania? And why would you remotely control a plane that wasn't intended to hit its target anyway? What about flight 175? Well, it wasn't flight 175 that hit the World Trade Center too. The plane that came in was going way too fast for a Boeing 767. And also the plane engine found later in the streets of Manhattan wasn't even from a Boeing 767. So flight 175 was swapped with a different plane type. One was that that was moderated so it could fly faster than a Boeing 767. Yet photos of and videos clearly show a plane that is indistinguishable from a Boeing 767. <sighs> what about flight 11? Well, that was really flight 11, only it was remotely controlled. So flight 93 wasn't there, flight 77 wasn't there, flight 175 wasn't there, but was swapped with another plane, but right. flight 11 was there. Okay, yeah. this is going really, really well. Not. What about the catastrophe in New York City following the attack? You said that the World Trade Center 1 and 2, 1, 2 and 7 were destroyed by explosives and nanothermite placed in the buildings beforehand. Could you elaborate a little bit there? Of course I can. The official account claims that the three buildings collapsed due to fires, and that's a lie. After the planes had hit the World Trade Center one and two, the jet fuel quickly burned out, leaving only few small fires that couldn't have melted the steel. And when the World Trade Center one collapsed, the debris didn't damage the World Trade Center seven much. Besides, steel framed high rises have never collapsed due to fires before. And that means it's impossible for these three buildings to collapse due to fires. Okay, so the buildings were not destroyed by fires, but by what? Well, you know, in the time leading up to the attack, between 10 and 100 tons of explosives and nanothermite were secretly placed in all three buildings. This was done by people posing as maintenance workers. Wait a minute. There were usually many thousands of people working in the buildings and none of them discovered anything unusual? 
Okay. You mentioned explosives. What about those? Well, many witnesses heard explosions and saw flashes of light. And photos also show symmetrical dust clouds emerging from the World Trade Center 1 and 2. Those flashes of light and dust clouds are signs of controlled demolitions. And also, all three buildings collapsed suddenly, symmetrical, in free fall, and in their own footprints. The concrete in World Trade Center 1 and 2 was polarized, and the steel was fragmented. You can see this easily when you look at the photos and the videos from the collapses and compare them to big buildings being destroyed by controlled demolitions. Let me get this right. Someone, they secretly planted explosives in buildings filled with people who didn't notice. A procedure that usually takes months with full access to every crook and nanny in the building and makes a lot of noise drilling holes for the explosives. Then they deliberately waited 56 minutes and 102 minutes after the impact of the planes to detonate the explosives, all of which was captured on many videos and seen by millions of people all around the world. Yet nobody on that day or in the months, even years after, saw the destruction of the buildings as controlled demolitions. You needed to be told that the collapses were indistinguishable from controlled demolitions. Now, you also mentioned nanothermite. What is that? Yeah. Uh, nanothermite is a compound secretly developed by the US military. It can melt steel, which is what caused the three buildings to collapse, along with explosives, of course. And in the months after the catastrophe, there were pools of melted metal at ground zero. You know, Niels Harriet, the Danish professor emeritus uh, of chemistry, he has found tons of unreacted nanothermite in the dust from ground zero. So they planted both explosives and na nanothermite in the buildings. Yet when the buildings were demolished, they looked like buildings being destroyed by explosives only. Why would you use nanothermite? You know, what about the cover up then? Who really did this? Larry Silverstein, who owned, uh, he owned the, build, uh, the World Trade Center 7 and he had leased the World Trade Center 1 and 2. In the weeks before the attack, he had insured against terror attacks from planes. Silverstein later ordered the controlled demolition of World Trade Center 7. He actually said so in a documentary. The day before the attack, Donald Rumsfeld admitted that the Pentagon was missing $2.3 trillion. Rumsfeld had knowledge that the, ter the terror attack would take place the next day, knowing that the news of the missing trillions would be buried in the massive media cover of the attack. Furthermore, the hijacked Flight 77 was intended to impact the Pentagon at the exact spot where the documents would reveal the fraud would be. The impact and the subsequent damage and fires were then to destroy the evidence. The missing money was used to wage war in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, the media was in on it too. For instance, the BBC, they revealed on live television that the World Trade Center 7 had collapsed 20 minutes before it really happened. So Larry Silverstein, Donald Rumsfeld and the BBC revealed the plot as well as their own involvement in the world's largest terror attack. Why would they do that? I mean, are the people behind it, are they morons? Also, you said, Earlier, the Flight 77 did not hit the Pentagon, but now you do. Did Flight 77 hit the Pentagon or not? How can you call this a cover-up? Well, it is, or it was. For instance, uh, it took several court trials to release images from the surveillance cameras from the Pentagon. And you know, no images showed a plane. So they are powerful enough to stage a false flag terror attack but they can't prevent the courts from revealing that it was all a hoax. Furthermore, if they can place plane parts that didn't even come from a Boeing 757, but they can't make some fake photos of a plane. You know, I hesitate to ask, but do you have more? Of course, I always have more. You know, Osama bin Laden, he wasn't wanted by the FBI for 9-11. And the video of him, Osama bin Laden, admitting to the attack, it was faked. The translation was a hoax. He didn't admit to the attack. And also the person in the video, it wasn't even Osama bin Laden. Hold on. They can produce a fake video 
of Osama bin Laden, but not fake photos showing a plane at the Pentagon. Also, if the video doesn't show Osama bin Laden, it's irrelevant what the person says. It's only relevant if the person is Osama bin Laden. The person in the video cannot both be Osama bin Laden and not Osama bin Laden. You are contradicting yourself here once again. As for the warrant, they can stage a huge false flag operation, yet they can't get the FBI to issue a warrant for Osama bin Laden's arrest. I mean, who are they? Are they completely powerless? Yeah, but you know, people have been killed for knowing and revealing the truth. Yeah, well, the most known people claiming that 9-11 was a hoax. They're still alive. Alex Jones is alive. Richard Gage is alive. Christopher Bolin is alive. Eric Hofschmidt is alive. Niels Harrod, whom you mentioned for, uh, before, all are known because they have exposed the hoax, yet they are very much alive and active two decades after the attack. They, whoever they are behind it, seem to be killing the wrong people. You know what, Steen? I think we are done here. I think so. so. Yeah, fair enough. So, I want you know, well, while Steen takes off his imaginary tinfoil hat, allow me to summarize what the truth movement overall is claiming. The terror attack on 9-11 was a huge false flag operation planned and carried out by a secret cabal. The cabal is omnipotent. The pl plan happened without anyone spotting it on the day or in the weeks or months after. But the cabal is also at the same time so incompetent that all you have to do is Google to find evidence to reveal who did it and their whole plan. A plan that makes no sense whatsoever and even contradicts itself. I see that Steen is back from the rabbit hole. Bring it on home. Yeah. Did I win an Oscar? No. Any no. movement will, of course, have its point of disagreement. Um, you know, the animal rights movement, they cannot agree on which animals should have rights and which shouldn't. And the feminist movement cannot agree on whether Muslim women wearing hijabs is a good or bad thing. And uh, the skeptical movement, they can't agree. We can't agree on whether to include religious believers or not. But the points of disagreement pose a different problem for the truth movement. We're not talking about disagreements on ideological issues or technical details. No, here we're talking about whether physical objects were present at a specific place at a specific time. Either there were hijackers or there weren't hijackers. Either there were planes or there were no planes. The truth movement has decided to accept all viewpoints on all issues. It doesn't matter if you believe that there were planes or if you believe there weren't as long as you believe that the official account is a lie. The main goal is not to find out what the truth is. The truth is whatever you make it in the moment. And as long as you focus on the external enemy. Even the truth movement fight among themselves, sometimes literally over which truth is the true one. But in public, they always argue not in favor of one alternative truth, but in favor of one falsehood namely the official account. So, ideologically, the truth movement is thus a counter-truth movement. And ethically, that makes the truth movement fundamentally corrupt. And it's that corrupt foundation that makes it impossible for the truth movement to obtain their goal of a so-called in new independent investigation of 9-11. Because those who can instigate such an investigation will never do so as long as the truth movement hold these conflicting views, can anyone imagine a congressional hearing 25 years or more after the attack, starting with, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, we are here to find out if there were planes or not. Oh, and also if there were hijackers or not. That is absurd. And with those three words, we put a nail in the coffin of the uh, truth movement. That's it from us. Over to Q&A. Well, I can't hear you uh, clapping anyway, so, but thanks. <laughs> Susan? I'm here, I'm here. I'm just unmuting myself. Very, very good. So unscreen share. Oh, 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 hang on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I have, I have the power now. 
No, no, you no. have the power. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> hey, I'm still the host. There you go. Okay, there so go. I want to make myself. Uh, spotlight yeah. gallery. Hold on, just one second. That was great, you guys. I'm so glad that you you, you came all the way over here from Denmark to give that talk. Oh, thank you, Janice, for putting your urge. Why do I keep saying Janice? I am just really not okay today. <laughs> I love Janice, but Adrian probably did that. Yeah, I did. Okay, cool. So we've got a lot of questions and yes, we did start a little early. So um, sorry, anybody who, who just showed up, which was only a couple of people that showed up at 1030. So it'll be fine. Here we are in 2022, right? So one of the questions that we have received is probably the question that you get the most often, which is, oh, here, I gotta move this over. Why are we still here with people? Why is this such a huge deal still 2022 in January? I mean, what is going on? Either, either there's a lot of money in this to be made from this community who continues to not um, to perpetuate this, or a political motive, which many obviously still in the same area. Why are we still talking about this in such great detail when there is no evidence, as you guys just showed, it's all bull hockey. Why are we still here? Who wants to take that question? I'll, I can try. Um, if you have invested yourself to such a degree that your identity has become that conspiracy theory or any conspiracy theory, it's very, very difficult to let go and admit that either you were fooled or even worse, that you have lied to people. If, uh, if, you, if you really become identical with your, uh, with your beliefs and you are known, especially in, uh, out in the world, as someone who believes so and so, uh, this and that uh, conspiracy theory, it's very difficult to let go. It, it, it becomes almost impossible. It is possible, but it happens once in a while, but we rarely hear a hardcore uh, conspiracy theorist admit that he was wrong or she was wrong. So, can, I, can I just do a, a quick follow up on that? Yes. Um, I, I agree uh, with what, what Klaus said and, and also, um, the beliefs in, the, in these conspiracy theories, they seem to also have seasons. Uh, for instance, uh, the belief in, uh, in the assassination of JFK, that, that it was CRA or whatever, uh, some sort of conspiracy that was behind it. Uh, it. It varies from year to year. In 2013, there were about 20 percent point more people who believed in the conspiracy theory than the, the, the following year. And uh, a good reason why this, uh, why this is so is probably because that was the 50th anniversary. So there was more mentioning of the, the conspiracy theory in the, in the media. And we know from other uh, research that people tend to believe in conspiracy theories, even if they just hear about them. So, so, so um, and that, that's, it's a bit strange that it's, it's like that, but if you, we are all prone to conspiracy theories just by, uh, by hearing about them. Um, so yeah, so it's, that could be part of the, uh, the answer. I'm sorry, I muted myself just in case there's noises in my background. Is there money in this? Yes, to some extent. Uh, for instance, uh, the largest for various, uh, for generous uh, amounts of large, the largest uh, organization, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, uh, they paid for a, uh, an investigation uh, uh, done by Leroy Halsey from the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Uh, he was, uh, he invested, he investigated uh, whether uh, the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology, their conclusion about uh, World Trade Center 7 was that true or not. And he came up uh, and uh, they collected about, I think it was about 300,000 US dollars for that uh, investigation alone. So there is money out there, uh, but it's not, we're not talking millions here. 
Mm -hmm. Alex Jones is probably the one who has benefited the most uh, monetary wise because he has literally a, or he had a media empire. Uh, so yeah, there is money, but it's centered on very, very few people. They have a oh, very strong- Yeah, and, and it seems also, because that's a funny thing because Niels Harry, the Danish uh, chemistry uh, professor that, that we mentioned, he doesn't seem to earn that much money uh, on this. But still, he has been traveling the world and doing more than 500 lectures all over. Um, so there might be a lot of status in it um, that, that they are uh, reaching for as well, because he has this kind of, uh, he's kind of a guru amongst his followers. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, 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 a lifestyle for him as well. And there's also this problem that Klaus mentioned that the, if, you, if you leave the, uh, uh, the mainstream belief, then your, your social network uh, decreases. Uh, and that means that you only have you, you have, you lose a lot of friends and then you have a lot less friends. Um, so imagine that you were to leave that also, then you would be left with no friends at all because no one would believe you in, 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 on both sides. So it's very hard to get out again. Mm -hmm. In the skeptical community, we've had a, view, a very few uh, people who have left this world of conspiracy theories and so on, and actually have tried to have a life or career outside of it, maybe being the opposite. I'm thinking of somebody like not like Kenny Biddle, who wasn't super prominent as a as a Ghostbuster kind of thing, you know, that was really into the ghost hunting, and now is uh, part of the skeptic community, making a, uh, a life and a world out of it. But there's other people who've done it: Natalie Grams, Grams, and um, uh, Britt Hermes, who have left the the cancer. I mean, the the homeopathic and the alternative medicine world, and have have come out but i don't think they've made any money or of any kind necessarily i think they've written a book or something i think natalie grams has written a book on homeo homeopathic methods but yeah so there isn't a huge pull to bring over into the skeptic community and admit that they that they were you know maybe from an inside oh that'd be interesting an inside look at the 9-11 world from an insider who that would be i, I just don't think there's the money and like you said that they would lose everybody but, all their friends there's a, there's a horrifying example uh what was his name klaus Char charlie weich charlie, charlie weich i think it's uh, yeah, charlie weich yeah. he was an american who uh participate oh, a british i, I can't remember he, he was a brit wasn't he he, he no. participated in, in a bbc documentary uh, called conspiracy road trip and he he was uh, a, a true uh, he was a truther and um but during this uh this uh, uh, documentary, he changed his view uh, and he realized that he was wrong. But afterwards, leaving his former beliefs, he received a lot of uh, death threats and uh, I think he was attacked as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Huh, I remember that conspiracy road trip, trip. I think Michael Shermer participated in that. It was a bus and they went around and looked at things. Is that what I'm thinking of? Yes. It happened in yeah. LA and I don't think they convinced anybody. <laughs> well, they convinced him. Oh, that just, well, I mean, very few people, well, maybe the lurkers, people who are watching. So we have a few other questions for you. Um, this one from Tracy, what's the difference between the truth movement and this recent post-truth movement? What is the post? Oh, uh, well, the truth movement is, uh, that's the conspiracy theorists who co concentrate on 9-11. Uh, uh, it's the, basically the, it, the movement started around 2003, four, maybe five, uh, and in earnest in 2006. Uh, it's uh, rare uh, that we see a, a movement per se about a specific uh, conspiracy theory. Of course, we have now a uh, QAnon. Uh, that's also a movement centered around a bunch of conspiracy theories. Uh, when, when you say post-truth movement, uh, I think uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, the whole 
Trump area populist uh, uh, Fox News, they, they don't really give a, a hoot about what the truth is because it's, uh, as Stephen Colbert said, uh, he used uh, the ter term truthiness. It sounds truth, true, therefore it is true. So uh, can, can we can clarify what actually is meant by the post-truth movement? Because I haven't heard that, that phrase before. I'm not sure. Okay. So if Tracy, if you want to clarify that, I have another question for you. Yeah, um, they, um, okay. well, they're, they're people who um, go more on feelings. They feel strongly in their heart that truth, that Trump won, so it must be true. That's what I've heard, but I, I'm not an expert on this, but they put feelings ahead of facts. Uh, thanks, Jay. Well, that, that, that's general to, uh, to, to um... That's not specific for, for post-truth, post-truthers. The, the, the original truthers do the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so from uh, Linda, do we, have a, do we have any kind of gauge of how, how many people believe this? I know Steen had said that there's a lot of people who, they just hear the conspiracy, like if they were asked on a survey or something, they would probably say, yes, I believe it, not necessarily understanding really what they're they're saying but do we have any gauge well uh, uh, it's it's quite difficult to, to put a, a specific number on it because there are uh, due, due to uh, to clauses and, and my investigation the research there seems to be more uh, several types of conspiracy theorists we operate with uh, now three types of conspiracy theorists um this type one uh, which there might be pretty many of uh, maybe up to 50% of a population. So that's pretty many. But they seem to, their characteristics is that they, they believe in one or a very few conspiracy theories and they don't connect them. Then there's type two conspiracy theories. He connects everything uh, and he can't talk about anything else. The conspiracy theories just intervenes his life and it just, just fills him up. He, he starts conversations uh, Every time, just uh, w without uh, without being provocated to it, and talks about his conspiracy theories, it just just fills his life. And then there's type three, uh, which we call the warriors. They are pretty much like type two, but the conspiracy theories are really not that important anymore. They just want to attack the establishment, and they are active. Uh, type two is pretty passive. They just talk and talk and talk. Type three are ready to, to uh, perform violence. They're ready to attack. They are the types that uh, attacked the capital uh, oh, almost exactly one year ago. Um, so these three uh, kinds of uh, conspiracy theories we distinguish between. There are very few of type three, luckily, so far, it seems. And when we say very few, it's probably they were all there at the capital. Um, and uh, there are uh, quite, not many, but perhaps between one and 5% of type two in a population, but they have a lot of impact because they use the social media very much. Um, so they're very loud. Mm -hmm. They're not very many, but they're very loud. And then of course, as I said, uh, type one, there might be very many uh, of those, but they don't pose a threat uh, really. Um, not until they change into becoming uh, type two or even type three. You guys a long given... question, but I hope it was. Uh, no, no. Um, you've given a talk. Or I've I've seen at least I think Klaus has given a talk on this, which yeah. you put together, and I think I've read about this too. It's really fascinating. If you could put a link in the chat, I would appreciate it. Maybe we'll attach it to the YouTube video too. But this idea of these three different personality kind of conspiracy theory types is should be getting i think you should get a lot more coverage because i think what you guys have done is really brilliant how you've kind of summarized it into this three like you just did i uh i think people should be more interested in that is has that been in an article in skeptical it has that been an article in skeptical inquire or skeptic or anything like that that i have i can't remember <laughs> no not yet we are uh, putting the finishing touch on uh on an article up about uh, the three types and pros possible uh, subtypes as well. 
coming soon, coming soon. Okay, yeah, I think it's really brilliant the way you guys have, have done that. And let's get a link to that in the in the uh, chat if we can. I also- So, to, mm -hmm. can I interrupt for a second, sure. Susan? I've just been notified by Jeff and Rob Palmer that apparently chat has been disabled for many people. And then we don't know why that would be. Um, is that Jeff, is weird. Would you know how to enable that? Wait, where is that? I just wrote testing. So you, so it's okay for you? Yeah, it's yeah. okay for me too. And we've obviously been getting some, but we're just getting feedback now that people can't. Oh, Deborah says she can chat. But, but awesome. we're all hosts. So I just says chat disabled at the bottom. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I get that too. So maybe okay. so chat is disabled for anybody who's not a host. But that's yeah. odd because it's been, they've been able to chat earlier. I didn't they check. They were. So something happened. Something got pushed or it just clicked wrong in the system because it happened. I went out of Zoom back and forth. Didn't make a difference. And I was Does wondering if it was box? only me, but apparently not. Yeah. And uh, Jeff just sent me a thing as well. So that's how I knew it was not. Just okay. Well, let's see what we can do here in a second. So if you guys have a question, also the YouTube channel is open. You can, you can write there. Ah. I can also channel your thoughts. So that's another hey. thing is. Uh... So <laughs> I found it. I fixed it. I think. Oh, try, can people it? try put, putting stuff in the chat? Yeah, but it's not fixed now. It's fixed. Thank you. So for oh, future reference, what was that? Where'd you do that? I did that uh, in the chat box. There's a little dots down at the bottom and it says participant can chat with and no one was checked. And I don't know how that happened. It was obviously an accident. Yeah, you know, somebody so who was an administrator must have done it because yes. that's not the selection that we have. It only says safe chat. Yeah. Yes, and so uh, that, uh, yeah, people who are hosts or co-hosts can see okay. that. So I just ch changed it to thank everyone you guys. and it should be work. So thank thanks you. for letting us know. That's our. That's one of our, our flummoxes. You got to have a few when you're doing no, something no, live no, like no, this. No, no, so. no, 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 you're not thinking. <laughs> you, they, it's a conspiracy. Well, somebody's already suggested that in chat. Yes, conspiracy. conspiracy. Your volume is lower and and you were playing the rational person on the, the discussion <laughs> and his was actually louder Steen's was louder so it was suggested that it's a conspiracy that and it, it, it's a good point because you know such an anti-vaxxer community they're loud they are they look like they they're like, everywhere yes. they look like they are the biggest group and they're not <laughs> They're a little tiny world and people don't want to intercede. They're like, okay, I got my vaccines. I'm not dealing with that person over there, you know, and it, it makes them look like they're prevalent when they're not. <laughs> well, uh, uh, we have uh, things are going to change on so social media. Uh, we have uh, sources everywhere, Stine and I, and our sources in uh, the Danish government uh, tells us that uh, there are some thing in the pipeline both for uh, for Denmark but also for the EU the European Union something will happen we don't know uh, what will happen but oh it's not it's not gonna uh, there will be uh, some rules or regulations coming up what they really? will be so uh, wait yeah, just for 911 truthers or no 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 for for uh, fake fake news or uh, Are, okay is this this in Denmark you're saying it's all for the uh, EU uh, for the EU, probably. It sounds like a uh, conspiracy. Something I should know about. No, no, it's called politics. Oh, <laughs> so I got a couple more chat uh, questions, which is nice. We went a little early. Thank you for bearing with me and doing that. Uh, it allows me to get a few more questions in here. Tracy has a question that says, "Can you give resources for learning how to check sources to distinguish fact from fiction, especially learning how to critically fact check internet sources?" Put them in the chat also. But can you give us a summary real quick? Well, the, we, we might put our own website mm -hmm. in because if, if at, at least that, that would be the, the best resource for checking fact checking uh, uh, claims about 9-11 uh, because our, our website is both in Danish and, and in English. Okay, and that was a question I wanted to ask you too. Why? And, and we got, uh, can, can I just... Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, add to that, that on our website, there's a whole lot of uh, resources uh, uh, under the menu. Um, what's it called? Uh, documentation? Yes. Ah. Yes. 
So because we, we collect a lot of uh, 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 all kinds of uh, research that that is is relevant for for 9/11, but also in in a more broad in, in a broader scope uh, around conspiracy theories uh, in general. Fantastic. So uh, one of the questions that I want to ask is, you guys are in Denmark. What the heck that you're experts on something that happened in the United States? Is there a, oh, you have simple. a nice summation for that? Oh yeah, that's 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 due to uh, the, the guy we mentioned, Neil Sarit, uh, because he was he was very uh, he got a lot of media attention in Denmark when he uh, uh, published his report about nanothermite back in two thousand and nine. Uh, so that that actually uh, made Klaus and I uh, sit down and and just think we we, we got to do some sort of debunking because debunking sites were only American at that time. Uh, so, but we've got one of the, the big shots here, so, so so we have to act on that. Um, so also, the, I, I, I was living in New York at the time of the attack. Oh! Uh, so uh, when I moved back to Denmark a couple of years later, I ran into uh, some truthers. Uh, they were ha having a demonstration at the main central square in Copenhagen, and each, one by one, I spoke to them, one by one, they lied to me. And that is a very, very bad idea. Don't, sorry for using the F word. I know it's a, uh, don't fucking lie to me, okay? Uh, <laughs> that pisses me off. <laughs> so I went back and I wrote an article about it and uh, Steve saw the article and we began to, we, and that's how we basically met each other and we decided to uh, create 911facts.dk and as they say, the rest is history. More people should lie to you. So you're passionate about something and maybe it's maybe. amazing. I get married more than once. <laughs> From Jeff, he wants to know. You mentioned Alex Jones by name as someone who has run a successful grift by selling su silly supplements on the back of the 9/11 Truth Movement. Are there any other notable figures doing so specifically in this context? You're skipping a question, Susan. That was, I know. That was, uh, one I, know. Oh, okay. I will. Awesome. I'll come back. Okay. 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 Great. Um, um, I don't know. What your feet. Come on now. Well, well, uh, architects and engineers for Unlimited Truth, they ha have these uh, uh, pledges for money for various projects. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't uh, seem as I mean, their leader or then leader, he has now left the the, uh, the organization, Rich Gage. Uh, he had a pretty neat uh, annual salary uh, with money coming in from uh, supporters, truthers. Uh, so, uh, but they are not selling uh, projects uh, or products per se. Uh, Alex Jones seems to have uh, cornered that market pretty well, at least in the US. We're not familiar with anything uh, uh, similar of that magnitude in uh, Denmark or in Europe. But we do have we do have uh, conspiracy theorists, especially during uh, the pandemic, who are trying to sell or uh, to sell uh, either uh, products or uh, lectures or uh, classes on how to improve your health without these uh, without the vaccines. So yeah, there is a market for it, definitely. In conspiracy land. Okay, let's go back to Sherry. She says, is there an effective way to reach those who believe in conspiracy theory to encourage them to look at the truth? We're, for instance, when we're talking to family or friends, you only just have like a couple minutes, a minute on this one. <laughs> well, the, no. the, short, the short answer is no. Uh, no. And I think there will be something as we will write about it in, in the same article that, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, there is an, a, a pretty effective way of uh, uh, talking to them and debating with them um, in order to to narrow it it down um, and and we're going to be writing about that too in in, in that article that, that that we mentioned but it's very 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 difficult it's not impossible to to make them realize that they are on the wrong path here mm -hmm. uh, because it has as a as I said earlier it has it it comes at a very big cost for them to leave the path that they are on now because it's it's such an error path, and they would have to. Uh, I, I actually, I think that what what you need to change that path would be uh, some sort of a revelation uh, 
uh, to go into following another path. And that might even not uh, solve the problem because that would be changing one uh, strange or crazy belief with another crazy belief. Um, so it's, it's close to impossible and the, the um, uh, motivation probably has to come from uh, within. Mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you put that into people? It's, it's, we're still looking for, for, I don't think there's an easy way. I, I'm glad you said that because I, I hear this question all the time about what can we do for these people? And there really isn't much you can do. The only thing that we can do, I guess, is to try to get them before they get into the rabbit hole yep. with great information, critical thinking skills, and, and so on. I guess I guess that's probably where we are. Is we, we're going to lose a lot of people to these kinds of things, but let's make that pool as small as possible by trying to inoculate people before they get to Yep. That. I do love, love however, have you, uh, if, if any of you have seen, um, what's his name, Matt Delahanty, mm -hmm. when uh, at the uh, Atheist Experience, the way he, uh, he answers this when, when people ask similar questions is that if, if they're closely related to you, if, if they're family, if they're friends, avoid talking about it. Mm -hmm. Be, so, so try to talk about something else, talk, talk about things that connect you. That makes you feel good together, because especially if, right. if it's because there are too, mo too too many emotions involved with this. And I think the same piece of advice goes with people who are in in the, in the United States who are split between Trump voters and uh, not Trump voters. Uh, I, I can only imagine how how terrible it, it it must be for you. It is, and I guess remember the good times. Keep the communication open if you can, and it keeps you and you can healthily do it. So I need to end it because it's time. And that was terrific, you guys. Thank you so much for coming all the way from Denmark. It's one of the only times we can do something like this is during a pandemic, I guess, because we have to do it this way. But I really appreciate it. That was very informative. It's very important what you guys are doing. Lots of great lessons. Um, put all the links that you want in the chat and I'll try to get them on the videos that we have that are coming up too. So everybody, please check out their, their website, check out their work. And I'm looking forward to that, that article coming out for sure. Thank you very much for having us and uh, lovely to see and hear your voice again, Susan. Yes, please stay around if you can. I know it's uh, late over there. We will. we will. Okay, fantastic. So let me, let me unspotlight and go back and we're going to start on our next talk. This was, that was really interesting, but I have another really interesting talk for you today in a completely different subject, which is always interesting. I like, I like that these are mixed up a little bit. And our next speaker is a good friend of mine. Her name is Linda Rosa. She has an awful lot of expertise in a lot of different areas. And uh, she has, <laughs> a lot of really uh, interesting past in the, um, the world of journals and therapeutic touch. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a subject today that is completely different. I have not, I don't have a real good basis on this, and I'm looking forward to this, to uh, learning more about attachment therapy. So Linda, it's all yours. Uh, thank you. I'm a virgin at a Zoom present presentation, so I'm hoping this goes fairly smoothly. Um, I think I've got this. Okay, have you got this on your scene, scheme, uh, screens, excuse me? Uh, no, I just see it. Um, how do I show my... So go down uh, to the bottom of my your slides. screen. Linda, if you look at the bottom of your, your screen, it should have a little green oh, sure. box. Yes. And I do desktop one. Yeah. yeah. Whatever your PowerPoint is on, that's the one you should share. Okay. Yes. And we can always go back if, if you need to, if you pick the wrong screen, we've all done that. So don't, don't worry too much. <laughs> and and if, if you have any audio in it, you needed to also check another box. Do you have any audio in it? Like a video of anything? Yes, I do. Yes. So when you share the screen, it will say, oh, that's changed. Oh, good grief. Oh, yeah. It should say optimize for video clip. There should be a little box right at the bottom on the left. After you, so if you click share screen, 
I don't, Hang on, I just to to share okay. Now. Click. Okay. Desktop one. So if you look at the bottom of that white box, it should say optimize for video clip. You need that to check that box. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Share sound. Yeah, share that sound. I think you also have to check the share sound. I'm not sure that they go together. The, the video clip may mean if you're running a video in the background of your own, uh, you know, camera image. Yeah, I usually just check the one. Hopefully it'll work. We'll find out, I guess. Okay. Okay. Hey, I'll mute myself now. All Thank right. You. Do you see this? See the slide now? Yes. Yes. Oh, you do. Okay, great. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about attachment therapy too. I've been uh, with advocates for children in therapy since it started 20 years ago when a 10 year old girl was killed in a therapy session in Colorado. Our mission has been to oppose unvalidated and abusive psychotherapy for children. Uh, our main target has been attachment therapy. It's, it's such an awful practice that we thought 20 years ago that all we'd have to do is expose uh, that it's being done and it would end, but it has, alas, a lot of appeal for some people. I will have, be showing some uh, film clips of children being abused, and I'm trying to keep it down just to one minute because those are those are hard to watch. Um, I've lost my... <laughs> Excuse me, folks. Are we back? Okay. Yes. Uh, even in the mental health field, there have been some pretty awful contenders for worst, worst quackery. But attachment therapy clearly ranks up there because its goal is to do nothing less than inflict physical and emotional pain, and main, mainly on adopted children. The torture goes on both in therapy and in the home because parents are considered co-therapists, and it robs children of their their childhoods, sometimes their lives. Those who escape at age 18 find a future, they face a future with no family support, poor, poor health, and little education. So what do these attachment therapists do? The therapists assume all children have been traumatized in early life, all adopted children at which time they have repressed memories of that trauma. The therapist intentionally re-traumatize the child with hours of coercive restraint and aversives, such as knuckling their sternum or putting their hand over their face so they can't breathe. Rape is reenacted with the therapist lying on top of the child and licking the child's face. Attachment therapists claim this will regress a child back to infancy so that repressed memories can surface and infantile rage can be drained off with forced catharsis. After hours of this, when the child is reduced to a sort of whimpering little puddle, he's handed over to his adoptive mother to be cuddled and treated like an infant. This is ho it's hoped at this point that he will accept her authority over him and attach to her. Of course, all of this is just utter nonsense and but torture for the children. Uh, that picture on the lower left, you see a, the therapist elbowing the uh, abdomen of a child. On the right is a form of holding therapy that's particularly painful and dangerous, subjecting the child to possible suffocation. And the boy in the middle is with attachment therapy, psychotherapy, uh, is it psychodrama, 
and his attachment mother is on the right and a therapist is over on the left uh, taking the role of his biological mother who he never met but uh, he has supposed to uh, he's being forced to accept one and reject the other. This all started with Robert Zaslow and Martha Welch some 40 years ago. German psychologist Robert Zaslow and Columbia University physician Martha Welch believed autism to be caused by attachment problems between mother and child. Zaslow happened to be the consultant for the last Elvis Presley movie, movie in which Elvis did the first holding therapy session ever filmed. Elvis was really especially trying to be gentle with this girl, but it seems he was holding a real autistic child and she did not want to be restrained. After Welch was featured on the cover of Life magazine, she was successful in persuading a lot of parents of autistic children to restrain them, force the eye contact and demand affection. I have a film clip of Welch method uh, <clears throat> attachment therapy. Uh, and that's uh, Martha Welch in the background. Uh, let's see, and little Stacy here is being, has his mother, has an adoptive mother on top. We want to love mommy. We want you to give my kisses. You are too stubborn. I need you to want me, say. You are too stubborn. I need you to want me. I need you to want me, say. That's me. I need you. That feels good, yeah. Hold on. Yes. Oh, that feels good. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. Stacy. shortly on, uh, little Stacy is threatened with not being able to eat that day if she doesn't give her mother kisses. And Zazlo later came to Colorado to the school for, school for the Blind. He claimed that doing holding therapy with forced eye contact with blind children could cure them of blindness. That probably didn't work out too well, but uh, Colorado psychiatrist Foster Klein was very impressed with the holding therapy and set up a center, uh, the attachment center at Evergreen outside of Denver, which became the nation's go-to place for attachment therapy. Klein, claim that a child's inability to attach is the root cause of many other mental disorders, but needs to be addressed first. He told parents that without this therapy, unattached children would become homicidal. And that probably scared the bejesus out of some parents enough to get them to pay $10,000 for his two week intensive with 20 hours of holding therapy. After the intensive, many of these children were typically warehoused at the center for months or years. This center did a three hour training tape and I'll pay, play a clip from that. I should explain that this therapist, Neil Feinberg, is following a script. It's almost like a ritual. Uh, what he 
what he says to the child has nothing to do with the child's history. Here he assumes, as he does with all adopted children, that they hate their adoptive mother. Okay. Sorry. Let's move on to the next one. Scared? Did you act scared? When mom told you not to come out of your room, what did you do? You're gonna go into your whiny, wimpy routine now? Is that what you're gonna do? If you don't start dealing with the man inside of you, you're gonna kill somebody. Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. How often do you think about killing your mother? How often do you think about killing your mother? When I ask you a question, I expect you to respond. Got it? Got it. Got it. Got it. I didn't like that. Got it. I want it louder and snappier. Got it. Got it. How often do you think about killing your mother, CD? Often. Thank you. So you say that in a full sentence. I feel I don't like killing your mother often. What? Do I want mumbling here? Kick. I don't want you to mumble in here. Thank you. Got it? Got it. Got it. Got it. How are you feeling right now? Scared. Do I want one word answers in here? No, no. No. I, I don't it. want one word answers. Got it? Got it. How do you feel about me being the boss right now? Do you like other people being the boss of you? No, no. Say, I hate it. I hate it. Is that the truth? Yes, no. Then you. Enough of that. Can you imagine? two hours, going through two hours of that. Uh, moving on, another hallmark of quackery is inventing your own disorder and then offering the only cure for it. Attachment therapists invented attachment disorder and typical of a quack disorder, it has a long laundry list of signs to ensure that any child can be diagnosed with attachment disorder. These are just a few of the over 100 signs we've seen used. Typically, these children are said to be violent, destructive, manipulative, and with no conscience, and, for, and that the mother is the only one uh, many times who can see this. Even, you'll note there that even good behavior is a sign of this disorder, but they interpret it as a child who is stalking his prey. Without attachment therapy, adopted children are predicted to take on many or most of these behaviors until ultimately the, the repressed infant rage will make them homicidal. That's why attachment disorder is nicknamed Ted Bundy disease. Yes, they claim Ted Bundy disease, uh, Ted Bundy had attachment disorder. Also Hitler, Saddam Hussein and Edgar Allan Poe. Because these children may identify with Satan, parents are advised to never let them pray because you never know who they are praying to. Interesting that uh, Mother Teresa is on, I would put her on the other end of that scale. Um, attachment therapy has roots, many, many roots. Some of them are in Freud's notion of regression, Bessel van der Kolk on repressed memories, Wilhelm Reich's character uh, armor that needs to be broken down, and psychiatrist Milton Erickson, the hypnotist who was very popular in the 1960s, who advised mothers to sit on children for hours uh, with a good book. Attachment therapists commonly teach that separation of the infant from the biological mother, uh, even at birth, creates a primal wound. Most of these therapists claim attachment begins in utero and that attachment disorder can be caused simply by a pregnant woman having a negative thought about her pregnancy. And, and when doesn't that happen? Others say attachment disorder can begin at conception when the poor defenseless ovum is attached, is attacked by uh, 
by drunken sperm. On the science side of things, uh, we know that child development researchers think that attachment is, a very, is very robust in children with attachment behaviors beginning not, not at birth or in, uh, in, in utero, but uh, beginning around six months of age. Uh, and because of good, uh, re good reactions and good experiences with caregivers. This is the infamous Nancy Thomas, a layperson in Colorado who worked for years at the Attachment Center at Evergreen and became the leading proponent of attachment therapy parenting. I don't have time to call, cover much of the parenting side of attachment therapy. Briefly, the idea is to create children who are gratefully and unquestioningly, unquestioningly <laughs> obedient. That is the sign of attachment, they think. And think of it as creating little Stepford children. A child's bedroom is stripped bare. The child may sleep on the floor with a bucket to pee in, alarms on the door. Some, some survivors have told me the worst thing about the therapy and its parenting is to be hungry, is that they are hungry all the time. This sort of parenting is unlikely to create a happy family. So, it ten, so the methods tend to escalate, oftentimes into extreme abuse. Reparenting is done at home as well as in therapy. This is forced age regression that is supposed to help redo the child's early development. The mother treats the older child like an infant or toddler with bottle feeding and also with bathing and dressing the child. Children are also forced to do long periods of motionless sitting called strong sitting. And they do get put in cages. This, by the way, the state of Ohio funded holding therapy for this family with 11 adopted children. This couple started a support group for parents of children with attachment disorder. They were found keeping their four children in plywood cages. The mother had made child-sized prison uniforms for them. And these, alas, are photos of some of the children killed by attachment therapy and its parenting. Many more have been, have been rescued, but found severely abused. Uh, many of them will have medical problems for the rest of their life. Uh, uh, starvation was very common. Uh, details of their cases, each case was horrific. Uh, the most well-known death is that of Candace Newmaker at the hands of two licensed social workers in Evergreen, Colorado. 11 hours of her therapy had been filmed and was shown at the, chair, at the therapist's trial, including the fatal rebirthing where Candace was wrapped for 70 minutes in a flannel sheet with 13 cushions and four adults pushing down on her. Her adoptive mother, a pediatric nurse practitioner, sat next to Candace's head and did nothing to save her while the therapist taunted her. Candace even tried to tell them she was dying but they thought she was just trying to manipulate them. In the video, we could hear Candace vomiting and her agonal breathing at the end. It was a slow, horrible death that drove the, the jury to tears. The therapists were sentenced to 16 years in prison. The mother and the assistants got off quite lightly. We wrote a book trying to explain what in the Sam Hill those therapists and the mother were thinking when they ignored Candace's distress. We assisted the prosecutors for that trial and we continued to help other prosecutors understand what attachment therapy and the parenting is all about. We also have assisted families trying to rescue these children. We have a website tells all about it, about these, uh, about the the therapy and the parenting. And we've helped 
over 250 survivors who are members of a private uh, Facebook site. Some conversion therapy is based on the belief that homosexuality is an attachment disorder. Uh, they use, they refer to Martha Welch. We're beginning to see that where conversion therapy is banned, kids are being sent to attachment therapists. We've, we've had a lot of war stories along the years. I don't think I have time to go through them all. The uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act has not been our friend, just any kind of bogus complaint and ISPs will drop you. Uh, there was a terrible judgment against one of our colleagues for continuing to speak up about attachment therapy being used in Utah schools. Uh, three slap suits against us caused us to lose affordable liability insurance. And the craziest thing was one therapist or <clears throat> um, hired a reputation repair committee, repair company to harass us. And they attempted to incite a jihad against us and Stephen Barrett, who has a uh, article about attachment therapy on Quack Watch. They set up a bogus website with our uh, home addresses and some uh, ghastly graphics about the, uh, uh, the profit. Uh, we have had successes. We got physical restraint therapy outlawed in Colorado, uh, meaning that physical restraint as therapy. But the therapist got around that <laughs> by having the parents do the holding. Uh, better was when Craig Foster, Jean Mercer, and I worked on a problem of attachment therapy being funded in, by the Colorado Department of Human Services. The upshot after quite a while was that in 2019, Colorado became the first state to have guidelines for selecting science-based mental health therapy for people in care of the state. We were really thrilled about this because it not only affected uh, attachment therapy by any name, but also hundreds of other crazy therapies. And we hope other states will follow Colorado's good example. So uh, that was a lot to throw at you. You might be confused by that, but any questions? That was that was terrific ish. Um, I'm God. Who? Um, Adrian, can you can you spotlight me as well? Yeah, gosh, Linda, that gosh, was Linda, so Linda, emotional. Oh my that God. was just horrible. I I've been near tears watching that. I I don't even know what to say. That I I knew I'd heard of. I mean, I knew this, and I'd known uh, now that I know about that. Um, well, thank you. I had known about uh, Candace. I'd heard about that as well. And I, I, oh my gosh, this is why it's so important. As Steen said, this is, or Klaus had said, this is why we have to do what we do and to, and to, in the skeptic committee. And I, and I'm throwing out the first thing because that's my prerogative. We don't have a lot of time. We can get to what we can, um, just like with uh, facilitated communication, when you go and you look at the videos online, I want to make sure I point out that these videos that are up on these, that you could find about these, these aren't sting organizations. These aren't sting operations where somebody's filmed them and then snuckily put the videos up. These are videos that they put up, am I right? Because they think this represents them well. They, they're they proud of this. They think this is this is good. I, I don't think they are posting them anymore themselves, but these, these are clips from training tapes. And they tend, according to the survivors, they're showing a more restrained way of treating children. Sometimes these things would really get out of, out of hand. Uh, so, uh, but yes, they, they were proud of this. They, they showed many of those clips that are on YouTube 
uh, on, on news programs and whatnot. They were, they were helping these horrific children to be turned around and nobody questioned the, the good intentions of therapists and adoptive parents. Okay, let's see if I can get through some of these questions. We got, we got almost 15 minutes. So I, I just, I feel like something in the pit of my stomach. I'm glad you showed those videos is hard as it was to watch, but to have you just explain what was going on, I don't think has the power that those video clips did. And I can't imagine watching more. Okay, from Tracy, doesn't some regulatory agency have rules and guidelines on touching and restraint? Um, well, professional organizations do. Um, the, when you make complaints about these people, it goes to their licensing uh, boards. And many of the people on these licensing boards uh, will, if they're concerned at all, just give a slap on the wrist to these people. Uh, or they are already... Uh, think that this is a uh, reasonable accepted therapies. That's what happened with, uh, uh, you almost have to kill a child in order to get uh, some reasonable discipline of these therapists. Oh my God, I just feel sick. Um, okay, um, from Adrian, were there lawsuits as a result of this therapy? Uh, with Candace Newmaker? No, in uh, general, I think she she, I, she asked that question before you got to Candace. Okay, that's that's probably the problem. A lot of times, really awful uh, psychotherapy is controlled by something called uh, regulation by litigation. But in this case, the survive the the survivors of this are. Uh, leave leave their homes at age 18 uh, very damaged. They don't realize that they have only two years in order to file a lawsuit the people who've been who tormented them. And it's often years later that they realize that attachment therapy wasn't uh, wasn't legitimate therapy, but it's too late for them to file a, file a case. There was one girl in, I, I, in Iowa who recently uh, filed a successful case against her parents. Hmm. And that's, that's it. One. So from Deborah, what are valid and effective approaches to adopt these specific issues, if any, especially for children who spend their infancy and early childhood in an institution such as the uh, children in uh, Romania? Okay. Um, there is another disorder called reactive attachment disorder, which is uh, a problem that children who have had extremely uh, neglective or abuse, uh, neglected or physical abuse in early childhood. Uh, it, uh, and it's, uh, it's a rare disorder. Uh, it is recognized in the DSM and it is described as the child being very, very withdrawn. Okay. And uh, the, there is no recognized therapy for it, but researchers are finding that when these children are placed in a good home, when the, peop when the parents are very responsive and patient with the child, the disorder uh, resolves itself in three years or less without therapy. Now the attachment therapists like to conflate attach their attachment disorder, their phony disorder with reactive attachment disorder. And they almost always refer to it as reactive attachment disorder, as RAD. And the parents refer to their kids as rad kids or radishes. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, 
Next question from Tracy. Don't psychiatric and psychological treatments have to undergo scientific studies to demonstrate some kind of safety for psychological health and effectiveness? Or can just anyone with any bizarre theory just start treating someone? Yes, they can. Um, one of the, <laughs> the thing is, where, whether they're going to get insurance reimbursement, that's another reason why the attachment therapists say they treat reactive attachment disorder because, so that they can get um, insurance reimbursement. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a, can I, sh let's see, share this, share the screen again and uh, show, let's see, <laughs> I don't know what I've got here. Uh, let me, let me just cut to the quick here. Um, I'm sorry. Um, she didn't share the screen. We're not seeing it. I didn't flat. see. Okay. I, there's a, there was a study done. There was a study done a couple of years ago by two, two researchers who went three months online to look at the websites and conferences that, of social workers. They found 480 some uh, bizarre quack practices that social workers were doing. Uh, it's an amazing list. I'll, po I'll post the link to it. If you ever want to feel like uh, the world of irrationality is closing in on you, just take a look at this incredibly long list of practices done, uh, done by therapists. If we really want a downer, you mean? Another yeah, real loud. Uh, I mean, after after hearing the nine one one talk, and now yours, I'm just kind of like in need of a drink or something. <laughs> I don't drink. Um, next question is from Brian Hart. I wonder if Linda knows about the episode of This American Life. It has a case of a successful attachment there, mm. and he's got the link in the chat if you if you're not aware of it or not. I I I liked American This American Life, but I don't know if I've ever seen this before. Do you know that? We, we, oh, yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, there was a Russian adoptee. And we complained bitterly and repeatedly because they kept re-airing uh, re that program. Uh, the therapist that poor boy went through uh, gave him a really hard time. Uh, one of, if you recall on my, uh, my slides, there was a picture. There was a drawing of two parents sitting on top of a boy that one of the therapists he was sent to was his method of, of therapy. Uh, so this was the power, showed the power of adopted children, uh, and a, I mean of adopted parents when they go to the media. Uh, the media is just not, does not question these methods. They take take the word of the therapists and the adopted parents on how terrible these children are. And, you know, some children may have serious problems, others may not, but it seems like a lot of adoptive parents are going into adoption for the wrong reasons. Their life and they should definitely not be parents of any kind. Um, from uh, Ed, he wants to know, what was the legal basis for the $25,000 judgment? <sighs> Can you sum it up? Not, I'm not, I, I don't know. It didn't, it didn't seem to add up. Um, uh, our colleague was, I worked for the school, school uh, district and he was told repeatedly not to talk about attachment therapy being, being used at the school. And I think it was that he had defied um, this and that attachment therapy was, was wildly popular in Utah at this time. We failed to get new, uh, legislation through the Utah legislature. And uh, actually the judgment was initially 100,000 got down to. So uh, 
it it was long and drawn out and uh, and uh, it's, um, I really can't give you any more information at this okay. time. On it. That's something there. So from Karen, um, are the attachment disorders legitimate concerns that are treatable by su respected successful standard methods and this horrendous attachment ther therapy being a fringe, bastardized, ineffective, misguided offshoot from accepted practices or are attachment disorders non-existent in total? And she's yeah. hoping she's uh, clear. All, all mental health prof national professional organizations have a code of ethics that uh, on they, <laughs> on touch. And it seems that they never even imagined uh, coercive restraint um, therapy, but it certainly violates uh, their, their code of ethics on touch. And some of them have been making statements about coercive restraint as therapy as well, like, this, like the social workers. So it, it's, it's so far beyond what uh, practice should be. Right. Okay. Um, Jeff and Adrian and other people want to know how you got you got your way into this in the activism world. I should say, um, Linda has has been involved in multiple um, alternative method kind of alt med kind of stuff. So this isn't her first rodeo, and. <laughs> uh, and so you, you can look her up and see some of the things she's been able to do. She's, she's really great at uh, doing, one of the things I've noticed that she's done that I've never been able to figure out is how to get a freedom of information, you know, file that form to get, um, get that information from somebody. But mm. how did you find yourself involved in this area? Well, with attachment therapy, it, there was the news on the line that this girl had died um, at the hands of these two therapists. And everybody thought, well, they, that is so crazy, that therapy, you know, uh, wrapping a kid in a, uh, up and suffocating her. We all thought that this was just two, two total nuts, okay? But what drew my attention to it was the mother was a nurse practitioner. And I wondered, what is a nurse involved in this? Uh, as far as being uh, involved in skepticism and whatnot, I was working in South America and the, the pseudoscience down there is so, it's just everywhere. I mean, if UFOs visit the United States, they live down in <laughs> South America. You know? And I saw the Zetetic and I got a, I got a subscription to that. And I loved reading about skepticism. And then when I had my daughter, I was home and puttering around the house and got all this uh, literature about getting a uh, continuing education in nursing by taking uh, courses on crystal healing and therapeutic touch. And I thought that's get, not in my profession. <laughs> so that's where it started. Oh my gosh. Okay. So um, the last question I'm going to ask is from Jan and she asks, are you saying that there's no such thing as attachment disorder? And she disagrees that attachment behavior manifests around six months of age. I would say that an early attachment is necessary for survival. It can go wrong if there's not consistent meeting of the child's needs. Well, yes, children need their needs met. Um, what was the first part of that? Is yeah. that, are you saying there is no such thing as attachment disorder? Oh. Oh. Right, as the attachment therapist put it on their, their attachment disorder, that no child has that, okay? That is just absolutely crazy insane. There is the reactive attachment disorder that I described that's rare with a withdrawn child. And then there are attachment issues, which is, can be fairly common with children who have are foster children or attachment dis, or, or adopted children. Uh, but those 
it, those are not really considered a disorder as, as mm -hmm. that. Now, why they think, why researchers think that attachment and attachment, to, and attachment begins around six or seven months is that, well, first of all, we don't know what's going on in an infant's mind, but it seems at that point, the, uh, the child is able to discern that there are individuals in the life, that there's me and there's other people who are taking care of me and that we can interact and whatnot. And it does it from birth until about six months or so, it really doesn't matter who is taking care of the child just so long as the child is getting needs met. There is really no at, uh, appearance of attachment to a particular child, according to what the, the researchers think at this time. Okay, so uh, Linda, Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I really appreciate it. I didn't really fully understand attachment therapy before this. Um, we hear people all the time talk about what we can do. How do we change the laws? What is it we got to do? And I know that it's way too complex of an answer of what to answer that. So what I would suggest to anybody who, who finds this as important as I do um, and wishes they could just get these laws changed and so on, um, I assume probably to be in touch with you, but the, and read the literature, read the, read, read everything they can, you know, about it. But more importantly is just having you speak about this today in our smallish group, and it'll go onto YouTube and, and it'll be a video that can be shared. It's just getting information about it. Um, we found that in facilitated communication as well as people don't believe that this actually is being done and it's so abusive. Mm -hmm. And just the fact of having the knowledge of this to understand it and be able to define it and know it exists, I think is, is powerful. So um, I really appreciate you talking today and, and uh, this horrible subject. I think I'm going to go find a cat and put it or something. <laughs> Because it it's awful. I'm sorry. It's it's, it a, it's a downer, but it's an important thing we should know. So just don't it. restrain your cat. Oh, <laughs> oh well, come on, a, man. I gotta touch that cat. That's a cat. Uh, it's a good example of how extreme something can get when it's not restrained by good research. Absolutely. And there's a lot of this out there. Thank you, Linda. Clap, clap, clap for everybody that's <laughs> Okay, this is important work and, and uh, Linda's doing it. Adrian, thanks, Linda. Adrian, can you flip me over to um, Robert? Oh, look at all these faces that are here now. Wow. So <laughs> with that downer, uh, we're going to be talking next to Robert Palmer, who is not the Robert Palmer that just got four years in a uh, uh, prison for his attack on the on the Capitol. This or am not, I? <laughs> no, you are not, and you're not the famous Robert Palmer who is the. Um, no, he's been gone 15 years or so, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, has he really? Yep. Oh, I didn't know that. I I didn't know he was still alive, or he wasn't still alive. Anyway, so the talk we're going to hear next is uh, Robert Palmer, Critical Thinking 101: Inoculating Yourself Against False Beliefs. You have a a bit of a challenge here, Rob, that you're going to need to kind of up the mood a little bit, which is going to be really kind of hard. But well, uh, I, do, I don't at least have any horrendous videos in it. In fact, in fact, this is a 20 minute version of an hour talk that I've given before, and I'm going to give it again. We'll tell you about that later as an hour. So this has got a lot of stuff shaved out. All the videos are gone, even though it didn't have any horrendous videos like Linda's <laughs> did. But no videos in this one. Um, I tried to keep in all the main points. I try to keep this to 20, 25 minutes. And um, one point, I created this talk to give to non-skeptics. It, it was for actually recovering from religion. They asked me to create this because they have people coming out of religious backgrounds who are not critical thinkers. So it was originally um, imbued with a lot of comments and examples of how you know, non-critical thinking affects religion. And so I've taken most of that out. Um, but I hope even though most people here are skeptics by nature, I hope you still get something out of it and you learn something. Um, one point is that Linda had some audio issues, at least on my end, her audio was breaking up. So if anyone 
uh, sees that happen, hears that happening with me, please put it in the chat and then Susan can you know jump in and tell me and then I'll just shut my video off because you don't need to see my face talking. Um, just let me know. Sometimes uh, the actual you'll have a little problem here on Zoom and then you'll get over to the YouTube channel and it's fine. Mm. So it, it's just a thing. Just bear with it. Uh, if we end up having a little bit of problem, I think we can handle it. But OK, so on my, not... on my screen, my my thing is covered with other things. Do you see the whole PowerPoint presentation with no blocks of it? Yeah, no blocks. You're good. Very good. OK. Okay, so um, I subtitled this inoculating yourself against false beliefs because like, hey, in the pandemic, I had to, and by the way, I might be the first speaker with COVID. So I have an active infection and I'm isolating. Uh, luckily, I am triple vax, so not so bad so far. What does this talk about? So uh, our brains evolved on the savanna of Africa, right? And then after that, through the rest of the world for a short time, well enough to allow our species to survive. But our thinking organ which evolved just to foresaw death until we could reproduce, right? That's how, uh, that's how it works. It's far from perfect. Uh, understanding this fact, having neuropsychological humility is one key to critical thinking. And that's what I'm mostly gonna be talking about. So that term was coined by Stephen Novello. He expounded upon it in the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe book, which I heartily recommend. And here is how he defined it when he actually talked about it in an article in Skeptical Inquirer. Um, I really like this, so I'm going to read it. First, I'm going to hide my controls because I can't read the bottom. Hide meeting controls. There we go. So being a functional skeptic requires knowledge of all the various ways in which we deceive ourselves, the limits and flaws in human perception and memory, the inherent biases and fallacies in cognition, and the methods that can help mitigate all these flaws and biases. I'm mostly going to be talking about the flaws in the perception and memory and the biases part so that we can understand those. Okay, the talk is outlined as follows. There's two main parts, functional limitations of the brain and reasoning errors that we make. The first part's got some sections, sensory input error, the data handling limitations. So the first part is our senses put information into our head, right? And there's limitations to that, the accuracy of that. Then once it's in our head, there's problems with getting it into our head. Then of course, once it's in there, we have to retrieve it as a memory and there are issues with that. Now, once all of that flawed and partial information is in our brains, we have to think about it, right? So we have cognitive biases and logical fallacies, which affect the outcome of what we think about the data in our heads. So let's go to the first section, functional limitations of the brain, right? One important aspect of critical thinking or skepticism is understanding the limitations of human perception and memory. In other words, the functional limitations of your brain. People generally understand that memory isn't perfect even if they don't realize quite how bad it is. But they assume your senses, your vision, that gives you an accurate view of the world around us, especially if you don't wear glasses and you have 20-20 vision. The common refrain is, I know what I saw. If, if, if anyone says something, I saw a UFO, I saw a Bigfoot, I saw, you know, I don't know, the spirit of uh, the Holy Ghost appeared to me. I know what I saw. So the reasons that we can be thinking these things and it not be true is that we don't see the world around us in full or even as it really is, right? Our vision is unreliable, it's imperfect. Your eyes have flaws that you would never accept if you bought a camera, you'd bring the camera back. You have a blind spot in your retina where the optic nerve exits the retina and you see absolutely nothing in a fairly large spot, but it's actually much worse than that. The rest of your retina, you only see high resolution in a tiny area in the center of your vision. It's the fovea. If you put your arm out and you look at your thumbnail, it's just twice the thumbnail that's in high res. Everything else is not. In fact, it's not even in um, color for the most part. So that's a cross section of the eye, very simplistic, but you could see the little blotch, which is the fovea. And if we were to map um, how well you can see, giving one the best possible with the cells there, it's only one for a tiny, tiny bit of that point. And then it drops off very quickly. As you can see, it goes to almost zero very quickly at any radius around. And of course, it's zero at the blind spot. Well, also, as I mentioned, that's where uh, your, your actual color vision is. So most of the rest of the part outside that little two thumbnails at arm's length, it's grayscale. And some proof of this is to support it, approximately half the nerve fibers and the entire optic nerve carry information from that tiny little spot while the remaining half go to the much larger area all around your eye. So in a nutshell, outside the fovea, your vision is low res, gray, 
and you're effectively looking at the world through a small tube without the realization of that. Now, why don't you realize that? Because the brain fools you into thinking everything is perfect. It's in high resolution and it's in full color. While the scene is being observed, your eyes automatically subconsciously are commanded by your brain to shift gaze and bring different portions of the scene into focus on the phobia. And then your brain fills all that in. It fills in the blind spot. It, it assumes colors where it's not seeing them based on what it sees in the phobia. Your brain stitches it all together in the limited time it has before things change in the view. And that's the view that's presented to you. And then there's another thing. You're blinking all the time. It's approximately 10% of the time that you're awake and looking at things. You're actually having nothing at all fed to your brain. It's black. But, and you don't even notice this, right? If, if you were watching a movie and every 10 frames went blank or every one second out of 10 went blank, you would absolutely shut it off, right? You don't see this happening in your real world view right now because your brain doesn't let you see that right? Your brain's visual cortex combines all the less than perfect input to construct a broad view of the world, and it presents that in a highly edited, it's a manufactured reality that you think is perfectly real. It's just a model. It's just an approximation of your environment that's good enough to get by so you don't get eaten by a tiger on the savannah, right? Also, if something is not clearly seen or it's seen for too short of a time or just it happens to be ambiguous, your brain gets confused, but it has to make you think you're seeing something. So it shows you what it thinks it saw, right? This is how all sorts of perceptual errors happen, including optical illusions and, and the like. So here's a fairly interesting one, I think. So, you know, how is that done? Is this done in a computer? Is that, is that a, a computer graphic? Uh, no, it's a flat piece of paper that just happens to have lines drawn on it in a certain way and it's cut at that angle. So that's what it looks like, right? If you just flip it over a little bit, angle the paper down a little bit, now you get a cube instead of a long rectangle. And it's just a flat piece of paper. So this is not a moving image. Most people's eyes and brains will see that as rotating and maybe even get a little nauseous. So close your eyes before that happens. But is everyone seeing that? Susan, are you seeing that move? Yes, I am. Yeah, that, slowly, that. very slowly. Yep. Yeah, so if you put your hands up to a little tiny portion of it and just look through the little spot in your hand, you won't, it, it's clear it's not moving. So your brain is clearly tricking you in some way and is just wrong, right? So also, if all that isn't enough to convince you that your senses don't actually show you the world the way it actually is, our evo eyes evolve to only see a tiny, tiny fraction of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Everything else is invisible, but it's just as real as a tiny portion that you can see. This is a graphical representation of that. The top bar shows the frequencies of light from high energy photons, low energy photons, short waves to long waves. And actually the long radio waves go off to infinity. And that little speck in the middle where, where they're showing it in color is all we can see of all of that. But the rest of it is real. You just don't know it's there, right? Other animals can see portions of that spectrum. They see an IR, uh, other animals, including mammals, in fact, see in UV. Learned that in uh, Susan's trivia a few weeks ago. Uh, no species specific perception of the world is complete or in fact, correct, right? And even members of the same species with optimally functioning eyes may experience visual reality very differently. So most people have probably heard of dress gate, right? This is, this is kind of a fascinating thing. This was a photograph of a dress that became an internet viral phenomenon um, six years ago, seven years ago at this point. Actually, there's a Wikipedia article, of course there is, the dress. Uh, viewers of this image vehemently disagreed about what color it was. And, and it wasn't just a, you know, an internet thing. This was a subject of scientific investigation because like, why was this happening? It resulted in peer reviewed scientific papers trying to figure this out, how our brains work here. So what color is the dress? I can't see the chat, but you guys might wanna put that in the chat, what you see here. So there was all different, versions, usually it was like, you know, two different colors people saw and they were different from each other. Um, so I'm going to now tell you what the correct answer is. You didn't know there was a correct answer, did you? The dress has no color. So that gets a lot of pushback when I tell people that, but at least it doesn't have color like it has volume, mass, temperature, and any other real property of matter, right? Color is quite literally a figment of your imagination. It's just a computation that your brain makes to try to differentiate the wavelength for you, 
right? It tries to extract meaning from the world. And as you saw, not every brain computes it the same way. Susan, do you have a pop-ups on my screen? Because I do, with somebody in the waiting room, et cetera? Nope. Okay, somebody's in the waiting room, by the way. Nope. So it, it is a fact that color only exists in your head. There is such a thing as light, and there is such a thing as energy, but there is no such thing as color. This is from neuroscientist. And at the bottom is the name of the article that he wrote this in shortly after it started to be studied because people did not believe this fact. So our other senses such as hearing also have limitations, right? Some animals brains use means other than vision, sonar echolocation to map the world. And they have an entirely different view of reality than we do, which one's right, right? Does a bat's brain map surface texture as color? Maybe, maybe rough as red and smooth as orange. Um, and again, not all members of one species agree on reality. You may know, have heard this. So put in the chat what you heard, I'll play that one again. So this is another one of those things that- the I didn't hear anything. Just... Oh, yeah, the did noise. you not? No, uh-uh. Uh oh. Okay, so that means I did not check share the Yummy. chat. <laughs> no, or Laurel. No. All right. All right. No. Of course, I don't see any place where it says to share the sound. That's right. Share sound. Okay, here we go. Laurel. 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 You hear it that time. Yes. Susan? Yes. Okay. So put in the chat what you heard, because the first time I ever heard this in real life was in my office environment and it started fights because some people thought that <laughs> we were lying to them. No, it's only what I hear. What are you talking about? It's not that you're pulling my leg. Stop it. it was amazing. <laughs> all right. So now we're going to go to the second section, data handling limitations. So now that all this fundamentally flawed information is, is in your brain, well, how did it get there? Right. It doesn't go there at the speed of, well, it doesn't go there at the speed of infinity. Right, you, you have, there's a speed of light, it, your brain and your retina, electrochemical processes. So there's a lag and there's problems like that. Only so much information can be handled at a time, right? Your brain actually ignores much of what the eyes and the senses are sending it. And there's a, a problem of attentional limitations. The processor, the CPU can only handle data at a given rate. So much of what happens around you is actually ignored or not even remembered. When you're driving down the road, you're focused on a car in front of you, maybe on the side, if he's getting close, you don't see all the signs. You can't read all the words and the signs passing you. If you were looking at them and concentrated on that, you would, but then you'd have an accident. So your brain knows not to do that, right? There's a thing called inattentional blindness. This is a failure to observe visible objects in a scene right in front of you that you are looking at, but that you don't see them because you're distracted. Uh, these are rendered effectively invisible. There's a famous example I have in the longer talk about the people of, in white shirts and black shirts passing a basketball back and forth. And you're supposed to count how many times the white team passes the basketball to each other. And you don't see the gorilla walking across right in front of you. Uh, there's a thing called change blindness. It's failure to notice changes in the scene as they happen. Uh, and this is in that same one. There's a curtain, which is the backdrop for the entire thing. It actually changes color from gold to green or something like that. Full screen and almost no one ever sees it happen. So that's failure to notice changes as they happen, right? Basically your brain sees everything as not equally important and it just doesn't see or remember much of it. So now you have this flawed information that got into your brain at less than optimal processing speed and all that. Now you're trying to remember it, right? So now we're talking about memory issues. I know what I saw, as I mentioned before, everyone says, and they also say, I remember it like it was yesterday. Well, the problem is that's just as wrong as I know what I saw. Human memory is imperfect and it's unreliable, right? Your brain is not an organic recording and playback system. Can you accurately remember what something you've seen numerous times look like? Most people say yes, but they're asked to draw a dollar bill or a bicycle and they get it fundamentally wrong. I'm gonna give you just one here. Can you recall what the Toyota emblem looks like? A lot of Toyotas on the road. This is what people, you know, in a random sample of this kind of testing did. Now, some are more wrong than others, but none are, none are actually right. And uh, that's the actual symbol. And that's a typical thing. It's because your brain sees it, it, it stores it, well, that's Toyota, but it doesn't really commit it to memory because it, yeah, it doesn't matter, right? 
The brain retrieves bits of information from past observations. It stitches them all together, fills in the gaps as best as possible. It feeds it to you as a cohesive story, like this is real, but it isn't. Uh, a show that I loved on that, on that geo, Brain Games, had eight seasons discussing this kind of stuff. It's worth looking up. Elizabeth Loftus, who, who spoke at PsyCon, and I got to interview her for The Skeptic Zone, talked all about her experiments to show that people can be made to remember things that never happened to them. Just And those memories that are formed by her experiments are just as real to them as the things that actually did happen to them. So given all that science has revealed about poorly we see, poorly we remember, it makes no sense to trust anyone's memory of what they remember as an extraordinary event, paranormal, supernatural, decades ago, last year, last month, or even a minute ago. Turns out yesterday I was watching the, uh, the show Truth Wanted. It's also a podcast from the Atheist Community of Austin. And there was a caller in talking about his visit to psychics 20 something years ago. And he's sure that these two psychics a week apart told him the same exact thing. And, and Ross was Ross uh, was the um, blotcher from Ono oh Ross and Kari was the guest host. And he, and he told him various ways that he could be wrong about that. And one of which was his own experience with Kari. They visited a psychic medium and then reported on it. And I listened to that episode a long time ago. Ross said, oh yeah, she got one thing right. She came over and she told me my grandmother's name was Clara. I don't remember if that's a detail, but basically. And then Carrie was looking at her notes. No, she didn't. She said her name could have been da, 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 and Clara. And Ross did not remember that. And they were there to evaluate this. So can you imagine just a regular person going to a psychic? So the main point here is, uh, you know, the phrase attributed to Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And it should be obvious that any claim based exclusively on senses and memory does not come close to qualifying as extraordinary evidence, especially when you're trying to you know, prove something paranormal or supernatural. And yet, these famous lines all have one thing in common. Play it against Sam, mirror, mirror on the wall. Lucy, you got some splaining to do. Luke, I am your father. Life is like a box of chocolates. Be me up, Scotty. Does anyone know what's the deal with all of these? What do they have in common? Put in the chat. I'll give you five seconds. See if anybody gets it before I say, and I can't see the chat. So, yeah. So the truth is none of those were actually said at all, ever in the media that they're supposed to be in. So, um, except if you believe in the Mandela effect. So this is a conspiracy theory. And these are books and videos, et cetera, on the subject, uh, all named after Nelson Mandela, because someone decided that they remember Nelson Mandela died in prison and never became um, prime minister, president of South Africa. And uh, then when they were told, yes, he did, said, well, that's not the way I remember it. The universe must have changed. And this is now a thing that people believe uh, the monopoly man either did or didn't have a monocle in different universes. And some people remember it because their brains are maintaining the memory of the other universe. Pikachu had a black stripe on his tail. Uh, Curious George had a tail, that sort of thing. And if you think this is just a joke, this was a review in Amazon. There are a lot of them like this, where somebody was reviewing one of the books about the Mandela effect, right? It's real. I've been on a discover, journey to discover the truth my entire life. On that journey, I found out my memories, my life, even my blood type is no longer what current reality said it to be. The Simpsons writers captured this, or this might have just been a meme. I don't know. I didn't see this episode, but here's Principal Skinner. And there's four examples of things from the Mandela effect around him. Uh, am I just misremembering? No, it's the universe is wrong. And that is a total lack of neuropsychological humility. And that is what these people have. So what we tend to think is I know what I saw. I know what I remember, right? But the reality, according to neurologist Oliver Sacks, Every act of perception is to some degree an act of creation, and every act of memory is to some degree an act of imagination. That, that kind of covers it all. So everything discussed before this point concerns the physiological failings with the design of our bodies. Uh, these are due to how we evolve. They can't be fixed. The only thing you can do is understand those limitations when making decisions about what you think and you believe, right? Now I'm going to discuss the things that you can change because they involve how you process that faulty information, right? Just like the physiological imperfections, our thinking processes or reasoning is also less than perfect, but we at least can partially control how we process the problematic data. We can change how we reason. 
Uh, but we need to understand the flaws in reasoning so you know what you can work on changing, right? And the rest of the talk is going to concern two categories of that. One is understanding what cognitive biases are and also what logical fallacies are. So reasoning errors. So what's a cognitive bias? So that's a heuristic. It's a shortcut in thinking. It influences how we make decisions about what to believe. Your brain is always using heuristics. It could not possibly look at the world and every single scene make a decision based on what it sees from scratch. Um, it just, it's trying to simplify the incredibly complex world and all the data it has, right? Cognitive biases may lead to perceptual distortions and accurate judgments and logical interpretations, broadly what leads to irrationality, right? They're unconscious, but if we understand them, then we can possibly train our minds to use a different pattern of thinking and improve ourselves. I, I, the, the longer presentation, I go into a lot of these in details, but I'm just gonna skim over them here. Um, some cognitive biases of, of, uh, of note, confirmation bias, I call that the mother of all biases, right? Most people here would know what this is. This is, I already believe something, I'm only going to believe the data or even look at data that already confirms what I believe and ignore all the disconfirming evidence. Motivated reasoning and cognitive biases are somewhat all connected to one another, maybe. This one is definitely connected to confirmation bias, but this is an additional, if you have a reason besides what Klaus and Sam were seen were talking about before is that you don't wanna admit you were wrong um, in general. You might have a really good reason for not wanting to admit you're wrong. Like if you're a company um, vice president, you've got a big bonus for changing the way the company does its uh, say, I'll say just randomly, um, engineering of, of a Navy defense system it spends maybe millions of dollars company-wide to, to implement it because you were told that it's going to improve your pro productivity by 300%. And then two years later, things are worse. Well, you're never going to admit that things are worse because of that. It's people weren't following it correctly. You know, no one's going to get back their bonus. No one's going to admit they were wrong. So you're not going to look at the data that says, oh, I shouldn't have done that. There's a status quo bias. People like the things the way they are. Um, there's a bandwagon effect. The more people that you know that believe something, uh, I'm going to stay with them. Must be right, right? There's an interesting one that has to do with your brain and your eyes, pareidolia. Most people know that term, right? It's seeing patterns where patterns don't really exist. There's a common one, seeing things in clouds. People with a religious bent would certainly see some image there. Uh, if you're into ballet, maybe it's a ballet dancer. This is definitely has a religious connotation to most people. These, these made the rounds on the internet. And I think one of them actually made money for people because they had a site selling, you know, signed photographs, uh, hypothetically not signed by the people in the, <laughs> in the image. Um, this is a famous one that came up uh, in, well, the science world. This was from Viking Orbiter in 1976. Blew up big time. There's a face on Mars. That means people built it there. That means there's civilization. There were books written about the cities on Mars, pointing out to every crater, that's a collapsed building. And then we sent an orbiter in 2001, the Mars Global Surveyor. And uh, that's the same feature with a different sun angle and a much higher resolution camera. And no one would have ever said that was a face. So if, if they the Martians intended to signal us by building a face, they did a crappy job. And there's just one that's just wonderful, Chicken Church. Um, so how do you overcome your biases? Well, you have to understand that you have them, right? Everyone has biases, all of us. You have to question what you believe to be true, check for alternate explanations of things and seek out contrary opinions, that's very important. And basically base your beliefs on verified facts, not what people tell you. All right, so the last section is called uh, logical fallacies. So this is a big topic in the skeptical world. Um, I, for one, never heard of these until I started you know, looking into this as a skeptical activist. Certainly wasn't taught in my school. Well, a fallacy is the use of an invalid or otherwise faulty reasoning in the construction of an argument, commonly divided into formal and informal. Informal fallacies contain errors in reasoning other than the use of an improper logical form. And a fallacious argument may be deceptive by appearing to be better than it really is. And again, my long talk has, we go into these in detail, but short, quick, post hoc ergo propta hoc. Uh, because of this, then that happened, right? Everyone knows it's stupid to say the, the sun came up because the rooster crowed. But, you know, I had a bad headache and took homeopathy and now the headache's gone. Oh, must have been homeopathy. Uh, anecdotal evidence. Hey, sticking with that subject, everyone tells me homeopathy works. It must work. Oh, popular. It's popular. That's everyone tells me just by numbers. How could a million people who take homeopathy in the United States be wrong? 
oh, homeopathy has been around for hundreds of years. I'm picking on homeopathy, but you know what else is going to apply to everything. Yep. Uh, I've actually heard this for religion. Christianity specifically is right because uh, millions of uh, people have believed it for thousands of years. One sentence, two logical fallacies. Uh, now, of course, because something is a fallacy and it's structured like that doesn't mean the conclusion is wrong. Christianity might be right, you know, but it's not, it wouldn't be right because of either of those things. And also maybe homeopathy works. It doesn't, but it, it, it certainly, you know, it's it, just because you use a bad fallacy to prove something doesn't necessarily mean the thing you're trying to prove is wrong. It just means you had a bad reason for believing it. And there's the argument from personal incredulity and ignorance. Uh, the first one, ignorance is, you know, we don't know how that happened. So therefore, God, magic pixies, Bigfoot, UFOs, aliens made crop circles, or personal incredulity, sticking with crop circles. I can't believe people can make things that good and that quickly in the middle of the night. Therefore, aliens. And, and uh, there's tons of logical fallacies on the web. People can look into them here at logicallyfallacious.com. There's 300 of them. I had a set which I produce one a week for discussion with people at work, and then I put them on Facebook at that URL. Um, there is the Skeptic Zone list, which Michelle Bickismar and Richard Saunders did, fantastic. Uh, there's, there's a set of 40 in two sections at that URL, right? And there's actually a list of fallacies on Wikipedia. Susan J entered the waiting room. I have a pop-up. So, that's pretty much it. What I hope you got from this talk is that due to our flawed senses, uh, computational limitations and less than perfect memory, what you think you remember experiencing must always be suspect. This is also true and especially true for claims made by others. And it's especially true, double especially, for extraordinary claims, right? Those which contradict what science has uncovered about the nature of reality. So our natural thinking process is flawed in many ways. It's heavily influenced by a host of cognitive biases, easily subjected to fallacious reasoning. But by understanding that, having neuropsychological humility, we can inoculate ourselves from harm. And like the vaccines, that won't be 100%, but goes a hell of a long way to preventing you from getting very sick, as I'm currently experiencing. Understanding our fallibilities and altering those that you can by critically thinking will lead to holding truer beliefs and to hopefully making better decisions. So finally, I wanna say there's a longer version of this presentation. You can snap this with your phone instead of writing it down at that tiny URL. I, it was about an hour long. And I'm also scheduled to give an updated version for Adrian and We Can Reason on January 6th. For people wanting to look into what else I've written on the subject of skeptic, skepticism and uh, critical thinking, you can look at my column in Skeptical Inquire or snap that with your camera and follow me on Facebook. Uh, that's it. Thank you all for your attention. That was really terrific. I'm really sad that we're not going to have time for questions. <clears throat> As I was saying in the chat, if anybody has questions for Rob, they should take them to um, Rob himself. You can also uh, uh, join us uh, for lunch. Uh, the lunchtime, Rob will probably be around. You can tell me about questions and, and, and so on. There's a, there's, he's just got a wealth of information. I'm sorry you had to get that down into a little little spot like you did. Uh, I, I had to cut out a little video from the beginning of the matrix where, you know, he had a, Neo had to decide on the red pill of the building. And I said, Hey, if you don't want to go and get, you know, see reality tune out now and don't watch the rest of this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so hang around. If you have questions for Rob, I'm sure I'll be happy to answer them. You can follow him on Facebook, the well-known skeptic and uh, lots of places you can find. He's done lots of talks. There's a lot of things about him on the internet. So thank you so much, Rob. Thank you, Susan, for having me. Okay, next up, keeping up with being on time, believe it or not, we have Kyle Polish, who is a good friend of ours, who is the runs the the podcast, the Data Skeptic. I hope you guys all subscribe to that. It's a really a fun little, well, it's not fun necessarily. It is a it's a serious look at data. And um, so we're going to start off with Kyle, who has promised he's going to tell us where uh, Walt Disney's head is at. For sure. We'll get into that. <laughs> we'll get into a few other details because I wanted to give a quick presentation on cryonics or the important skeptical question. Can the human life be resuscitated? 
I got interested in this because I was looking into some things about refrigeration and kind of came upon it and was like, oh, that was big when I was growing up. What the heck happened to cryonics? Now, quick disclaimer, I'm really a AI computer science guy. I am not a biologist or a neurologist. I'm doing some casual armchair research here, but luckily a lot of great people have done the real research before me, but uh, there's that disclaimer. Um, so first things first, and I actually screwed this up in the initial description I sent, I sent to Susan. If you search for cryogenics, as I've done here on Google Image Search, you get the uh, idea of what I'm gonna talk about today, but technically that is not cryogenics. So there's cryogenics and there's cryonics, which is the term I should be using. Uh, so cryogenics is a real science. It's about you know all the things that go on weird at low temperatures. How do we get there and why do we do it? Uh, very real thing. Cryonics on the other hand is the effort to preserve a person for later resuscitation. So you have a couple of assumptions with cryonics. First, that uh, the freezing process is non-destructive. Second, that uh, later there'll be some resuscitation technique and that the people of the future will want you back. Um, so a few things we'll unpack there. More specifically, cryonics is the low temperature freezing and preservation of human remains. And I want to stress that it's speculative. No one has ever been brought back yet. Although I guess the uh, cryonics proponents would say that's a, a yet thing that at some point they will. Uh, nothing so far, of course. Um, quick few notes on the process. I'm not really going to focus on this. Um, there is one sort of straw man criticism you'll hear that, oh, it's just like you freeze anything like vegetables, they go bad or whatever. Uh, that isn't to say that it, this is a solved problem or it's easy, but they do a few more techniques than that. Like uh, your body is flushed of blood and they put other things through your circulatory system to help this preservation process. Uh, I don't know that they help, but uh, it's certainly more than just Put somebody on ice. There's a fair amount of work going into it. So where did all of this really come from? If you try and trace back the origins, I mean, you could draw it sooner for speculative writers or, you know, people saying this or that, but most of the research I did points to the book, The Prospect of Immortality, as being sort of the uh, genesis moment of cryonics, uh, published in 1964 by Robert Edinger, this guy right here, who went deep into this, went on to form something called the Immortalist Society. And so keep that year in your mind for a bit. Now let's talk about death real quick. Um, this is a word that uh, as you zoom in on it, you will find there are many kinds of death. And these are sort of uh, very high level versions. I'm sure a doctor might be you know, wanting to give us more specifics on this, but from my reading, I saw three broad categories being used. Clinical death, which is when you are no longer breathing and your circulatory system has failed. It is different from brain dead, of course, because uh, your brain can still be functioning and there's even MRI research and things like that. Uh, I don't know in humans, but at least in dogs, I found that they know the brain continues on for a bit afterwards. Terrifying though, I guess that might be. Um, but clinical death by this definition is the kind of thing modern medicine is getting really good at fighting, right? I could maybe lose all circulation and breathing and still come back. That does happen. So clinical death, not uh, the worst way to die, I guess. Brain death is the number one thing you want to avoid. When your brain, you really lose all brain functionality, most notably involuntary functionality. And then legal death is going to vary quite a bit in a lot of places. I almost didn't want to uh, give a definition because there's so many asterisks on every place I looked, but uh, so I'll give you the circular definition. There's legal death when you're no longer alive in the eyes of the law. Um, most often just hand wavy answer seems to be that's brain death, uh, which also can vary by territory. So uh, as will probably come as no surprise, it's very hard to draw a fine line on a topic like this, but you need one when it comes to the topic of cryonics. First and foremost, because you cannot cryonically freeze a living person. That is against the law. Um, that's why you might hear people who are cryonically frozen referred to as patients. That's not just tongue in cheek, like, oh yeah, they're, they're just waiting for treatment. We're triaging them. We'll check in on them in a couple hundred years. But also because technically what you're doing is you're donating your body to science. Uh, and it just so happens that uh, your body in a scientific way, I guess, will be held in a cryonics chamber. Uh, so more of an experiment than a promise a company can give you legally. Now let's look optimistically for a bit and uh, bring up the animal that's made it into more talks than any other thing I've ever uh, had in slides, the tardigrade. 
they are there's a thousand cells in a tardigrade's body, quite a few orders of magnitude smaller than us, but they survived quite extreme temperatures, minus 200 C, 150 C. Um, they can even survive a 10 day trip around the low earth orbit uh, around the sun uh, when dehydrated. And I don't think that's a, you know, a one up thing that they also did it while dehydrated. I think that has to be, uh, they, they need to lose their water and it puts them into some sort of torpor state. They can even survive massive crushing impacts. So super survivors in a lot of cases, if they can go into this space torpor and come back, I mean, we're not them, but uh, it's all biology. Maybe we can do something like that. Why not? Uh, cryopreservation actually goes on a lot in agriculture. Um, this particular picture comes from a rabbit hole I went down about this uh, university that has kind of like a seed bank type program. So they're able to freeze all, this is a banana right here. Um, they can freeze those cryo cryonically and break or cryogenically, I guess in this case, and bring them back. So there's real science going on. And as everybody knows, you can lose a tail. So, um, you know, if uh, they bring me back and something's gone bad, as long as it's not my brain, maybe they can grow me a new one. I mean, I haven't taken that great care of my body. Maybe a new one's good. There are some species, uh, mostly in fish, that actually produce their own antifreeze. Um, mostly it's some sort of thing with protein and the sugars get in the right crystal shape and it's able to keep the water liquid in a local area. So there are things that are, have survived extreme temperatures in that regard. Now, we don't have those biological adaptations, but they do exist. And then there's always the myth. Have you guys heard of this, that uh, you can freeze a bee and it'll come back just in your household freezer? Well, uh, that's a sad myth for a scientifically curious young man to have to learn is not true. Uh, honeybees cannot actually be frozen. They don't really have any of those adaptations. Um, they're endotherms. So no, if you heard that myth, not true. Um, another kind of interesting one, that process I described earlier where they'll take your blood out and put some kind of antifree stuff in you. It's not total pseudoscience. Uh, that's a vitrification process. This is a study and just one off study, not my field, but something I found where they uh, put some rabbit embryos through this vitrification process and others that just didn't do that, regular old embryos or the control group. So you can see, obviously, this doesn't do well for survivability. Uh, you would not opt into ventrification if you were an embryo, but it's also not zero. Um, so if we want to draw broadly from a conclusion like this, we might think, well, okay, the vitrification process is solvable. So if our body can go through that, perhaps we can be unfrosted one day. Um, and just another curiosity, uh, the human limb can actually be detached for quite a lot longer than I thought was possible. Um, the hard parts are obviously the brain, the part we want to preserve the most. So um, there's all these kind of biological things that might seem like, oh yeah, okay, we're on the right track. Perhaps science can get us to do this. Um, there's a number of things that actually can be cryopreserved. Blood, semen, tumors for some reason, human eggs, embryos, ovarian tissue, plant seeds, and the list goes on and on. Um, all these things are much less complex than the brain, but they survive the freezing process with I assume diminished results similar to the vitrification process. And then a second mention for the day of this American life. I'm not gonna go deep into this, but it covers a story and it's a worthwhile drama if you wanna check it out of this one particular effort to create a uh, actual process and a company around this. It does not go well as the title would suggest. However, one entrepreneur's failure doesn't mean the whole thing's out the window. Um, there are a couple other companies, uh, one in Russia, one in China, and two in the U.S. The most popular one in the U.S. is called Alcor. They will do a whole body preservation for 200000 or a neuro preservation where just your head at some point from the neck up, I guess, for a reduced fee of only eighty grand. I guess because they store you less. And this is real. As far as I can tell, this is not scammy stuff. People do this. There's a list of people who've signed up. This is a legitimate company. Uh, it's similar in regard to um, what I said earlier, you, you aren't getting a promise from them, you're technically donating your body to science. And I found these prices to be surprisingly low, actually. Um, not to be flippant, I certainly don't have 200 grand to just spend on a random thing, or even 80. Like I said, if they can uh, save the brain, I guess they could grow me a body. That stands to reason, I suppose. Uh, 80 sounds strikingly low. Um, 
I looked a bit into the economics of this because that actually was suspicious to me. I couldn't get a whole lot of details. One part I found was that Alcor says they put 120 of the 200,000 into an annuity. So if you don't know what an annuity is, it's a financial instrument. Imagine you had a lot of money, like a million dollars, and you just wanted to live off of that. You'd put the million dollars in an annuity and kind of live off the interest, but you also want to correct for inflation and stuff like that. So it stands to reason they could have a very well-structured financial thing set up to do all this. But uh, to my casual eye as a small business owner, I don't know, this seems actually much cheaper than seems viable for a long-term storage kind of thing. But those are the market rates. And actually, the rates get even lower. There's another company called the Cryonics Institute that boasts they can do it for 28000 and they only do full body. So very contradictory, conflicting things here. There's an FAQ on their site that gives some hand-wavy answers as to why they're cheaper. But uh, if you want to sign up for something like this, you can do it. And it's not just the billionaires of the world that get to do it if they choose. Um, so you can be frozen. Uh, whether or not you can be unfrozen is the actual important question, right? Uh, for reference, here is a list from Wikipedia of people who are or plan to cryopreserve. Um, more famous ones on the planning to, for my eyes. Uh, one of interest, if you're curious or if you're a Ted Williams fan, there's a lot of controversy around this one. It's not entirely clear that he wanted to be frozen or should have been frozen. Um, but something like this is, of course, kind of expected to be you know, rife with a fair amount of uh, controversy along those lines anyway. So getting to Walt Disney. Uh, passed away in 1966, and uh, I'm sure most have heard the rumor that his head was frozen, some say even beneath a special chamber of the Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, his daughter, if she's to be trusted, wrote in 1972 that, uh, no, that was in fact not his wishes. Walt Disney's head is with Walt Disney's body. Uh, nothing quite mysterious here, but there was an interesting connection. Just of note, uh, I ask you to remember a date earlier. We are two years out from the publication of the real start of this topic, and it stands to reason, for me anyway, that maybe uh, Walt Disney was the first rich celebrity to, in the great public eye to pass away close by, and if this was hot in the air, it would be natural for a rumor to get started. I found three independent claims of who started the rumor, um, so didn't want to summarize those here, but uh, not sure where to go with it. Um, let me go back to this list real quick. The ones I recognize are all wealthy people. You know, if you're Seth MacFarlane, $200,000 is probably a very small portion of what you leave behind and a risk you're just gambling with. I don't know that, I didn't speak to him obviously, but I don't know that uh, this is necessarily a sign of his massive support or belief in it as much as it could be a lottery ticket kind of thing. Um, And if so, what's the harm, right? Maybe the effort into this, even if it's not fruitful, will advance refrigeration science. Is this bad? I don't know that it is, but I guess here's the worst. What's the harm I could find? This is Elaine Walker, 47, who actually canceled her cell phone plan in order to cover the fees she's paying to get herself cryopreserved. Uh, I, she's an adult. That's her choice. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. So let's get into the real question. Is cryogenics, uh, sorry, I made the mistake here. This should be is cryonics pseudoscience. Can we actually freeze and recover the human body? A quick note before we get into that, connectomics is the study of you know, how the brain's wired up. And as you can see there, that's kind of one data visualization of what the brain's data, or at least data taken from an MRI, suggests about the brain. I had the opportunity to go to a neurology lab related to data skeptic, and um, they had just finished the installation of their new fancier MRI scanner. I think they went from like five Teslas to eight, some large change like that. And they were showing me the differences and the lower original model they had, the brains looked blurry to me. Uh, Obviously they got scientific value out of them. But then when I saw these new ones, the amount of structure and details that they got of this advanced equipment uh, was striking in how much more you could see. I was able to identify after after a couple of just examples they showed me of what was a severe case of Alzheimer's or not, because there was so much information in those. Uh, This is a field that's getting really advanced. We're taking very fine-grained measurements of the brain, uh, studying it, knowing things about it and its structure, though not necessarily how to put it back together or uh, how to make a copy of one or any of the things like that that might be required. Um, But this is real science. 
And what else is real science? And this is along the lines of what's really convinced me that this is somewhat implausible. Uh, this guy up here at the top is the roundworm, or this Latin name I'm not going to even try. It's uh, maybe second only to the fruit fly as the most famous sort of studied model species. Basically, we know everything about it, uh, its brain, how it works. Uh, and this scientist reports that even with all of that, there's no way to really simulate one fully. So even though we know kind of every in and out of it, they can't in a computer as of yet model it. Maybe the, and I guess the takeaway here is in short brain activity cannot be inferred from some synaptic neuroanatomy that just a, a snapshot of the brain is incomplete. So we would really need to thaw out that brain. Uh, there's no like copy process or anything like that. So you are hedging entirely on innovation that uh, has not come to pass and may not come to pass. Um, in addition to that, there are other things besides just sort of how your neurons are wired up that may have an impact on who you are. Uh, hormones, chemicals in your brain, the electrical potentials in your brain, and many other factors I found different people talking about could all be important components of the state of your system and capturing your consciousness. Um, yet cryopreservation does not capture hardly any of that other things. It captures basically your uh, brain tissue structure uh, at best. So the degree to which any of these other things impact uh, consciousness, there may not even be a possibility here. So my thought, final thoughts and observations in my you know, couple of week foray into this topic, first and foremost, it's considered really a minority position by most of the scientific community. There are a few seemingly serious um, proponents who have academic degrees and all this kind of stuff, as you'd expect in most fields. My takeaway from looking at it is that this is a little bit like Bigfoot. You know, if you aren't a biologist, if I present to you an idea like Dogman, there's lots of quick ways we can reject Dogman as a cryptozoological creature. Bigfoot is different because hypothetically it's plausible. Such a creature could exist, just happens not to. Cryonics could be possible, just happens not to today. And um, proving a negative is always tough in science. Now, we may get to the point where we say there are structures that are always destroyed uh, in the freezing process, even if you've removed all the water and you've done all these things, or there's some destructive element that cannot for sure be reversed in the future. But it's that for sure that's always a challenging hedge. Um, so, you know, I notate this about as much as like, hey, aliens could show up tomorrow, could happen. Uh, we'll have to wait and see in some regards. There are many notable public supporters, you know, Kurtzweil and people like that, um, but not a lot that I could find that were scientific thought leaders per se. Um, I'm, obviously, there's some people very focused in this field, but not, you know, they're also knee deep in the field. I didn't find a lot of people from other domains kind of pointing at this and saying like, yeah, yeah, I think that's all real. I'm going for that. Uh, it's certainly not pseudoscience. Uh, we can't rule out the possibility of freezing and unfreezing a person and for them to regain some semblance of consciousness and continuity. Yet we are so far from it today. It's not the kind of thing I think science really would debate about. You know, quantum computing is something we don't have today, but I truly believe there might be a practical quantum computer in my lifetime because I'm seeing advancements in that direction. I was unable to find any of those big milestones in this field, just kind of the hope and the dream that the future is going to figure it all out. And really, at the end of the day, that means it lacks falsifiability. If the claim is always that the problems will be solved later, uh, you have to wait till later to prove it wrong. So in the end of it, uh, I don't think I'll freeze myself. I don't know that uh, anyone who's currently frozen will one day be unfrozen. This seems like, if not pseudoscience, the kind of thousand year science scale that um, isn't really all that interesting to me to learn that much more about unless I've made some errors. So hope you guys found that informative. I certainly found it informative. <laughs> that was really interesting. I, I wanna point out that uh, Disney's daughter said that his head is attached to his body and that's they're all connected but she didn't say he wasn't frozen she just said they're connected they could he could have been not his head frozen but his whole body's frozen so you just just there telling you you know maybe well there was a wink emoji in the original text that i took out i guess yeah maybe that's what she meant uh yeah okay so um 
what I want to ask is, this is from Mono, does the process preserve the ability to generate, wait, it moved, generate and send out neurotransmitters? Um, I don't, I don't believe so. I think a cryonics proponent would tell you that um, they would have to kind of kickstart you on that process because yeah, all electrical activity is going to stop. Okay. From Steen, if Trump were frozen more than he is already, who would defrost him in any future? <laughs> I'd like to well, see a pile of, of course. <laughs> I think it'd be kind of interesting to see that. Rob Palmer asks, do you know, or if you could look when you get a chance, what the what kind of state the Wikipedia page is on these subjects? If if they're not in the greatest shape, then you know, please let him know so we can get these. They were good. Uh, no, they were good resources. I think it would uh, be a high bar to move them forward at this point. There wasn't any pseudoscience really to be said, and I sourced a lot of information from Wikipedia. Oh, that's that's amazing. I love that. I love hearing that. <laughs> Milo says if the power goes out they have to eat you <laughs> yeah you know that was something I didn't touch on enough like the the economics and the power of, uh, and preservation of this thing is what's really challenging in a lot of interesting ways like I mean you are hedging on a continuity that would be pretty unprecedented yeah Romero does mention that he says do they guarantee they'll have electricity to keep you alive what if there's a power loss I guess if it goes out it and there's no battery backup or something, that's, that's it, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if I were running such a facility, I'd have several layers of power backup and all that. But, and of course, as people were getting better at having continuity and alternate source of energy and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's uh, certainly a, when you think about the long scale you might be dealing with quite a challenge. So Janine says, thanks, Kyle, very good. I worked in plant cryopreservation it's the same it's the sample size that makes it work water can be removed and protein structure remained yeah a lot of science there for sure and i also thank you janine for the correction on the name that i covered the first couple of slides <laughs> um i'm looking at some of the others oh oh lois says there's a liquid nitrogen backup sure that could work the liquid nitrogen is really how they do the freezing process and mm -hmm. um so if you have some extra that'd be good yeah, might might not unfreeze them right away. Like if the electricity went away or something like that, there's probably some kind of time that they have to be able to, you know, I, well, who's going to complain? I mean, Listen, we're talking, we're it's talking. The future's years. problem. They're going to have to worry about that later. All these half frozen people. Oh, I heard a. Um, Oh, I don't know. I'd, I'd heard something on this and they were talking about life insurance policies that you could take your life insurance policy and have that somehow pay for it. That's right. Yeah. So um, it's common for a lot of people end up with a life insurance policy that if you've had it for a long time could have a major payout depending on, you know, a lot of complexities around that kind of stuff. But it's not surprising for a person to pass and leave a big insurance policy payout behind. And the, a lot of the way this is set up is basically like you sign up for a special thing that's for sure going to go to the company. And there's a little bit of drama there. Like apparently the family can block this and then the money can go in a different direction. So, um, you know, that's didn't feel like it was core skepticism, but I think there's some interesting family drama and stories in that area as well. <laughs> can you imagine? Oh, we're going to freeze. We're going to freeze dad and we're going to use the two hundred thousand dollars of inheritance that you were going to get yeah uh exactly. no you aren't i want that two hundred thousand dollars dad said yeah. no i mean my well maybe they could get a seance so they get somebody to say no i heard from the meat from the dead that he doesn't well, he's cold <laughs> <laughs> he's really cold so um the other thing is is that when somebody dies you have a very limited amount of time i mean they have to be dead so you have a right. very small amount of time to get them into this this uh, nitrogen, right? I mean, it's not like you yeah. can say, oh, I, I'm dead, so ship me over to some other area and they'll take care. I don't think there's that That's kind of That's right. right. You have to have people on standby. In fact, the one of the companies, I think the one in Michigan, they encourage you to die at their facility because then everyone's lovely. on staff. How yeah. lovely. Do you think they walk amongst those, those bins and talk to them? Like, you know, like, 
oh, there's Joey over there and Francis over there. Hey, Francis, you know, your, your family sent us a nice message saying, I don't know, how do you disassociate yourself from those vials? I don't know. Yeah, um, my take, so I looked for two things I didn't find. One was like interesting religious zealotry around this, but uh, it didn't seem there was a whole lot of response. There was some like stuff in like Christian magazines that they said, oh, it's fine. This doesn't conflict with uh, faith somehow. I don't know. Um, I did read one personal account where uh, a man who was an atheist was married to a woman who was a theist, and she was concerned his soul would be stuck in his body if it was frozen. She wanted the money. What are you talking about? She wasn't caring about his soul. She wanted the inheritance. <laughs> like that woman who said she's trying to, she's not got a cell phone plan or something like that so that she could pay for this. It's like, yeah, she really? gave up the cell phone plan to cover the payments. Kind of sad. That's very sad. Uh, one, one more question. I'll let this get in here. My question, I think this is from Adrian, about Trump was not just a joke. Isn't there a major political and ethical issue about whether to defrost whom and when? You know, there isn't a whole lot talked about around that. And I think it's because of the just broad implausibility of the science. I think if this was something that was more like a quantum computer, like, yes, we'll probably have one at some point, there would be more ethical thought put into it. But this is like the kind of philosophy you do is like a high freshman after your philosophy class, right? When you're stoned. Yeah. <laughs> it would, yeah, that's what you see all the time is they say, Let's freeze ourselves for the future when they have it figured out how to unfreeze us. There's never a timeline or or at what point is this, or do we think we're ready? Who's going to be the first one we're going to yeah. unfreeze? Who wants to be the volunteer for the first one to be unfrozen and, and, and make the mistakes on? Well, that I would imagine it's the one that's the most likely to be resuscitated. So you look through the details and like there's a little bit of drama about some of those people I listed who have been frozen, like one person wasn't put in fast enough, so you probably wouldn't pick him. Um, somebody had a power issue, I'm sure you wouldn't pick that person. So like who's the most likely candidate is probably how that choice would be motivated, I would assume. Yes, yeah, so whoever depends on what they died of. I mean, if it was something, I guess it was right. fixable or... I actually think so. the freezing process is the thing you want to worry more about. Oh, just the whole idea is just, wow. Anyway, <laughs> wonderful questions. I wish we could talk about this longer. Kyle will probably be around through the lunchtime if you want to For talk sure. to him. Uh, real quick, real quick, what's new on, what's next on Data Skeptic? Next on Data Skeptic, uh, I think this week we might have coming up, I'm talking to Richard Saunders about the Great Psychic Prediction oh, Project. Oh, that's a good plug. He's going to be speaking to us later today. Yeah, yeah. So I won't spoil anything, but some great stats. Yeah. So that's the uh, Data Skeptic. It's data Skeptic. Find it all you your find podcast, this. whatever oh, yeah. applications you want to find. He's got a long series of them. Some of my favorites are the ones where he speaks to his wife, Linda, because I can understand those better. <laughs> she goes... She get asked questions that makes good questions. Uh, yeah, I'll yeah. slow down and say, oh, OK, let me explain that a little bit better. <laughs> I really like that. All right. Thank you so much, Kyle, for speaking to us. Today. You always do such interesting talks. Um, we have a whole bunch of talks from Kyle on uh, the Monterey County Skeptics uh, or About Time uh, YouTube channel that this will eventually add it to. But he, he does unique talks almost every time. Thank you, Kyle. For sure. And I'm back. It's me. And next up, well, I don't have to make this next person a co-host because they're already a co-host. So next up is our very good friend, Adrian Hill. There she is from Calgary. And uh, she's going to be talking about something that is very topical. Not that the others weren't topical, but this is very current. Uh, I think it's all started since the pandemic and it's happening on TikTok. So, uh, Let's give Adrian all of our attention. I'm really looking to hear what the answer is to what's been going on on TikTok. You're muted. Thank you, Lois. You always look after me. <laughs> I'm just uh, getting everything ready here. And so that's weird. 
Oh. Okay, give me one second. Sorry about this, folks. For some reason. There we go. There we go. That's better. I have to stop this. Again. One one thousand. Well, one thousand. Yeah, yeah. See, it doesn't matter if you've practiced this a lot. Sometimes it just doesn't want to work. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> Just I need to pull up my notes and I'm good to go. Perfect. So today my topic is TikTok ticks with teens and the pandemic. That's a bit of a tongue, tongue twister. So the first thing that I, oh, I got to, here we go. First thing I want to do is since Susan wrote my bio for me, which said I was the galactic overlord of both time and space within the boundaries of Calgary, etc. I thought I should probably briefly give you an overview of what my background is. And first of all, I am not a doctor or a healthcare provider. I originally worked as a volunteer for Tourette Canada and now work as a quasi volunteer for the Tourette OCD Alberta network. And most importantly, I have three children, two who have been diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. What do I mean by a quasi volunteer? Well, I actually get paid a very small stipend for some of the work that I do. So I just wanted to clarify that. So I'm only going to be briefly talking about Tourette syndrome in this presentation, but if you want to learn more about the topic, which I highly encourage you do, please feel free to watch my talk last year for the same skeptic camp, or go to the University of Calgary website, which I have linked there, or just Google Tourette OCD Alberta Network, and there's a whole bunch of really great videos with experts talking about the disorder. And if you want teacher strategies, I have some videos up there about how to teach people in the classroom with this disorder. So first of all, we'll talk about this new global tick phenomenon that started in 2020. Uh, the Tourette Clinic at the Alberta Children's Hospital noticed a difference in the type of patient requiring treatment. The clinic saw patients with a very different presentation of ticks that were present almost exclusively in teenage girls and young women between the ages of 12 and 25. And they developed what is called a rapid onset of ticks. The patients had no previous history of ticks. Most of them didn't anyway. Uh, at least not that they were aware of. And the functional impairment was so severe, it prevented those people from attending school, going to work, and many needed hospitalization. So this is really serious. This trend has continued throughout 2021, and I'm guessing it will continue into 2022. So these ticks were not may not be or most likely are not Tourette syndrome, but are viewed as a rapid, a rapid onset tick issue called functional tick-like behaviors. And this is a subset of what would be called a functional neurological disorder, which is quite well established in the neurology community, which indicates that symptoms are incompatible with a recognized neurological or medical condition. And these types of mimicking are well known. There are cases of people showing up at emergency, for example, with seizure-like symptoms, often very similar to what is seen in a movie. But upon testing, they are found not to have seizures, which, you know, and the movie seizures tend to be a little different than what a real seizure, seizure looks like. So it's like a mimicking thing. And this is the first time, though, that ticks of such a nature have been the culprit. They have seen some tick-like behaviors develop, but not to the same extent as what we're seeing now. The ticks are referred to as functional tick-like behaviors because they are not symptoms of a neurological disorder like Tourette syndrome. Uh, in essence, functional tick-like behaviors are a problem with the nervous system, whereas a disorder like Tourette syndrome is a problem with the structure of the brain and how the neurotransmitters communicate. So, Let's now do a brief comparison between Tourette syndrome and these ra rapid onset ticks, why they consider them to be different. With Tourette syndrome, the mean age of onset is usually six, and they're usually mild ticks, and it use, they're mostly male. There's a four to one ratio of boys to girls. And they, they usually involve the head. They start up at the top of the body and often start with eye ticks, eye rolling, eye blinking, and nose ticks. And then over the months or years, they move down the body and become more complex as the person gets older. And the vocal ticks generally appear after the motor ticks have been around for a while. 
And vocal tics, I mean noises, like coughing, sneezing, and words, et cetera, versus motor tics, which are movements. During the early years, there is usually only one tick at a time, and it's not until later that they become more complex. The tics are usually very different between patients. If you look at my kids who have Tourette syndrome, their tics are totally different from each other, though sometimes they might pick up a tick from each other. It was quite rare, and they usually had their own symptoms. And there's a large variety of tics, and they wax and wane. Now, complex tics, which happen when they're older and after they've had the other tics for a while, are seen and develop over multiple years. And complex tics could be something like they have an eye rolling tic, but then they have to punch in the air following the eye rolling. It usually involves multiple muscles. So things like hopping, it's much more complicated than just a single tic. They usually involve three or four tics or two or three tics. And the tics tend to really peak at around puberty, at the start of puberty. And they usually improve in the later teens. And the most common comorbidities or co-occurring conditions, and most kids do have something that are diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. And those most common ones are ADHD and obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. And so now let's compare this with the rapid onset ticks that we've been seeing in the hospital here and around the world, actually. So the onset for these sudden onset ticks is usually between the age of 12 to 24, and they're mostly female. So I think you can see a difference right away, mostly female versus mostly male and a much later age. The, the main and, and probably the most interesting thing is how common the cases are. They're not all the same, but most of them have a lot of similarities. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And they tend to have a quick progression from simple tics to complex tics. And it's usually over just a few weeks instead of years like with Tourette syndrome. But sometimes it's even occurred within a few hours. I think you can imagine how frightening this would be for these young women and their families. It would be quite terrifying and they can usually arrive at emergency in quite a state. The vocal tics that tend to be common that these ladies are saying are things like beans, they go beans over and over, woohoo, knock, knock. And some of the sounds are the same, like whistling or making a clicking sound. And coprolalia is almost always involved. And this is, departs from Tourette syndrome. Uh, unfortunately, coprolalia tends to be what has defined it in the past because it's what Tourette syndrome is known for, but approximately 10% of people with Tourette syndrome have coprolalia versus most of the cases of these sudden onset tics show this feature. So the, the, some of the motor tics are commonly seen in the patients, are these complex tics, such as the hitting other people, could you imagine it'd be awful, objects or themselves, and large radius arm movements are also very typical. And many have been recently diagnosed with anxiety or depression versus the obsessive compulsiveness and ADHD that we tend to see in Tourette syndrome. Doesn't mean we can't have depression, et cetera, with Tourette syndrome as well, or, or vice versa with sudden onset, but it's just the most people, it is observed this way. And I think this last bit is one of the things that's really drawn attention to the media. This phenomenon has been seen simultaneously in countries across the world. It's been in Canada, the UK, Australia, Germany, and the US. So one of the findings that many of these cases had in common was that the patients had been watching social media and mostly TikTok videos of people with Tourette syndrome and that they ex experienced a worsening or triggering of tick-like behaviors after viewing. The videos on TikTok site marked with hashtag Tourette have had around 3 billion views. That's a lot of views. And there was found to be a similarity between many of the tick-like behaviors seen in the clinic and the tick-like behaviors that have been, shown, have been shown on this social network. And I'd like to just introduce you to this girl. Here is an example of somebody that is on TikTok. And her name is This Trippy Hippie. And she's a young and, in my opinion, quite a delightful English woman with Tourette syndrome. She has over 14 million followers on TikTok and hundreds of thousands on Instagram and YouTube. 
So what did the media do when they got wind of this phenomenon? Well, here's what they started saying. There was a bit of a media sensation. And this was something that it was just a very quick Google. And I found all these. Didn't take long. The doctor's favorite people is uh, TikTok causing ticks in teens, followed by the Daily Beast with doctors blame TikTok for surge in teen girls experiencing ticks. TikTok causing ticks in teens. There's that cause again. Got to blame TikTok. And the New York Post, TikTok is giving teen girls Tourette-like ticks. Doctors call it a pandemic. Now, luckily, you know, and these are already many people who think that social media is unhealthy and dangerous, and maybe it is to some degree, there's maybe parts of it, but it is so dangerous that watching videos of people with Tourette syndrome will cause this issue. Is this true? Is it that dangerous? Well, yeah, the answer is very complicated as all media related stuff is. And it's quite nicely discussed, of course, in Snopes, why we can't definitively say TikTok causes ticks. And of course, in one of my favorite publications, Science-Based Medicine, don't jump to conclusions about so-called TikTok ticks. And they, reading this article, I, they mention a German paper that was used in many papers to justify some of these sensational headings and even some blame, which really makes me angry. And here's a quote. I went to the German, this paper and it was written in English. And what it says uh, is, moreover, they can be viewed as the 21st, yes, that's not my mistake, that's theirs, century expression of a culture-bound stress reaction of our postmodern society, emphasizing the uniqueness of individuals and valuing their alleged exceptionality, thus promoting attention-seeking behaviors. And I'm going to stop there because that's the part that really gets me. It makes me very angry. The number one thing I hear from parents, teachers, and community members when they don't understand things like Tourette syndrome and ADHD and now the sudden onset tick disorder is that the person is only seeking attention. And it makes me very frustrated because it's very unfair. I, I don't know why anybody would choose these awful ticks that can be quite harmful to do purposefully. So what do we know right now? Well, it's early days for sure, and there's a lot to learn. We know that these patients are real, they're suffering, and that figuring out proper treatment plans is really important. And that means this phenomenon needs to be studied, which leads me to the next part, which there are studies that are ongoing, including at the University of Calgary, but also in the US and around the world. In fact, if you go to the website and you know somebody who has these tick disorders, you can sign up for a study right now. And people tend to imitate. For example, I think it's well known that if one person in a room yawns, then a whole bunch of people will probably yawn as well. So imitation is part of our makeup. People with Tourette syndrome have an exaggerated response to this and will tend to get new ticks through imitation. So it does make sense that someone perhaps with, without a diagnosis of Tourette syndrome would suddenly get worse if they watch videos of people with Tourette syndrome. So it's possible that their tics were very mild, for example. And the same thing could also be true for those prone to the functional tic-like behaviors. There's something about their makeup or their circumstances that makes them more susceptible to this mimicking behavior. And as I just mentioned, it is a possibility that it is undiagnosed Tourette syndrome. Uh, when kids are young, particularly, the ticks tend to be very mild and may even be hidden. If they have a foot, you know, crunching tick, you'd never see it. So it was even hard with my oldest son, who had pretty severe ticks, to get a diagnosis. So it, it can be a difficult thing to obtain. So it, it is possible that watching these videos could just make the ticks suddenly worse, and now we're noticing them. Uh, and when, it, when I go to a Tourette conference, it's interesting because people with Tourette syndrome will say it's extremely draining because being around others with ticks makes their ticks work worse. So this is probably the most looked at possibility for what's happening right now, which is this functional neurological disorder, but other possibilities should also be looked at and ruled out for treatment purposes. 
and the ang anxiety and depression diagnosis seem to be comorbid for most cases, as I already said. And I think it's exacerbated because of this pandemic. I think that's been a big contributing factor and that's why we're seeing such big differences now. So should TikTok be blamed? In my opinion, no. If it wasn't TikTok, it could have been movies or music or music videos or even meeting people with Tourette syndrome that could cause this mimicking behavior. TikTok just happens to be a popular place for these teens to go right now during a pandemic. So I think it's important to remember that piece. It just happens to be the one that's the most popular with these teenage girls. And based on data collected from the Calgary Children's Hospital, the functional tick-like behaviors or FTLB was one to 2% of referrals from, uh, every year. And from January to June, 2021, it was 30%. So you can see a big increase that happened. And it translates to approximately three patients pre the pandemic and about 87 patients in, six, in a six month period. So you can see there's a big increase. However, the numbers are still pretty small if you think about it. So if TikTok really did cause this problem, then there would be, we'd be seeing a lot more people than 87 patients. Our city in Calgary is about 1.3 million. And, you know, there's a good percentage of kids. So that's still a pretty small number. It's a huge increase from three to 87, well, three in a year to 87 in six months. But I would guess that if it was TikTok that was causing it, we'd see a lot more cases. So, What's also interesting is it's obviously a trigger for these particular women. So the, one of the first things that's recommended is that the patients stop watching TikToks about Tourette. That's part of their first line treatment, along with cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, medication for stopping tics is not seen as something that will be helpful just because of the nature of the disorder. So it doesn't mean that people, all people should stop watching these videos of people with Tourette syndrome. In fact, I like the idea of people watching some of these, most of the videos I've seen have been very informative and it brings awareness about Tourette syndrome, which is always a good thing. And I'd like to end with a quote from the Science-Based Medicine article. And just because I think it's a really important thing to take forward. So for now, let's get those studies done and try our best to ensure that all kids who are struggling right now with ticks or any other mental health symptoms are seen, heard, and helped, and not blamed for attention seeking. I'll add that one myself. Thank you for watching my TikTok TikTok. I'm sorry I couldn't resist. That's the end of my. That's priceless. <laughs> I, I, you yeah, had I, to get that. I, to I had to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love it. I love puns. I love all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's see. Uh, let's get. Uh, get yeah, you don't want that. No, I need to stop sharing. So just give me a sec because I had everything off my screen. Oh, there it moved over there. That's okay. Fine. Oh, thank you for doing that. <laughs> I actually can do it once in a while. Let me. Yeah, find... you got the power. Where in the heck am I? Okay, here I am. Let me. You want me to make myself. spotlight you? I got it. I got it. Oop. Wait, oh, where'd you go? I, I don't know. Who knows? I can add me. There we yeah. go. Okay. There you go. Sorry about that. Okay. Very good. Really interesting. I did not know. I was under the impression that, uh, that it was a phenomenon because of, you know, financial reasons, people getting attention, trying to get a huge following on, uh, mm -hmm. TikTok, which may trans transfer into, monetary things eventually maybe you know getting a show or something like that so i was under the impression because they didn't fit the demographics of mainly women there are higher age uh, age groups i was thinking they probably were making it up or or so on and i one of the comments we got um i think it was from jan let me look back here a second she says she asked about mass hysteria as a as mm. an explanation which is a real thing and yes probably yeah. what's going on with um the havana syndrome right yeah and and there there might be an element of that from what i've read if you read the snopes article it actually says it's most likely not it's most likely and i think the sbm article also says it it's most likely this 
need to imitate. You know, that's where it comes from. And the fact that there's these few videos that are have millions, if not billions of views, they're all watching the same ones. So I think that's the common link mm -hmm. versus an hysteria where you're kind of all in the same room. I mean, I guess you, I, I, I'd have to sort of look at the definition of mass hysteria as to whether that is sort of a similar thing as to being in the same room and all experiencing the same thing, but it could be. Right. But I think that the fact that these women, these young women have this depression and severe anxiety diagnosis immediately before this happens, I think that's more indicative of whether or not it's going to happen. We just mm -hmm. did actually a, a talk to a school with for a classroom with a girl who has undergone this and she's just in dire straits. She doesn't want to go to school. She's embarrassed. It's awful. She has no control over these ticks. And one of the things that actually happened was the students in the class started thinking, what if I get this? Oh, right. I, I, if she could get it, maybe I can get it but nobody else did. So I think if everybody in the classroom did develop this, I think we could now say maybe that's a bit of a mass hysteria happening. Right. If that makes sense. I know that whenever I hear your talks about Tourette's, I always start noticing the things I do more. Like you were saying <laughs> something about uh, starting at the head and working the way down and something, you know, as soon as you're doing that, I was going like, this is my nose, which is something I always do. I have a little line there. <laughs> been doing it since a child but as soon as you said that I realized I was doing it and I thought you, maybe yeah. we're also paying a little more attention to some of the things that we oh absolutely that's part of it too yeah. and that kind Definitely. of thing yeah so some of the other uh questions I had I wanted you to define the word corp corp oh corp yeah corp yeah I've had a lot more practice than you saying that one so thank you for being kind <laughs> I can't pronounce things. I, I had to practice that one for there's quite a few terms with the, in the, within the Trek community I've had to practice. But that one is just essentially obscene words. So they will shout out a swear word. I'll just say, shut up, shut up. And you're sort of in the middle of a sentence, shut up, that kind of thing. But it's usually swearing. It can be of a sexual nature. So it doesn't have to be a swear word. It could be, you know, uh, I want to have sex with you. Like that's not an uncommon. <laughs> coprolalia thing to shout at somebody which would you can imagine how embarrassing that would be and Dreamly. yeah wow. <laughs> embarrassing and uh yeah hard to believe yeah. that people would do that well or that they would for do attention it. well you would also kind of think that maybe people are trying to do it for reals I mean, yeah. you know, to, to be annoying or yeah. that's a, well, I think part that's of the problem, problem is they may see somebody that is really attractive. And they're, so they're thinking in their mind, oh, they're really attractive. And then well, they showed up. I we are talking about teens after all. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I can see them just, thinking that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that is kind of the problem is, is that we're, we're really just, we don't have enough information on it, especially as you said about this recent phenomenon. We don't have enough information. No. There's not been enough studies on it. And it does seem a little diff it, it does seem a little hard to distinguish between a teenager or a young person just messing around and and managing to keep it up long enough that it seems like yeah. it and somebody who actually has some issues. Another thing yeah. I asked is that. TikTok, and I think you kind of addressed this at the end, that you think that this is probably, all the attention has probably been a good thing. Yeah, and it depends on the headline, because the, it, some of the headlines, which I did not put in, blame the, the, the victim, right? Blame the women. And I think that's harmful. Mm -hmm. When you start saying things like, you know, they're just doing it for attention, they don't really have anything, this is not true. Uh, they're just watching these videos and think it's cool. Therefore, they're going to mimic them. That's harmful. Mm -hmm. But even those bad headlines that I did post, most of them did say that it, the, the teens have no control. So then it's not it's bad, right? Then, yeah, it's, it was just clickbait titles. That, but how many people do you know? Uh, my husband's one of these. He's listening right now, I think. Uh, he, he re he's a headline reader. And so if you just read those headlines, you would actually think TikTok was causing it mm -hmm. and that it was an attention seeking behavior. So I think that's a problem. Definitely. Um, and TikTok may have 
not only has it just become a phenomenon in the pandemic, but it also seems to be a place where it's very unprofessional, video is able to put up in a very short amount of time. It's a new following of a young crowd that's on phones and not necessarily yes. like YouTube or anything like that. Hello, the YouTube watchers. But um, <laughs> it, is, it seems to have become a safer place for people who have this and it's to be able to show, hey, I've got a tick, let me show you kind of thing, yes. you think? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And, and the phenomena is short and sweet, right? So you can flip through them very quickly and see a lot of content in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think that with the extra time at home, I think these kids are gravitating towards these and yeah. spending more time on it. Also, possibly they're just like to look at young girls. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why they have a following. Well, and it could be young girls following well, and, the girls and like for the, the, just social reasons too the, the hippie girl who's she's adorable right she's and, i haven't you, seen her I oh that you up. just saw that you're gonna have to look it up because i watched a couple of her her um videos and she's lovely and she's funny and she you can see how her friends and family just laugh at her tics and they laugh with her and they're you know oh don't worry she's got you know she, when she says something inappropriate to a weight staff you know it's oh don't worry she's got Tourette syndrome she didn't mean it <laughs> you know, her so, name is hippie girl oh I, I, the what was it what was it called the flippy hippie I had it in my, my okay so I'll have to look let me ask you this next question so you can do two things at once yeah from mono <laughs> from our friend Mono, do they react with remorse or embarrassment after an outburst? Oh, yes, often. Uh, in fact, to the point that they stop going to school, they stop leaving their house. So they are so humiliated in, in many cases. And that's where what we do comes in, where we go into classrooms, we can go into workplaces just to educate people because if people know that these outbursts are uncontrollable like a cough or a sneeze we all experience stuff like this nobody thinks about a cough or a sneeze so if they know the outburst even if it is of a sexual nature or swearing or whatever it just becomes background noise so it's so important to educate people absolutely and just like we said with Linda yeah yeah exactly yeah and you know like this the flippy hippie she's there it is the trippy hippie trippy hippie thank you yeah, I always get it wrong Thank you. The trippy hippie. Thank you, Faith. Yeah, she, she uh, point blank will turn to the people and say, I'm sorry, I have Tourette syndrome. And, you know, people may say, well, just an excuse. Hopefully they don't. But I think that's what she has to do, because otherwise she won't go anywhere. And that's what some kids do. That's what some young adults and older adults will do. Yeah. And if the more you repress it, the more stressed you are. Yeah the more the desire to get yes. this out. And so yes. stress makes it worse. So if you're yes, in a, an environment where it's background noise, like you say, then they usually are more mild. Yes, it, they tend to go down in some yeah. ways, yes. Interesting. So here, um, Karen says, do, oh, <laughs> Karen is just gotta be the <laughs> kindest person I've ever met. Okay, first question from Karen is, does it occur in one sleep? That's a really good question. I know of a few people that do have their tics in sleep. My kids, I used to go and watch them. I never witnessed tics during sleep. So it really depends on the person. I believe, and you know, again, I'm not a doctor, but I believe from everything that I've researched, most do not tick at when they sleep. However, they quite often have tick sometimes very severe ticks before they go to sleep because they're tired and being tired can make the ticks worse. So it can be an issue just getting to sleep. That's, that was more of an issue for my kids. Once they were asleep, they were fine. But I do know of some people who do tick while they sleep. Hmm. Karen, okay, here's Karen saying, do they blurt out kind things? Yes. In fact, my youngest son, he used to say, and it was a tick that was specific to me. So that's quite common. And he would look at me and go, I love you, mom. Oh, so, don't lose that tick. Don't lose that. And we were talking about that the other day. I said, you lost that tick. He goes, yeah, I know. I like that tick. <laughs> so absolutely. <laughs> love you, mom. Love you, mom. But yes, Karen, you have an absolute fantastic two questions in a row. Janine wants to know, did she asked, did you say that ticks diminish as people age? Yeah, most, most people do find that they peak 
just as they hit puberty, sort of at 12 to 14 years of old of age. And then they, as they head down their teens to their, you know, their twenties, they tend to reduce for most people. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, about a third of the people get better to have to the point even of having virtually no ticks. A third stay about the same to their pre-adolescent uh, tick frenzy, as I'll, I'll call it, and about a third get worse. So some do. I do have a friend who did get worse as an adult, and his ticks got became very severe gradually over time until into his 40s, and he's hmm. on disability now. So you know, it can be very very bad but for most people yes it diminishes with age i think i've heard you say that this is a spectrum of sorts this absolutely this is a huge yes. and a uh, huge area and you can't just define it in one way and that a lot of it is overlapped with other issues yes. like ocd and so there so it isn't always that somebody has Tourette's it would be Tourette's and this and this yes. and this anxiety um OCD, yes in, in fact adhd with my son, and I'm speaking just personally here, this is not necessarily what would happen with other people with Tourette syndrome. But what I did notice is when his tics were really bad, all his other stuff, like the obsessive compulsive issues, his severe anxiety, his sleep would get better, ironically. But when his tics went down in frequency, all the other stuff came back. And we always said, hey, bring back the tics. The tics, you know, they're kind of embarrassing. They're kind of goofy but it's the obsessive compulsive tendencies and the attention issues attention deficit and these other things that actually were much more difficult to deal with and they tend to be part of Tourette syndrome unfortunately right um we're getting a question from youtube i don't know who this is they want to know is vermont maple syrup the best in the world <laughs> i have to say quebec <laughs> <laughs> A long, long running joke, you guys. If you listen Quebec. to the Skeptic Zone, Quebec, yeah. <laughs> listen to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Uh, Richard Saunders will be in in a little bit. Um, Adrian ha is one of the um, uh, contributors. I almost said hosts for the Skeptic Zone, and she does a terrific job. She, I really do think you're going to be able to start doing voiceovers, but I don't want you to because I have other things you got to do, and that just is going to take too much of your time. So I think uh, I'd be too afraid to do that stuff. Oh, and uh, Tracy, <laughs> so it's fun. Tracy Glenn had an interesting one. I yeah. remember this too that people would say like all the oh time. Oh my the goodness! Valley girl trend yeah. is that she says is it a type of tick or is it just and like when people say um say, um um yeah or is it just spectrum. a habit we see think, it. Yeah, it's it's kind of like what I was saying before. You know, it is a spectrum. We all have the imitation parts in our brains you know, where we want to yawn and everybody else yawns, or, you know, if you touch your nose, everybody else wants to touch their nose. Same thing with these likes and ums that are repetitive in speech. We all have that. That's normal. But Tourette just has that on steroids. Like it's just out of control, that, that impulse to say things that are, that are, uh, what's the word that are misplaced mm -hmm. is the best word that I can come up with. They, they're out of context out of context words and right. like an um are, the, are out of context words right so. like, like um yeah. janine asked do ticks reappear when people age and have dementia oh that's a question i've never been asked and i don't know <gasps> janine she's been doing <laughs> these talks for years and you've got a question she's never been asked I've never i thought dun, 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 every, somebody every wins question. winner 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 <laughs> well i can i can answer one thing which is that if I mention a tick that my kids have had in the past, especially if it was a bad one that they didn't like, they will say, don't mention it, it will come back. So it could, my guess is it could, but it is only a guess. Yeah, I've heard, I, okay. So do we know if ticks occur in animals where Mara wants to know? Oh, now that is one I have been asked, but it's been a lot of years and you know how memory is not very good. So I will give you an, <laughs> From what I understand, dogs can have it. So I don't know. I can't verify that right now, but I do remember something in my brain that said that dogs can have it. And if dogs can have it, I'm guessing other animals can as well. But that is something I would have to look up. That's just based on a very long time ago memory because students used to like to ask that question. 
Yeah. Well, you would see a dog, you know, sleeping in their, they're doing this yes. leg, yeah. you know, and, and that, that isn't a chick. No, that's, that's not a chick. different. So yeah, uh, it would be something when they're awake and walking around. So. They're, they're blinking yeah. at you or swearing at you. That's or what they're doing when they're barking. Yeah. They're swearing. <laughs> at you. That's it. All dogs have Tourette. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, Karen says, <laughs> this is for the benefit of those people watching the video afterwards. She says in chat, she <laughs> where is it gosh it moves and i can't oh, they, they, they blurred out want to have sex and they smoke cigars and play poker bad dog, bad dog. That, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh. Her cap, uh tracy says i heard captive tigers will get repeated behaviors like pacing or head bobbing uh. when in captivity and jan says dogs can have ocd there we go yeah so i yeah. guess we're more alike than we thought yeah, exactly it wouldn't surprise me very interesting you know <laughs> um as I said, I've had, I've listened to uh, Adrian do a lot of these talks and threads. It's really interesting. And um, I know she's available to do talks to classrooms. If you mm -hmm. she'll zoom in, get it, zoom in. Yep. She's been doing a lot of that since the pandemic. <laughs> uh, she's very kind about how she does this. From what I understand, this is a big bullying topic and mm -hmm. um, people will, they take it personally that, um, you know, some of the things that are said, and it's a very small percentage of people, like you said, who have the, who have the tick that where they speak and swear words. Swear. They have most, yeah, yeah. most have vocal ticks. To have Tourette syndrome, you have to have the vocal and the vocal, vocal but it, yeah. the swearing thing is not necessarily the, um, no, isn't as is common, right. but in a classroom setting, and you've got somebody who's clearing their throat off and, you know, uh, making it, situations that kind of could be distracting and stuff like that. I could see yeah. definitely how that could be a problem and bullying big time. And what Adrian does, and this is from what I've heard, how she kind of does it. Like if a child in the classroom has ticks, then sometimes what she'll do is she will be asked to speak to the classroom as a whole, not to call that child out, right. but to Hi, we're going to have a talk from somebody today who's knows who's going to talk about this phenomena called, uh, you know, Tourette's and she explains it like that and she explains it to the class in general, not necessarily any way of focusing on that specific yeah. child so the child isn't embarrassed. Is that how it works? Yeah, it depends. Sometimes the child wants to be acknowledged. Sometimes they take part in the presentation. It depends mm -hmm. on what they're ready for. If it's a new diagnosis, diagnosis, very rare that they actually want to be outed, I guess is the way to mm -hmm. call it. But if they've had it for a few years, they're usually really comfortable about sharing the information and I go in and help with that. So yeah, we, we let them know what's happening and the kids are very smart. They're not going to think, you know, they're, they're, they're gonna know who we're talking about usually fairly quickly mm -hmm. i quite often hear oh it's just like such and such you know from <laughs> <laughs> declared from <laughs> and quite often, like the person who's <laughs> in this room who's always doing that yeah that will happen so the, the, i always talk with the family beforehand because just talking about the ticks as i said make them worse so usually we see an increase in symptoms for a couple of weeks after the presentation if they are in the classroom but i also want them to see the change in the mood of the classroom that usually happens, the understanding, the light bulbs that go on that go, that's why they do this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we do an empathy exercise. And I think the empathy exercise. Oh, I loved that. Oh, I love yeah. that. You yeah. guys have got to watch some of her talks. I know that you and I have done a talk and this empathy exercise is really, really amazing. It's, it's um, pretty good. Two more, two more statements. Deborah says horses do a thing called cribbing where they grab something with their teeth and suck air. Mm. Okay. And Romero <laughs> says, do people, <laughs> only Deborah would know that. Um, Romero says, do people oh. have ticks in their dreams? I've never been asked that one either. That <gasps> I remember. I, I can't two. believe it. Two, 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 two. We have two. I don't know. That was rude. I will have to yeah. ask my kids and I can get back to you whether or not they do. And that doesn't mean that everybody does or does not. But my guess is why not? Well, that makes sense. Um, one, I had a dream last night that Deborah had come to my house. It wasn't this house. It was a house I grew up in. And, and she had, I walk, walk, walked outside and, and all was set up. We had a little table with a big old 
all this food for the for the camp for today. So I was just I forgot I was going to tell people that Deborah I had a dream about Deborah having an all organized big screen TV and people were outside watching this happening right now. Of course, they were freezing for some reason because it was outside. They were in oh. Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and she had it all organized and I didn't have to do anything. So I, that was really thank you, Deborah, for doing that for me. I know it's a dream, but. <laughs> But uh, that is, oh, one of the things I wanted to mention is that um, a lot of times ticks go away in situations where people are concentrating on, yes. like your son is an amazing guitarist. Yes. And when he's playing, nothing. No ticks. And, and I've heard that true also, like people who are singing or yeah. people who are concentrating on some complex or not complex, but a task, like so, something they love to or, do. Yeah, something where they're completely absorbed in yeah, something. It takes else. concentration, and they love doing it. Are very, very two. interesting. And Deborah says you were definitely dreaming. <laughs> 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 it was clear as day. I walked out of the bedroom, and there was this, all these people outside, and there was tables and food and freezing. It was freezing, and yeah, it was my idea. Of freezing is like 40, 45. But, <laughs> people and i was walking around going hi hugging people and going oh my gosh you know who i haven't seen you in ages yeah i know it was nobody had masks on but it was my dream because that was just totally how that is but anyway thank you so much adrian this is lois just had an interesting comment about stuttering she says people don't stutter when they are singing and that's a, a similar definitely a similar type thing and actually stuttering can be a symptom of Tourette syndrome you can stutter without having Tourette syndrome, but you can have Tourette syndrome and stuttering be one of the. Yeah, system. as we said, there's there's a whole they could all be overlapped on each other. It's complex. Yeah. Seek out some help yeah. with a therapist, and yeah. you know if you guys are running into a situation where you think it would be helpful, ask Adrian. Maybe she yeah. will come and talk to your class. Look how nice she is. Isn't she? <laughs> She's well, just, and not only that, I know that the Toretto CD, the Alberta network, I know it says Alberta, but I know that they get requests for information from all over the place, all around the world. Yeah. So, so just like when we were talking about attachment therapy, the best way to help and is to spread these kind of information. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I've learned a zillion things from her, not just from this talk, but I sure learned a lot about TikTok and not having um, that my impression of what was going on was completely yes. not yeah. correct. So. I don't know. All right. So thank you, Adrian, so thank much. You. All right. So, yeah. Just, I, oh, I said that thing now. <laughs> I'm going to turn myself off. <laughs> so, all right, guys, we're midway through. We've had, I've, I've learned a lot. I've loved the talks. I think uh, this has just been really interesting. And we're going to go to lunch right now. But before I go to lunch, I'm going to mention that we do have a little donate button. If you guys would like to donate, we are a nonprofit. So we get a higher percentage of what you guys donate when you go through PayPal, um, you know, compared to just a normal organization because, or a person who's doing something like this. We are not asking for an entry fee to come to Skeptic Camp, but uh, we really would appreciate it if you would donate. It takes a lot of, obviously it's a lot of work to put these things together and to have them run as smoothly as they have with such interesting talks. I've done it a zillion times. Well, okay, not a zillion times. I've done it many times and I really enjoy doing this. And I think I would love to see more, more, um, skeptic groups do these skeptic camps throughout the uh, the year instead of just uh, the two or three that are doing these it's not that hard but if you'd like to donate um <laughs> if you'd like to donate uh we would appreciate that it goes to fund our in live in person skeptic camps which will hopefully i'm welcoming you to the first saturday of the year of 2023 in monterey which has nice mild weather come out and see us plus our stings that we do with the psychics, plus all the scholarships we want to do and the travel that we that I have to do to be able to go to speak to the smaller groups. I um, Our nonprofit helps with that as well. So um, it's an hour. Oh, wait, are we doing an hour? We're doing 30 minutes for our, for our break. If you want to, yeah, we're coming back at two o'clock with Richard Saunders. So if you'd like to come back and, and hang out with us during the lunch break, please do so. Um, if you'd like to, I'm gonna open it up to the gallery. And um, 
get yourself something to eat, come back and hang out with us. Uh, and we will start up again at two, two, two o'clock. So I'm gonna make this gallery view. And you can unmute yourself if you want, just be nice. If you're gonna do breakout rooms, we can do that as well, so. Why would, I get, why would I get something to eat? It's 4.30. I ate lunch two hours ago. I got dinner in three hours. I'm sorry, but it is 1.30 for me here. 1.33. Uh, most of us can eat any time of the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put myself on mute and I'm going to put myself on uh, video, but I'm keeping it open because uh, the recording, because we've got several speakers that are still here. And I really appreciate that if you have questions. So let's try to keep the questions. I'd like to keep talking about the subject of the of the talks we've seen earlier today. I think that would be really, really interesting. So if you guys want to do that, I think that'd be great. But I'm going to go warm up a piece of pizza and come back. I'll see you guys in a few minutes. Okay. Kyle, I want to know if you're, uh, if you're going to freeze your head. You're on mute. <laughs> yeah. I, I doubt it. That. I really don't think so. You get, you get a hold out for the consciousness transfer into an Android or AI? I don't know which I find more implausible, actually. <laughs> huh. Yeah, there, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, fiction on that subject, clearly. Oh, sure. um, I, I recently binge watched, I think it was on Amazon, <laughs> Upload, which is a, I don't know if you, anyone's seen that series. Yeah, you know, uh, the near future and you, you make a decision when you're about to die if you want to pay to be uploaded to uh, their, you know, AI heaven and and you exist there forever or until you can't pay the bill anymore. And heaven de depends, the degree of heaven depends on how much you can pay. So it's kind of like real world situation there. And the main character who dies is put into it by his rich fiance. And how long are they going to stay a thing since she's on the other he's on the other side now she's in the real world and so like you know that that's a problem so it's actually a comedy but it's, it's got you know interesting themes in that regard that sounds good what's that called upload upload yeah I'm, I'm, my watch yeah, it's quite was, fun he was murdered actually ah now spoiler right you had to go there <laughs> there's another one that's an upload that was hilarious several years ago um Max Headroom. Oh Please. yeah. You haven't seen Max Headroom. It is fantastic. I've s -s 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 seen it. <laughs> what? I've s -s -s seen it. <laughs> M -m 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 Max? Yeah. <laughs> I watched that in real time whenever that was, so many decades ago. I can't remember. Yeah, me too. That was the 80s. Wow. In the late 80s. Oh, yeah. I, I actually forgotten that that was the premise, that it was somebody whose consciousness was transferred. OK. They were afraid he was going to die and they wanted to get his consciousness before he died. But then he didn't die. Oh, oh, interesting. You guys are old. Just <laughs> throw that out there. Yeah, I was really looking forward to the, the chronics being perfected in time, but I don't think it's going to happen. Kyle just made me pretty sure of that. Yeah, I think there's a chance you might uh, speak to an artificial general intelligence, but probably not be frozen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's another current series, which ha uh, is uh, Black Mirror. And one of its episodes, San Junipero, is about this concept, too. It's for, not the chronics, the, uh, the uploading of a consciousness. It's also very well done. Uh, Black Mirror, that, I don't know if they've been making any more of those for a few years now. Yeah, a couple of years at least. That's yeah. a great series, though. I really yeah, enjoy that. Yeah. San Junipero, one of my favorite episodes on that subject. There's a, there's a similar series on, is it Amazon? And I just can't think what it's called, but it's a very similar concept of weird dystopian futures and crazy stuff. What's that called? Hmm. Anyway, they're both good. Electric oh, Dreams, is it? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I saw, I saw that, too. Uh, so I, I Philip K. Actually... Dick stories, I think. That's one of his books, yeah. I had a friend whose husband uh, had his head frozen. This must have been at least 20 years ago when uh, that cost only about $30,000. But Whoa. he died He died from a, a brain tumor, which I thought was especially <laughs> <laughs> hopeful about <laughs> cry, cryonics. 
I think maybe he'll be the last one unfrozen. So what, what do they do now, these companies that are actually doing this to prevent the cells from bursting and causing do you think, irreparable do you, damage? Do you they think do they, they, but why would they care? They're all going to be dead long before these people are, are thawed to find out they're still dead. Well, so, so, that would, so that would make it a scam, like Kyle was like leading towards. Not, I mean, if that's what they're doing, then it's if the, if the cells it, it are is, becoming it is, mush. It, it is so utter, utter, utterly implausible and preying on people's hopes of immortality that I would certainly label it a scam. <clears throat> My experience doing plants is you've got to have a small enough piece of tissue that you can remove the water without destroying the proteins, then you put in cryoprotectants to protect the rest of the proteins. If you leave water in, then as you thaw or warm the cells, uh, the cells burst just like your pipes would burst after being frozen. So how you could infuse that much cryoprotectant through very large volume of tissue before they degenerate seems very odd. And the cryoprotectants are quite uh, toxic. So we were always balancing the level of cryoprotectants to um, the toxicity of the tissues. And it was a very fine uh, balance. I preferred not to get the cryoprotectants on my hands because we use DMSO to get pretty efficient transfer through the cell membrane. So it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem very plausible. Well, I think I've got it figured out, though. Just get in the teleportation pod with a tardigrade. Much <laughs> yeah. more likely. <laughs> Much more likely. <laughs> That's a nice microphone you've got there, Craig. What is that one? That's a uh, Neumann TLM-103. Oh, sounds good. That sounds It does good. sound so nice. Yeah. It, it better. It cost a lot. <laughs> no, it, I can hear it. Absolutely. I, even over Zoom, it you can hear the quality. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're wearing a Skeptoid shirt. That's great. Seemed appropriate. <laughs> well, they need to, to, to do the cryogenics before we can travel in space because the time it takes to get to any place out, even within the solar system or outside is is so long we couldn't live that long true well on that topic eggs and sperm do freeze i'll let you draw your own conclusions <laughs> well yeah. they have to get together <laughs> robots can do it for us. Hey, robots will look after them. james p hogan has a, a, a science fiction author uh, from 70s 80s i think i think he's been he wrote a story on that principle that uh, humanity was about to have World War III, so they send off an interstellar vehicle uh, run by robots, and uh, the passengers are human. I, they were probably embryos, as opposed to he probably should have done, you know, they're conceived later, but they were embryos, and they're raised on this planet away from all societal norms and a different kind of humanity you know, erupts, which I thought was kind of an interesting story. Wow. Sounds like raised by wolves. <laughs> well, yeah, so, so, but the kicker is that the Earth doesn't destroy itself, and then they send a ship uh, generations later to try to, you know, take command of the colony that they know they sent out, and uh, since the colony wasn't, um, wasn't uh, hindered by religious and superstition and whatever, they're so far ahead of humanity that they're the ones who win. Wow. Yeah. Raised by wolves, which uh, platform is that? Just a rebar. Somebody is, somebody yeah. is talking and they don't know they're talking. I hate that. Bob, Bob. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I was listening. I'm, 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 um, what, what? Uh, I have a question. Uh, what, what uh, platform is raised by wolves on? I think that was HBO. HBO. Oh. Um, yeah, I think it was on. Amazon. I, I watched it. I can't remember Amazon. what it was on. I sort of get, every episode I watched, I thought, yeah, and then I'd watch the next one, and then I watched the next one. And Me too. The end, I thought, that I, was interesting. I kept waiting for the wolves. There were no wolves. What was this wolves? <laughs> I think I took it too literally. Well, it was uh, a, I believe it was a Christian uh, show. What? Yeah. What? Adam and Eve? 
that's why that's why said raised by wolves as in like wolves were the sheep. romans like romulus and ramus raised by wolves the computers i get i guess uh, what i understand yeah. of it. I, I just double checked it's on hbo and yeah i i eventually lost interest in the show myself but th they definitely pull in lots of uh imagery from but but humanity on earth was destroyed because of religious warfare so that's kind of weird that that was a christian thing <laughs> well obviously the wrong religion <laughs> <laughs> pascal loses be, again that could be part of it too <laughs> well, well they have sort of destroying angel in the show <laughs> oh I caught the the last part of your talk, Adrian. It's it's the morning here, and oh, um, yeah, I you was didn't on, want to get up too early. <laughs> well, no, I was on a uh, whole weekend. I, I did unexpected um, uncle duties, oh. so um, I was just sort of getting myself together. But I did see the last part of your talk, mm -hmm. and I just published the Skeptic Zone, where you read out thirty skeptical <laughs> trivia questions. That was fun. Yeah. It was hard not to laugh. <laughs> you did laugh. I kept some of it in. Oh, good. <laughs> Well, and actually, speaking of my talk, I got uh, the question, I think it was Romero who answered, asked the question about ticking in dreams. My two kids have gotten back to me and neither recall ever doing a tick while they were dreaming. So just a sample of two. <laughs> Take it for what it's worth. Oh, so there was some discussion of mass psychogenic illness, and I think the implication was you had to be in one place for that to happen, and that's certainly not the case. Okay, thank you. I wasn't yeah. sure. No, like the whole the Havana syndrome, people all over the world, you're basically told something that happened somewhere else and you start thinking about it. You know, it, it could happen in one place. Like, I think right. there was an example where people got off a bus because somebody spilled something and then everyone on the bus thought they were like uh, victims of a chemical attack. So that certainly could happen. But I, I think that the phenomenon, if it was caused by people wanting to imitate other people, uh, like we're talking about in your talk, if that was mm -hmm. the case, that would be the bandwagon effect. Right. Which is a bias. You, you just want to be like other people. You want to be like people you admire. You want to be like your friends. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. That, and I think there's more of a neurological thing that's happening with this. Mm -hmm. but at least that's what we believe at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was an interesting bandwagon effect in Ecuador that I saw. Um, it was, it became the, the belief that people could catch STDs by sitting on bus seats. Oh. And what they would do is the person would stand and guard an empty seat until it cooled down. And then they would sit there. Wow. Interesting. There was a case in somewhere around, I think, New England, several years ago, where high school girls in one high school or a few high schools uh, got dreadful syndromes. Uh, and yeah. like paralysis and they studied and studied and I think they finally concluded that it was the what do you call it hysteria or something mass, mass psychogenic illness yes. okay yeah I remember that case was written up mm -hmm. Ben Radford writes about these kinds of things yeah. a lot yeah he does and I don't know how they draw the line between right like where do you draw the line if I wonder if it's a little bit fluid with with some of that because I would assume they've considered that with these studies or, you know, but that's an assumption. And I, I think I've done so much reading and, you know, memory. I think it was mentioned in one of the, the studies. It might've been the German one actually, which has been kind of trashed by peers. One, one of the more famous cases of that that I remember Ben writing about was the whole um, flashing light syndrome that you know caused seizures of people in either South Korea or Japan? Pokemon. Maybe Taiwan, one of the Eastern Asian countries. Pokemon, uh, the Pokemon um, flashing things from the Pokemon thing. And this was like, well, not the recent Pokemon on smartphones. If you're talking about like the movie, it was a movie. No, no, she's TV talking show. about the Pokemon. Right, right, TV, TV, TV show. show. That's right. Yeah, right. the TV show. Right. And, and, and like part of the thing is, of course, like always, the media exaggerates everything. And like what's in the papers is not even true. So he got right into 500 people report to the hospital that day. But no, it was like three. You know, they, they do things like that. And the two of them had symptoms that had nothing to do with what the other person had. So 
this is the kind of thing that happens. It's amazing. And then that gets printed in the local newspapers and whatever. And then more people experience it to the point where now they have all these signs that, you know, you may not want to watch this if you're susceptible to this. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a tiny percent of the population that is, but mostly that all came about because of this nonsense. Uh, this, this would happen to a lot of people if you did that, if you flash lights at, at a certain frequency. And it puts it in their mind to do it also. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like you're in a movie and the lights are flashing and you get a headache and, you know, post hoc or ergo proctor hoc. There we go. That's, yep. Yeah. Flashing lights gave me the, the migraine. And that's what's happening with Havana syndrome, apparently. Hmm. It's like people are, are on the edge looking, you know, they're told that you're under attack by foreign enemies, by unknown weaponry, and be on the lookout for this list of 100 symptoms. And if you have anything that like on this list or anything like it, tell us because it's an attack. And duh. Yeah, and I wonder how it would fit with the this TikTok Tourette thing, because most of this came about like there were already girls that were coming to hospitals around the world before it made the news, right? So I don't know if there's been an increase. What would be interesting to see is if there's an increase yeah. after it went into the media. And I did not see anything written about that. Saw a dad joke today. <laughs> He is risen. Take a guess at what he would be. He is risen. Helium. Helium has risen. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Took you a bit to get it. He I have to unmute just for that special. Oh. Are, we, are we really going to go down the line of these sort of jokes today? I mean, honestly, I mean. Oh, I see lots of them. My, it's I'm, like the company. The company that makes yard sticks, they announced they're not making them any longer. <laughs> right. Oh, yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that was also. Uh, yep. uh, well, if Vincent is around, you'll hear jokes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you thought that was a joke? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I am. Siri a knows jokes. You can always ask Siri. She'll tell you a few jokes. Or he, <laughs> yep. depending on what you have. <coughs> oh, thanks, Karen. I like it too. My associate, Gene Mercer, always loves it when attachment therapists claim uh, about restraining kids. When I say, say, we're not doing that any longer. And uh, anymore or we're not doing that anymore and gene will always say and and they're not doing it any less either oh yeah oh <laughs> so richard you're up next i hear yes and i wonder what you're going to be talking about can you predict i may be able to maybe oh, <laughs> <Richard>. <laughs> There are so many topics um, he could talk about that it would just be incredible. You know, we were just talking about uh, Richard. I was talking to Brandy. I think she's here. I don't know if she's still here. We were talking about uh, the show that you used to do uh, with Maynard where he'd stand on you while you did the um, uh, bed of nails and he'd play trumpet while he's standing on you. Well, and... Yeah, the, the, the mystery investigators. That's this is the live, the live skeptical show we do for... Um... Mm -hmm. uh, high school students and elementary school students before in the before times when we could do live times. performances. Yeah. We were talking about it because I'm working on a project with Bertha Vasquez about sending skeptics into classrooms. And I think yeah, I've, really I've, done almost, I've done almost 20 years of. Yeah, I said yours is pretty visual. And uh, she, um, was, she was yeah. asking about young kids and, and you know, can we should we think about doing something for the younger kids and i said Oof. i said i know that richard saunders has been doing these things and and i know that you can do them for the younger kids and it's possible uh, it is the but there's, it's, it's limited because um you you the best thing you can do for young kids is tell them about fun monsters and adventures and things mm -hmm. uh then as they get older then you can then start to work on the critical thinking aspect to, to, to try and you know deliver critical thinking in this sort of level of thought to very young kids is a little bit 
um, counterproductive. You, that means you don't say they're, they're, um, they're magical creatures, but you can say people have gone out to look for them and it's really interesting to spark their curiosity. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, but, but then that's probably enough until they get a bit older and they've got the wherewithal to start to process and, and think about these things. I think that's one a, re a reason Santa Claus can be useful because when they reach a certain age and start to ask questions, you can ask questions back and kind of let yeah, them yeah. take them. So, isn't that a problem if you were to be in a schoolroom setting and and one child says is Santa Claus real? How how do you deal with that when you're in a room of other six or seven year olds? Well, it, it's never happened because that's not the level of the show. The the show is you know it really is starts with kids who who have, have reached that already. Right. Very rarely we'll get a religious question about gods, which we don't, um, because we're not an atheist group, and that's it's a little bit outside of our remit and what we do. Uh, but that's that's pretty rare. I think we had some creationist kid once. But the show is more about how your brain is fooled and how spoon bending looks to work and how you can test do scientific tests so it doesn't really go into those right. topics too much i think for young children maybe one of the great avenues is to explore is uh pareidolia audio pareidolia oh, yeah. optical illusions yep how yeah, we you have your brain how how they can see that this looks one way but it's really something else i think those are probably the best way to explain to children that there are mysteries out there that can be solved <clears throat> if you that makes up um a, that makes up quite a, a bit a nice chunk of our our show exactly what you say and i'm always um i'm always on the lookout for great examples of pareidolia here's one is this can this work i don't know you see that one? Oh, the shark the i shark. can barely see it yeah yeah, yeah. rob yeah, had the best go. today he had a church that looked like a chicken <laughs> that was great uh, so yeah, Our, Our Lady of the Holy Chicken. <laughs> it was so good. I love that picture. That was I'm like, I, Here we I, go. I, I want that. So if I turn that the sharks upside down, I don't know how well you can see that, but they look like funny smiling faces. Oh, they are faces like oh, jack yeah. guy faces. I see that. <laughs> but we we have um yeah, we I talk about that a lot, including the face on Mars, because that's mm -hmm. a, a classic. Oh, I had that one. I had I had that one too. Yeah. Did you have you guys seen the new one? with the pics from the China probe, it looked like a cube. And then you get closer to, and I'm looking at going, how does this look like a cube? But no, it's, no, it's, a it's a new one. It just was in the Washington, <laughs> Washington Post, uh, I think today, they were talking about how, was it the Washington Post? I don't know, but the QAnon people are kind of still thinking that means that there's a base on moon uh the base there's a base on the mars or something like that because of this rock or oh something. my god yesterday Don't i give came, it away susan oh i came across a show beyond majestic has anyone seen that i couldn't watch more than 15 minutes of it no so on netflix it is yeah one of the things is a woman talking about she was asked to join the space program and then they show the bases on mars and we have this secret <laughs> space project started by the nazis and it's like all of these people, most of them are like white guys in their 70s, it looks like. So they've probably been at this since the 50s, you know, just saying like it's fact, like every day, the government's controlled by aliens and we have the secret space program and Hitler had. And oh, my God, they actually showed submarines that look like, well, rockets that look like submarines, including having periscopes with the with the swastika on them flying to Mars. It's like, oh. <laughs> I, Boy, do you, but I'm Netflix a, don't care. It's just a show. If it gets hits, it's it's gonna work. It's a, it's, 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 <laughs> I, yeah, I've long it's since discovered that TV producers and people who write magazines and whatever, what, it it doesn't come into their thinking. Is this a true story? No. Is it a story which people want to see? Yes. Okay. It's All right. So, so here here's my pareidolia picks. I had a lot more in the longer. <laughs> Those are the ones that I had in in this one. So I like that one because it looks like an angel. And I originally did this presentation for religious uh, people came out of a religion. There's the famous uh, Jesus and Mary on the toast. Which one's which? <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, Jesus on the left. I thought they were both. Oh, no, I see it. Yeah, it's the see. right one. On the right. Looks like a child. Yeah. Then, and then there's the face on Mars. And yeah. as I mentioned, this was taken in 76. And then we sent the probe in 2001. And that's what it actually looks like. So not a face. 
Zip. But there's the NASA sign in the corner now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the strange thing is that's really on that. Mars. They put a giant sign on Mars. Isn't it? <laughs> well, they should do that, man. Can you they imagine should, project, yeah. product placement on that on that one thing? Oh. Hey, does anybody have the latest before I start? Does anybody have the latest on the James Webb? Because I don't know if what's been happening overnight. Where's Leonard these days? He would have that like. Oh, I've got I've got it. Do you want the latest? They, they, they've they've opened both. They've, uh, they've managed to open and unfurl both side mirrors. So now the uh, oh. assembly is complete. And oh, it's wow. Now, yeah, fully yep. deployed. Fully how, come, uh, how come they haven't had any problems? They just. Because it's a it tremendous feat of, of engineering. I mean, it's a, it's a truly amazing yeah. piece of engineering. I understand wow. that they they it took so long and cost so much because they spent so much time testing and testing and testing and getting it right, getting it right. So I'm they very didn't pleased wanna, it's gone right. They don't want to repeat the problem of Hubble. Right. Everyone remembers what happened with Hubble when they first. Well, we still don't know yep. that because they haven't. Uh, they left, once the mirror starts working, that's when that'll be the final test. Yeah, the right. yeah. mirror is uh, Hubble. Hubble, by the way, was designed to be serviced by space shuttles. So <laughs> it so if it had problems, they'd be able to get a space shuttle up there. The James yeah. Webb will not be able to be yep. serviced mm -hmm. by space shuttles. It's gotta work. Another reason, or yep. else. And by the way, this is one of my favorite pareidolias. I call this a pair of pareidolias. Oh! Wait, wait, wait. I have to zoom in on it. I can't see it. Um, uh, uh, if, 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 just look at it. What? Little, what? Little, oh, little, little, turtles. Little, little turtles reflecting on the desk. Faces. Like, Ooh, spooky. Wearing hats. That's just spooky. Coming back to the hub, uh, web, I think people may not realize that the size of the screen is the size of a tennis court. So you can mm. imagine how much it had to be folded and unfolded to become mm -hmm. what it is now. It's it's a, just an amazing thing that they did. So, th so th 20 years ago, I worked in the space program as did my sister. And my sister was on, in the department that made space deployables on our spacecraft. So that's what she did. Oh, somebody's at the door. I got it. It was Linda's puppy. I was wondering where that puppy was. Oh, it, it, I, I was. I never worked in that I team. Thought it was yeah, outside my door. Yeah. So loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're coming back. It's two o'clock. We have been on time and beyond on time. So damn good, as far as I'm concerned. I have made Richard Saunders already a co-host so that he's going to be able to show his presentation. And we're coming up to the part two of um, <clears throat> Skeptic Camp Monterey. I want to mention that uh, we have a lot more terrific talks to go through. Everything is videotaped. Everything will be in a chunk, uh, one giant chunk if you want to watch it just as if you were here originally. Hello, everybody who's watching it. Uh, you know, the background for your day, you want to spend eight hours or whatever watching this. That's great. Um, that's on the YouTube channel as is because we're recording it right now. I will also take all the videos and I will make them into little chunks and then I will put them on our YouTube channel, which is about time. You should all go to about time and subscribe to that. It's not the channel that's on YouTube right now. I couldn't get it to, anyway. So um, yeah, there's our two tortoises. So um, we had, uh, oops, there I am. So we are, this is a, this is uh, Monterey County Skeptics and the About Time Project is a nonprofit. We are not charging our door fee to attend today, but we do ask if, if, if it's, so inclines your heart to be able to help support the work that we do with um, conferences, scholarships, uh, speaking engagements to places, psychic stings, and in live person skeptic camps, and other things I can't even mention right at the moment. We do take donations and they go through our PayPal, which we get a bigger chunk of because we are a nonprofit. So with that said, I'm gonna start off with uh, our very good friend and very, um, he's been just a wonderful asset to all everybody's organization. He's just been gracious, uh, beyond gracious with his time, his a valuable space on the Skeptic Zone podcast to be able to promote other people, other works, and so on. And uh, this is our very good friend, Richard Saunders, who has the most unusual background in the world because it is devoted to 
him getting the best sound out of that amazing microphone that <laughs> he has as and it just ref, the the absorption i understand he has towels all over the place and he's like he squeezes his cats to keep them from meowing or something like i don't know something <laughs> like that something like that <laughs> but it's a um, but it's a fantastic uh, podcast. Uh, Adrian's on it. Rob Palmer's on it. I'm occasionally asked to be on it. It's phenomenal <laughs> and uh, weekly and definitely check it out. So I'm going to turn this over to Richard. Well, I was just about to say, Susan, you don't have to go anywhere. I'm not oh. going to share a screen and you well, can hang I, out with me. I'll make faces. Prepare. And I don't know if that's a good idea because I'll be like, all right. <laughs> all right, I'm going to let you have it. I, if you want me back, <laughs> I'm uh, back. I'm sure you'll be back soon towards the end of my half hour so we can take some questions and have a little chat because bye, you were bye. involved. Okay. All right. Well, hello, everybody. What a pleasure it is to be with the Monterey Skeptics. Once again, one of the last skeptic camps I attended live in person was in, um, in Monterey two years ago, when it be in the before times, in the before times. And we didn't know. I had a wonderful day. I gave a talk about general skepticism and, uh, I noticed too, I just appeared in, in the local newspaper again as a, as a member of the group. So I'm, I'm very touched about that. You know, I really feel like I'm a part of it, which, which is just fantastic. What, what happy memories. I'm gonna be talking about briefly the, the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project. And some people here joining us today were certainly a vital part of that. Now, for those of you who don't know, this was an attempt to get a good understanding as to the accuracy of so-called psychics when they make their yearly predictions about the year or the decade or, or what is to come. The object was to see how accurate the claims were for those who said they could see the future using magic or psychics or spirits or something unknown to science. Now, prophecy and prediction has been part of human society since the day dot. I mean, various religions certainly have many prophecies and predictions woven into their mythology. Uh, the book of Revelation, for example, in the Bible. And we can understand why humans with our big imaginations can, uh, as far as we know, we're the only species that have a truly reasonable understanding that there is a future and what might happen in the future, uh, thanks to our large brains. And it's hardly surprising that in early civilizations there came about people who thought they could see events that were to come. You can understand how important this would be for predicting next year's crops or would the, the crew about to launch out in the fishing boat or whatever it is have a successful catch. If they didn't, the, the, the tribe might die. Knowing the future was very important. So fast forward over the millennia, various religions, as I say, have prophecies and predictions and I think you'd agree with me that the most uh, famous popular person in modern culture going back some centuries would be Nostradamus I'm sure you've all heard about Nostradamus excuse me if I have to <coughs> pause every now and then I've just had a slight bout of bronchitis not COVID I've had five negative tests so it's not not COVID who could have predicted that Nostradamus, who was very popular in, in, in popular culture, certainly in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, then he began to peter out. And you don't hear much about Nostradamus, not like you used to when I was younger. And we can speculate as to why that is, probably because a lot of his predictions simply just didn't come true when examined, they didn't come true. And these fads, these fads come and go. But still today, his name is recognized and known and remembered as a great seer. There's still certainly a lot of people who still believe in the, uh, the prophecies of Nostradamus. If you haven't read the book, The Mask of Nostradamus by James Randi, make it your next uh, book to read. It's a terrific examination of what Nostradamus actually said, why he said it. James Randi did a, a, a wonderful job. So now let's fast forward to our recent history. And at the end of the year here in Australia, the December, January period, the Christmas break. And I'm sure it's the same wherever you're listening or seeing this uh, today. TV shows, magazines will 
certain ones will have psychics. They'll wheel in the psychic to say, what's coming up for the next 12 months? What do you see? And normally, normally it's to do with celebrities. And as we work through the 3,811 predictions that we marked in this project, the biggest such undertaking ever taken, uh, undertaken, uh, undertaking ever undertaken, we discovered that a huge bulk of predictions published in Australia in, over a 20 year period, the years 2000 to uh, 2020, were about celebrities. And that's what you normally get in magazines, on TV shows, what's happening. And we discovered that Nicole Kidman came up number one person or subject predicted about a person. The subject was celebrities, but she was the number one person predicted about. It's gossip. People who watch morning TV, chat shows, read magazines, whatever, these sort of magazines, uh, these shows are, are largely based around gossip. And gossip is a very interesting part of uh, the human makeup, psychology. It's to do with getting inside information about people. Why did gossip evolve? Why do we listen to rumors? It's to gain a little bit of in, uh, information that may benefit us, ultimately. This has turned, it's evolved into a great curiosity. What did you hear? Did you hear about Susan Gerbeck? Well, let me tell you. Suddenly, your brain is going, bing, 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 I want to hear. What, what's this? What's happening? You all know that feeling. So if a psychic could come, come along, and talk about someone that you might admire, a movie star or a TV star or something like that, a politician, and say, listen, I've got some inside information. Next year, I foresee, you can see how that, that's interesting. And of course, the TV shows and the magazines pick up on this. It's business. Now, ultimately, they don't care. It's just a five, 10 minute segment or columns in a magazine. The editor, the producers, they don't care. If it's true or not, the segment fills a gap in the show, column in, in, inches, let's move on to the next show. Don't get, don't get confused here. They're not in the business of fact. They're in the business of entertainment, and that's, that's far more important. Anyway, so we had this, I had this project in mind 20 years ago. So I began to collect how, how am I going to, what am I going to do? How, how can I judge? I know I'll collect as many predictions as I can published since the year 2000. This was years and years ago, 2010. So I began collecting. And I thought, I remember there are predictions made in magazines, New Idea, Women's Weekly, uh, Women's Day, uh, the, whatever magazines here in Australia, more or less focused for the female audience. And I thought, well, I seem to remember when I go to the doctor, there's some magazine. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find some predictions there. But it soon occurred to me that if I was going to do this properly, I would have to do it thoroughly. So I ended up going to state libraries, various state libraries here in Australia, where they have the, uh, the job of uh, archiving these magazines and so on, newspapers and whatever. So I spent many, many, many hours here in Sydney pouring through thousands of pages of these magazines, flipping through, looking for, here is the psychic column, here is the prediction from this psychic. I would catalog those and keep going. Then I spent a week in Melbourne uh, with my good friend, Dr. Steve Roberts, who is uh, one of Australia's skeptics, uh, leading UFO experts. Uh, and we spent a wonderful time. What a happy time it was going to the library there and pouring through the magazines they had. Because we'd pour through the magazines all morning, go out and have a long lunch. Mm, wow, it was so much fun. Stagger back somehow to the library and keep going. But what a, what, what a happy time that was. Anyway, so that was collecting predictions. Also, collecting predictions from online newspaper archives, very important. Collecting predictions from the psychic's own websites where the date could be verified. And this is where the Wayback Machine from uh, the Internet Archive is just such a vital tool in this work. I could go back to a psychic's webpage and look to see when they published a prediction and what it was before they changed the prediction to match what 
actually happened, which did happen occasionally. And I had thousands of interesting little points I collected from magazines, archives, newspapers, as they were published, TV and radio. I've got hours and hours and hours of psychics on TV and radio I've collected over decades, which went into this project and they're all archived. Now it's important to note that every prediction in our database, all 3,811 and counting probably, I have the original prediction also. I'd, I've got a list in the database that says, this is the prediction, do, 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 where it was predicted, who made it, uh, but I've also got the archived copy to back it up, a scan, uh, audio file, a newspaper report, something like that. So it's not, if anyone comes back and said, you just made this up, no, this is what, this is what the psychics actually said. Oh, by the way, when I use the word psychic, pretend I'm doing this. It's just a, a shortcut it's for the people who made predictions using spiritual, occult, tarot cards, astrology. They're all just collectively called psychics for the purpose of this um, report. It doesn't mean individually they all think they have a psychic power. An astrologer, for, an ex for example, reading the future in the stars may not necessarily say they're doing it with psychic powers. They think it's a science they're using. So collecting thousands of predictions, then it was, what do we do? Well, we have to see if they're right, wrong, we have to analyze them. And this is where, originally with the help of some uh, skeptics here in Australia, I spent some weekends and soon discovered that with thousands of predictions, I, th this wasn't enough. Susan Gerbeck came to the rescue in mid-2020, where she suggested, or I suggested to her, I honestly can't remember, it was a, just a, a mutually good idea, that we should try to have, a, like this, a Zoom meeting, see who would come along, and we could start working through predictions. We met every week from the middle of last year, July, June or July, June, I think, someday, Susan knows, until just before the results were published late last year, so in December, every week. So for well over a year, a year and a half, we had our regular meeting and it became our weekly get together with friends and we'd spend two hours plus, uh, and there's many people I think here watching today who are part of this, and uh, we miss it, we all miss it. It's amazing, we all miss it. Anyway, I would, we'd get together, we'd have a laugh, uh, joke about something and then we say okay here's the first prediction and I would uh, copy it from the database and put it into the chat window and we'd look at it and say well what do you think let's look and we'd have five six seven people all independently researching the historical archives where whatever we could the, the historical trends of weather what happened to this celebrity and so on and we get to a conclusion now either the prediction was correct which was normally pretty easy to find out. If somebody said, I foresee so-and-so celebrity, they're destined to have two children and they didn't, or they did, and, you know, they did, it's correct, easy. They didn't, wrong, easy. This, this is a matter of historical record. But not all predictions were that easy. Not all predictions were that easy at all. Some were very, what we called too vague along the lines of, uh, Nicole Kidman, uh, I'm paraphrasing here. Nicole Kidman, I see her having an interesting year of ups and downs. Opportunities will come her way, but sometimes she'll feel like she just has to hide from the world. It's, it, it's, it's what uh, Adrian Hill called waffle. And we had lots of waffly predictions like that. But in the end, when we decided they were waffle or too vague, or you just couldn't nail it down, they were catalogued as such too vague. The other one we had a uh, correct, wrong, too vague, we had expected. And some predictions we decided were, well, anyone could have predicted that. In other words, and a great example is someone would predict in the coming year, I foresee earthquakes in California. I kid you not, there are predictions like that in the database. Obviously, there are going to be uh, earthquakes in California. Another great one is someone would predict, I, I, I predict 
uh, several volcanic eruptions around the world this year. Now, what most people don't know is there are always volcanic eruptions around the world every year. They might not make the news, sometimes they do, but they're always happening. Or they might predict a, a trend in economy. Uh, the, the interest rates will go up or something like that. But when we looked, we could see that that was absolutely happening when they made the prediction. So it was hardly a surprise. It was marked as expected. Now, the good thing about the, the expected or maybe even the too vague and sometimes the right or wrong is there was at times quite a uh, strong debate amongst us. And I thought that was a very healthy sign. We had to reason out why we thought this prediction was ultimately expected and not necessarily wrong or correct or in any, any other category. It meant that we were just not ticking boxes. I thought that was very useful. And a very few, a tiny percent were ultimately unknown. We couldn't find out whether this prediction was true, it was wrong, what, what was really the story behind it, no matter how hard we searched. And that's okay. There was, it's only a tiny percent. Now let me <coughs> just break here from, the, from the, the flow of what I'm talking about. And I'll read something that was in the official report. And by the way, if you go to skeptics.com.au and look at the journal link or the magazine link, you can download for free the official report about this whole project. And if you listen to the Skeptic Zone podcast about three episodes ago, two episodes ago, uh, together with Adrian Hill, we read the entire official report, which goes for an hour, explaining in detail our reasoning and our conclusions and, and what, what it's all about. But here's an interesting thing that I wrote as I was putting this together, which occurred to me, it's called the flow of time and information. And in the in the the show, this is read out by Adrian Hill, who does a far better job of reading it out than I will. I promise you that. Golden tonsils, I tell you. The flow of time and information. I'd be interested later when we have, we have a brief chat what you might think about this. Modern physics knows of no way for information to go backwards in time. There might be some bizarre loophole that allows it, but there is no evidence for it. In order for an individual to have knowledge of events that are yet to happen, the information about that event would by necessity have to travel backwards in time to reach them and could only start its journey after the event or after the future event had taken place. If this were the case, the effect, the knowledge of the event yet to happen would precede the cause the event itself, contrary to the known laws of physics. If information from the future is traveling backwards in time, then why does it stop at any given point in time? That is the time when the psychic is able to access it. Does it keep on, does it keep on forever? If so, are all events in the future broadcasting backwards in time until the big bang? And I'll just stop here to say, that means things that this, this is my talk right now. Is it now traveling backwards in time? So somebody in the past could predict that I was making this talk now. If information of a future negative event, say a house fire, did travel backwards in time, causing a prediction in the form of a warning, and that warning was acted upon with the result being the fire is averted, then there was no event from which the information could be generated. What exactly would the psychic be sensing? Although such arguments can be considered as to why future events cannot be seen, it must be remembered but that for many, if not all psychics, these points are irrelevant, as they, at least in their own mind or worldview, rely on paranormal or supernatural methods which defy normal common sense and logic and remain unproven. And the note here is C. Hyman's maxim, which paraphrase goes along the lines, don't, don't try to work out how something works until you discover that it works at all, or it's, it's, it's actually happening. So that's an interesting point to ponder. These people who say, they say they're seeing future events. How is the information traveling backwards in time? To us, it doesn't make sense. To them, they can simply invoke the spirits, and that covers all bases, at least in their own mind. 
So yes, we had too vague, we had the expected. And let me get to some conclusions now, overall conclusions. There's much more to this project that's far too much to, to cram into a, a half an hour talk. I promise you that. That's why I encourage you to read the report or hear it being read to you by just going to the skepticzone.tv, scrolling down, and you can play it right off the web page. You'll see that. So after all this work, after, for me, uh, 12 years of work for the team, a year and a half of, of weekly meetings with thousands of hours racked up, the ultimate conclusion, I guess you could put it down to is, is there's no reason for us to think that the psychic powers are involved because the psychics have not met the criteria of proving that they can actually see the future. The total uh, predictions I said was 3,811. Ultimately, we discovered that the ones that we could mark as correct, yes, they predicted this and it happened, without being too obvious, like predicting earthquakes in California, was 11%, 11%. And we did a control group in 2017. We got, just, just guessing, we got a better score than 11%. The number of expected predictions in the whole project was about 15%. Too vague was 19%. 2% we, we just couldn't nail down we didn't know, we couldn't find the answer, that's only 2%. So that's the unknown. <clears throat> but wrong, flat out, wrong, wrong, wrong was 53%. But the important one to remember is the 11%. And this is entirely in line with what we would expect from just guesswork, just guessing. The, the top topic, as I said before, was celebrities. You know, more predictions made about celebrities than any other topic followed a long way back uh, was politics. Political parties, uh, our prime ministers, our various leaders, even in US politics came into it a lot. Donald Trump was mentioned quite a lot, <clears throat> as you might imagine. Sport, there was a lot of predictions about sporting events. The British royal family with a few other royals thrown in, like the Danish royal family or something like that, who get mentioned here in our newspapers because... The, the a future queen of Denmark it was actually uh, born in here in Australia. So we sort of say, great. Um, sorry, Rob Palmer. <clears throat> I can hear him <laughs> grinding his teeth at the moment. But Rob, let me come chime back in and say another big topic was natural disasters, which Rob really liked researching about cyclones and hurricanes and things like that. Uh, and terrorism was also got, got a big mention. So, again, all I can say is there's so much more to this project. It, we spent some time towards the end of the project trying to find out whether other similar projects had been made. And yes, but to a very limited degree, normally cover, covering one year and, and very localized. I think I can safely say there's been nothing of this scale ever undertaken or completed in the history of skeptical investigation with uh, close to 4,000 predictions analyzed over a, more than two decades. It's actually a 21 year period when you uh, look, look at the entirety. I can pretty confidently say that the conclusions are, are quite sound, they're quite valid. And we didn't set out, I certainly didn't set out to, to confirm my own beliefs. I set out to see what the conclusions would be. And after a, a huge effort over with many people over all these years, the conclusion which we're pretty confident and pretty secure with is that people who claim to have psychic powers to see into the future can do no better than simply guesswork and luck. And with that, I'll invite Susan back in to see if there's any questions I can possibly answer at the moment. That was and wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard. I've seen this so many times, but it's really important that we. we oh, there you are. You're, you're right above my head. Oh, now you're next to me. Hello, Susan. Adrian did the magic. And, 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 and folks, I I can't I can't tell you how important it was that Susan put together the Zoom group. If she didn't do that, the project would not have got finished because we put in thousands of hours to get this done, 
and everybody involved who I thank in the credits, but they can all, you know, really take a deep breath and know they were part of one of the biggest skeptical uh, investigations Absolutely. ever this, undertaken. This had never really been done before, you guys. This was yeah. so important to to have just, it was insane. And 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 what I did- And we, met, and we missed it. Group, and it wasn't that, it was just, it wasn't a big deal. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I did something outrageous. It's just, you just help. The thing I tell people all the time who say, hey, what can I do to help out is show up. When yeah. somebody says I need help in this, then help, you know, if you can. So we're not going to really have time for, for questions. Uh, let's see if you can get through a couple of them. Like Linda Rosa said, did you have a favorite prediction? I think, yeah, well, too many to, to, to mention, but one that stands out is somebody predicted, coming up to the presidential election, somebody predicted that Joe Biden and Donald Trump had a chance of winning. Yeah, one or the other was going to win. <laughs> one or the other would win. Uh, Rob is saying anti-gravity. Um, yes, yes. Many questions about did somebody do better than another and that kind of thing. And I'm going to suggest that they uh, look at the report, the report, which is in the chat. Yeah. But yeah. but there there were people who were a little better than others, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, depending, it's statistics. So some people had hundreds and hundreds of predictions in there. And the more we discovered, the more predictions that we could catalog from an individual, the more the score went down to 11%. So some people on paper did very well, you know, 80%, but they only had three predictions or four or five predictions. So you can't really judge. But no, I did, uh, honestly, not really. No, 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 no. I can't say that I would point to somebody and say, whoa, I think, you know, they might be onto something here. It really didn't turn out that way. Right. Uh, Eric said, do, is there been one person? Oh, oh yeah. I just asked that. I think I saw somebody say something about a statistician. I saw that somewhere. No, that was me. That was me. I asked. That was Mono. Yeah, whether you had an actual professional statistician to help design the project and analyze the results, because the statistics are very tricky things. Uh, no, uh, because I, this, I mean, it's all on the database, and the statistics we put out are just, you know, the basic statistics of of our conclusions and cataloging right, wrong, correct, etc. And the statistics of how many questions were revolved around sport, politics, and whatever. But the, the thing is, the database is there. Somebody it's still sitting it. there, and it's still ready to be harvested for all sorts of statistics, which may be a great project to look at um, maybe this year. I'm, I'm personally just putting my brain off, off this for a little while because it was so intense for so many years. I need to just stand back for a little while but you know later on we can really look at it and start really um harvesting the statistics i think um our friend kyle might even be able to offer, yeah. offer some They're advice be on the kyle's moment. uh show data yeah. skeptic here <clears throat> that's right but but at the moment mono the, the statistics published are, are just the, the the easy obvious ones to harvest from the database mm -hmm. right um Lois asked, are there going to be any other Zoom-like kind of things like this? And at the moment, Richard has said he's giving it a break. And I'm yeah. giving it a break because I there was a lot of time put in it. Not that it was really difficult or anything. But um, I think that this is a valuable resource for people to meet on Zoom on a regular basis to finish yeah. projects or put together projects that are sometimes tedious. And, and it's better to do as a group. So I've been looking at maybe doing doing something like this with uh, the Jerry Andrus project I'm working on, uh, archiving project, and there's there, there's probably lots of things. And if somebody has something that they're working on and they need help with it, uh, please contact myself or Richard. Um, and no, Rob, we're not doing the Great Canadian Psychic Prediction Project. <laughs> and absolutely not. Well, what was interesting because Kyle and other people uh, would would come in and help us for the for, for a time or two, so to get an understanding, which was like Pontus Perkman which is important. And I've just remembered that Rob Palmer, the well-known skeptic, also wrote a report about this whole process mm -hmm. as well. And Rob, I'll get you to put that into the chat. He already did. Oh, here, excellent. So there are two reports you can read about it. Mm -hmm. But honestly, folks, if you want to sit back, put on some headphones and hear the lovely melodious- It did not feel like an hour whenever you guys read it. I really enjoyed um, hearing- uh, Voice of, not me, but uh, of Adrian Hill, with her professional voice. Go golden, to this page. Golden go tonsils, to we're calling it now, I think. The golden tonsils. Go to there. 
as I said, scroll down the page a little way, three episodes back, sit back and listen to the whole report mm -hmm. and you'll get a much better understanding. All right. Thank you guys for uh, for bearing with us as long as you have. It's a long day, but I'm really enjoying myself. And I absolutely love that. Richard, you could have talked about anything. And I, I there's so many topics you could talk about that would have been interesting. But I asked him to talk about this one because it's it's so important because it's such a massive um, survey and uh, study. And he has done a lot of shows on as many, Australian TV or radio about this and um, yeah. the more we get out there the better i mean we gotta talk this kind of thing up that uh, this has been a let, let me interject that richard and i are going to uh go outside the choir uh we are going to be interviewed on the thinking atheist this coming week oh that'll be interesting so it's great to get outside of uh the normal skeptic choir anything that we can do all right, so I need to end this because we're going to go to our next speaker. But thank you again, Richard. I really appreciate you volunteering. Yeah. All the way from the other side of the world. I'm, I'm glad you're right side up. You had to fix the screen. <laughs> Otherwise, you're upside down there in Australia. We, we all can't be skeptical fairies, I tell you. We all can't just spit around the world. Uh, Michelle. All right. Thank you so much. The Coriolis effect or something. <laughs> okay, so next up, we have the amazing... Mono Sigmund, who is going to be, he's, he's uh, spoken to us before in the past about um, uh, different kinds of, there he is, uh, different kinds of uh, a phenomena or whatever historical fact. I think it was Copernicus the last time uh, he talked to us. He does have at least one, maybe two different videos on our YouTube channel. And um, today he's going to be giving an interesting talk about um, time which is always appropriate at the beginning of the year to talk about time. And so do you have slides? I don't remember if you said mono. Yes, I do. Uh, okay, and audio? No. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it to mono. He's got, he's got the comm and I will be right here listening in. All right, let's see here. Let me share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Good. All right, so thank you, Susan. I know you have trouble with pronouncing words, but I never thought you'd mess up mine. It's not Singman, it's Singham. Anyway. Uh, Let's see. So the question is why the age of the earth has oscillated wildly over time. And this is an interesting topic. And it's really a, a detailed case study that I made of this question that's in my book, uh, The Great Paradox of Science, that was published two years ago. So the short version of this story, for those of you who find it hard to listen for more than two minutes, is that the earth used to be considered really old, even possibly infinitely old. Then around the year 1650, it became really young, like thousands of years. Then around 1800, it became really old again, again, possibly infinitely old. Then in 1850, it became younger again, around hundreds of millions of years. Then around 1900, it became yet younger of the order of tens of millions of years. And around 1950, it became really, really old billions of years, except for those people who are still stuck at stage number two of thousands of years. But that's really the short version of the story that I'm going to tell you. So initially, the age of the Earth, I mean, when I say initially, I mean, long time ago, it was not really considered an important issue. And there were plausible early theories. One was an infinite age. Another was a finite age, but vast and indeterminate. But there were also ideas of uh, cycles of creation and destruction of the universe. And this can be, these can be found in Buddhist and Hindu cosmologies. For example, in Hinduism, a universe lasts about 4.3, 4 uh, uh, wait a minute, 4.3 billion years, which is considered one Brahma day. 
and it's the current universe has been 51 cycles of the current 100 year Brahma cycle and the current universe is about 156 trillion years old. So there are various uh, pe people who have calculated this. But the point is that in, in the West, the Bible and Christianity changes things because the genesis and original sin requires a single creation, not a cyclical process with a beginning uh, with the second coming of Jesus requires an end. You can't have multiple sins and falls and redemptions. You have to have just one thing. And people looked in the Bible for clues about when this might happen. And the six days of creation was taken as a metaphor for the earth lasts for 6,000 years, taking one day as equivalent to a thousand years from passages in the Psalm, in Psalms and Peter. And the creation of Adam on the sixth day was taken to imply that Jesus would come again in the last thousand years. And it is this that led to laid the foundation of what we call end times theology, the idea that the end times are near and we need to prepare for it. So this led to uh, calculations of the creation date. In 1650, Bishop Usher took the death of Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar in 562 BCE as a fixed reference point to get that the earth was created in 4004. BCE. Now it is popular to laugh at Usher and say what a dope to think that the earth was only 6,000 years old. But actually, if you look at the way he did his calculations, it was a remarkably detailed and precise calculation. You have to remember that at that time, the idea that the earth itself might provide clues as to his age was quite un uh, unthought of. People look for external sources in the literature. And so he combed through the literature, a vast amount of literature with the Bible as the main source, but various versions of the Bible to arrive at this. And after going over what he did, I, my, my um, image of Bishop Usher has improved greatly. I think he was a very careful person. And he was not the only person. Isaac Newton and uh, uh, William Lloyd and the Bishop Wooster and many others got similar results as Usher. They all uh, did similar types of calculations and they got agreement within 50 years. Uh, the reason why Usher's number became so dominant in Christian dogma is that in 1701, uh, the Bishop of Oxford, who was also the controller of Oxford University Press, annotated the Bible, had an annotated version of the Bible where he put the dates ar arrived at by Usher, including the origin date plus the date of Noah's flood and all the other events that Usher calculated, he put them into the Bible and this helped create the creation date become a dogma. So modern science, we can uh, attempts at answering the age of the earth, we can uh, mark it with Nicholas Steno and Robert Hooke, who found evidence for geological strata, but did not try to use it to estimate the age of the earth. Hooke was a scientist. Steno should be better known than he is. He was actually born a Lutheran and he had uh, started out studying biology and geology. And he did some very important work in geology and some even consider him the founder of geology. He found, for example, in his work, shell seashells on the mountaintops of, and uh, so did Hook. And they found all this evidence for geological strata. But around the age of 30, Steno, although he was born a Lutheran, converted to Roman Catholicism and became a monk and then later a priest and then a bishop and after that, the age of 30, he really stopped doing any science, which is unfortunate because he seemed to have a real uh, knack for it. But basically, they did not try to use what they found to estimate the age of the earth. Instead, scientists tried to explain how the earth's features could have arisen in such a short time of 6,000 years. And this led to what is called catastrophism theory, which was proposed by the philosopher Rene Descartes and Gottfried Leibniz. And basically they said that the major features of the earth like mountains and Grand Canyon and all these other things came because of catastrophes, massive upheavals in the earth. And for example, uh, that the seashells on the mountaintop that Steno found was caused by the Noah's flood. And the, the flood, rather than the earth having been pushed up to a mountain, uh, the great flood covered the mountains and that's how seashells ended up there. So the whole idea of catastrophism was to try and squeeze everything all the features of the earth, the major geological features of the earth into the 6,000 year window, which required dramatic changes. 
So then we started having new models of the Earth's formation. In 1755, Immanuel Kant and Pierre Laplace created what's called the nebula hypothesis of, Earth, of Earth's formation using Newtonian physics, where they said that basically the Earth and all the other planets in the sun were created by clouds of gas and dust particles that coalesced and formed these bodies. And in, so they coalesced, formed these bodies, and initially, because of the gravitational and kinetic energies of these, these bodies were very hot. And then over time, they cooled and became the cold Earth that we have now. And this model was used by uh, George Louis Leclerc, who, the, the count who's known, better known as Buffon, who used this model and estimated the age of the Earth to be 75,000 years. Now, that's vastly less than our current estimate. But it was the first, but it was important. It was crude because at that time, thermodynamics was its in, in its infancy and thermometers weren't really widely available. So he had to, to do his calculations. He had to estimate the hotness of bodies by just holding them in his hands, which of course is very crude. So he arrived at 75,000 years. And the significance of Buffon's calculation was that it was the first clean break with biblical chronology. It's, it just signified a complete break with a 6,000 year old age. And it even led to demands by the theologians at the Sorbonne that he publish an apology for contradicting the Bible. And he refused to do that. Then geology and paleontology emerge, the fields of geology and paleontology. And in 1785, James Hutton proposed the idea of uniformitarianism, which is, and he suggested the possibility of an infinitely old earth that might last forever. Uniformitarianism said that unlike catastrophism, changes occurred very, very slowly over time. And the earth was created over a long period of time. And paleontologists like George Cuvier and Jean de Baptiste Lamarck suggested that the ordering of the fossils in the earth implies that geological formation was slow. So the idea was that the simpler fossils were deeper down in the strata and the more complex fossils were higher up and that this that signified the slow change of fossils along with the uh, uh, with their being buried in the uh, ground. 1830 marked a major uh, arrival. Charles Lyell uh, argued for actualism. He said, what he said was that by observing the steady rate of change of major geological features now, you could cal actually calculate the age of the earth. For example, by looking at the rate of erosion now and extrapolating it back, you could see tell when the earth began. Similarly, with the sedimentation and the salinity in water, by looking at the rate of sedimentation now and calculating back, you could see when the sedimentation started. And he published three volumes called The Principles of Geology. The first one was in 1830, where he outlined this uh, model. And it was a very, very influential book, a series of books. So around 1850, the consensus among scientists was that the fossils and the geological, geological features required the age of the earth to be at least tens to a few hundreds of millions of years of age. And this is very important, that year is very important because this gave enough time for Darwin and Wallace's theory of unguided natural selection to work. So the Darwin and Wallace's model required slow changes in organisms to accumulate over time to provide major changes. And that clearly required a long time. And when they published in 1858, at the time that Darwin and Wallace were working, they had this large window of time of hundreds of millions of years with which to play with. So they were unhindered by time limits. But we should remember that many scientists of that time were religious people. They were, and mostly Christians in the West. And they were bothered by the Wallace, Darwin and Wallace's theory of unguided natural selection, where natural selection worked without any external supernatural agency guiding the process. So the religious scientists of that time preferred what would be called guided natural selection that would require a hidden force such as a supernatural agency to guide uh, the selection process. Just as if you are a plant breeder, you can <coughs> produce new varieties much more quickly 
than by just letting plants grow randomly and hoping that things will work out well. So guided natural selection requires less time than uh, un unguided natural selection. So Kelvin was one of those people, <coughs> Kelvin, <coughs> excuse me, he opposed the ideas of unchanging earth, indefinite age, and unguided evolution. Kelvin was a religious man. I mean, when I say religious scientists, at that time, none of them thought of a 6,000 year old earth. That they had given up. They also all believed in evolution. The key issue was between guided and unguided evolution. So what Kelvin did was introduce rigorous physics into geological studies. And he repeated Buffon's calculations more sophisticatedly. Kelvin is considered the father of the field of thermodynamics, and he could do those experiments much more precisely than Buffon could have hoped to do. So what were Kelvin's assumptions? He assumed that once the earth was formed, its interior was rigid and homogeneous, the same everywhere. He also assumed that the earth's and sun's energy originated as gravitational and mechanical energy with no other source of energy, and that made the earth into a hot molten ball that gradually solidified and cooled. The results using this model, in 1862, Kelvin arrived at 20 million years. It could only last for 20 million years. Uh, the sun, sorry, could last for only 20 million years. He said the earth could last anywhere between 20 and 400 million years. By 1868, the upper limit had been reduced to 100 million years. In 1893, Clarence King, the first director of the US Geological Survey, arrived at a figure of 24 million years for the earth. And this figure was endorsed by Kelvin. So by 1895, the physics consensus arrived at estimates of 20 to 40 million years for the age of the Earth. But this was a problem for biology geologists who said that the sedimentary record needed at least 100 million years to work, perhaps a few hundred million years. And biologists needed at least 200 million years for unguided natural selection to work. So around the turn of the 19th century, there was an impasse between what the geologists and biologists needed and what the physicists were saying. Physicists tend to be the dominant science at that time. So they tended to hold more power. Darwin was not happy with this state of affairs. And in 1880, two years before his death, he wrote what was his last words on this subject. What he said was, with respect to the time, lapse of time not having been sufficient since our planet was consolidated for the assumed amount of organic change. And this objection as urged by Lord Kelvin is probably one of the gravest as yet advanced. I can only say firstly, that we do not know at what rate species change as measured in years. And secondly, that uh, many philosophers are not yet willing, sorry, not, not yet willing to admit that we know enough of the constitution of the universe at the, and of the interior of our globe to uh, estimate accurately the age of the earth. So basically Darwin was hoping that something would change that would enable him uh, the age of the earth to become longer. And he was right. The physics consensus started to get unraveled. In 1895, physicist John Perry argued that Kelvin's assumption of a rigid homogeneous earth would not work. He said the convective flow and inhomogeneity in the earth's interior would change Kelvin's estimates upwards by as much as a factor of 100. And in 1896, Oxford biologist Edward Poulton dared to suggest at a meeting of the British Association that Kelvin might be wrong. This was very daring because Kelvin was considered almost like a scientific god. And to argue that he was wrong was very bold at that time. But as a result of this work, the age of the earth uh, was rapid. Uh, what radioactive, in 1900, radioactivity was discovered. And that gave us a new me method of determining the ages of the earth by measuring the ages of rocks. And rapidly, the ages started going up as new older and older rocks were discovered. In 1905, the age of uh, the oldest age was 145 million, 41 million years. Then it went to 1.64 billion years, then 1.9 billion years. 
then 3.35 billion years until finally in 1953, we arrived at pretty much what the figure we have now, which is 4.5 billion years. But note that before 1940, the age of the sun was still assumed to be 20 million years. So we had the odd situation before 1940, between 1900 and 1940, where the earth was thought to be older than the sun, which of course was uh, implausible. But fortunately in 1940, thermonuclear energy fusion was seen, was discovered and was seen as the energy fusion source of the sun. And the age of the sun rapidly shifted to 4.6 billion years solving that problem. But then there was an unexpected new problem. In 1915, the general theory of relativity by Einstein introduced, Einstein introduced the general theory of relativity and the static universe. In 1922, the universe changed from being thought static to be an expanding one. And 1927, we had the Big Bang Theory and the Hubble's law, which said that the velocity of the receding galaxies was proportional to the distance. This law was actually proposed by Lemaitre. So this was enabled people to calculate the age of the universe or estimate the age of the universe. And in 1929, the initial data estimated the age of the universe as 1.8 billion years. But that was a problem because at that time, the age of the earth was more than that. So we had a problem where the age of the earth seemed to be older than the universe. But that problem too went away. With the use of Einstein's general theory of relativity and uh, the Einstein general relativistic field equations describe the universe. And with the certain assumptions that the universe is currently flat, what we call is the total density of the universe is equal to its critical value. We now feel that the mass density, the density of ordinary matter in the universe is about 5%. Dark matter is about 26% and dark energy is 69%. These are the best estimates that we have for the universe as a whole now. And using those, we can actually calculate, uh, get an expression, a simple expression for the age of the universe, which is this one. Now, some may wonder whether I, it's, I should call this simple because you have this inverse hyperbolic pan function, tangent function. But what I mean by simple is that you, this age, T, depends only on two things. <laughs> the ratio of the dark energy density to the total energy density and the current value of the Hubble constant. And if you know those two numbers, you can take your iPhone out and the, its calculator feature will enable you to calculate this. And but I've done it for you. And here you get that the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years. So this is where we stand now. Finally, as of today, the age of the earth is believed to be 4.5 billion years, which is less than the age of the sun, which is 4.6 billion years, which is less than the age of the universe, which is 13.8 billion years. So we can see that, or say that all's well that ends well, Oops. At least for now, until something maybe comes along that upsets this sequence. But right now, things are good. All right. Thank you. That's my talk. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. Let me get to the... Adrian, can you pin me, please? I would appreciate that. Mana, you should know that if, if a word can be mispronounced, you know I'm going to pronounce it. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's just, there's just no way. I'm, the I more I look at it, I'm teasing you. I know, I know, I know you are. We're good friends. Uh, with, with Kyle, I had I had his name written on a darn post-it for two weeks. It's been sitting here to look at it to say it correctly. Pull itch. <laughs> as soon as as soon as we started talking and I was introducing him. <laughs> totally forgot about it but <laughs> anyway really interesting i had no idea um there's a few different comments in here gy people weren't sure what gy means and uh they explained that's giga years or giga equals a billion is that yes, not right that's right okay uh episode one of the good omens tells the tale or should i say god tells the tale about 
about this story or something like that. I, I guess Good Omens is a podcast. I haven't heard of that. No, no, no. no. Good Omens is a book uh, uh, by oh. Gaiman and became um, a limited series. A excellent. Very funny limited series. If you get a chance to see it, you should see it. Okay, fantastic. From Jay. Very, very funny. That was a discussion in the chat, not regarding what Mana was saying directly, but it was about that uh, what the age of the earth, what day was it created on? So we were having some argument about that. Yeah, we've yeah. been, do you know what yeah. day? Because we're hearing Thursday. Uh, no, no, no. All right. I found, I found the citation. Bishop Usher said it was a Sunday because, hey, that's the holy day. It had to be on Sunday. Well, I always taught, thought it was a Tuesday. Well, we didn't have days of the week like we have now, did we? So it's a moot point, right? I don't, I don't know. Okay, so one of the questions is Jay Diamond from our good friend Jay Diamond. What are the chances that the age of the earth, the sun, the universe will change going forward? What paradigm shift might cause a new change in age? It's hard to read because of the things jiggling is. No, that's a very good question. Well, that's a shock that Jay asked a very good question. I'm just kidding. No, the changes come because of changes in the theories. But as time goes on, what's happening is that more and more theories from a diverse area re, region of fields is, are getting interlocked. So now it's, you can't say in the early days of the age of the earth, you, if you used a different Bible translation, you could get a different result or you get something new. But now you have to be consistent through fields in biology and geology and paleontology and physics and so on. So you, a change in one field will take a long time to um, uh, impose a change on the other. So for example, you, if you might have some radical new theory that would change one result, but if the other theories are not able to accommodate that, that change will find it hard to be accepted. So one of the things that's interesting with science is that as theories get more and more interlocked, they get more and more difficult to change. You, you have to have multiple paradigm changes in multiple fields. So that's, the, uh, that's why things may not change so mm. easily now as they did in the past. Mm. Very, very good. Um, Eric asked, and he says, this is a little off topic, but we have a few minutes if you want to expand on it. Um, what are the current theories about what started our universe? Okay, so what started our universe, there are various theories. And as you can imagine, they're not easy to test. One is that uni the universe has gone through cycles of expansion and collapse. And that, so the, what we call the Big Bang was really the transition point between the collapse of the old university and the universe and the beginning of the new universe, the current universe. Another theory is that universes expand and then they spin off little bubbles that, that after a while the, the fabric of space time can be treated as a form and there could be a bubbles that occur that spin off into new universes. So that in that model, universes are always being created and uh, we, we could be just one of those. All these theories are kind of difficult to find experimental signatures. People, not that it, people are working on them, but those are the various theories that we have for our universe. Now, the last talk you gave is on Copernicus. That, yeah. um, and then the talk before that is uh, you'd given us when we were in the before times, as Richard Saunders keeps saying, what was the, it was on a chapter in your book, right? What was the title no, of the that, talk? I can't yeah. remember. No, that was about the book in general, why theories oh, of science are work so well, even though that's we can't right. prove them to be true. So those are two videos are on our YouTube channel. Um, Lois says, is what is the theory of multiverse? Okay, the, so the theory of the multiverse is similar to what I mentioned before, that the universe, the universe starts off as a compressed thing, then as it expands, it becomes flat, and then these bubbles form, and uh, new universes pop out. And the multiverse is one of those theories. And according to the multiverse, you could have as many as 10 to the 21 universes in existence. And this is a, uh, this multiverse theory helps answer one problem, which is that the parameters of our universe are such that the universe can exist and mm -hmm. things can happen. So the, that's called the fine tuning problem, meaning that how can it be that the parameters of our universe, like the masses of particles, the forces and so on, are tuned so exactly as to produce the universe that we have? So one answer to that is, well, we are we, that the universes, there are multiple universes, 10 to the 21, a huge number, and each of those has its own parameters. And at least 
all that is required is for one of those universes to have the required parameters for us to exist. And we happen to live in that universe. Coming back, like what you did with the predictions thing, if you make a lot, if you produce, have a large number of predictions, some of those are going to come true, right? I mean, by, by just chance. So if you have a huge number of universes, at least one might have the parameters needed for life as we know it to emerge. Right. Did, that, did that answer your question? Yeah, well, I, I, the answers, <laughs> I hope it answers the person who asked the question. So here we have another one from Eric. If we are in cycles of expansion and contraction, how long until the next crunch? <sighs> We don't know. So the point is we don't know because right now, so the question is to have a crunch, the gravitational content of the universe should be such that the current expansion will stop and come and collapse again. And that's a tricky question right now. So the idea is if the density of the universe is greater than a certain critical value, the universe will stop its expansion and, and come back and collapse. Just as if, if you throw a ball up in the air, if you throw it with a certain velocity, it will go up, reach up top and come back. Now, if the density is not sufficient, the universe will expand forever and never come to crunch again. Just like if you throw a ball up in the air fast enough, it might go out into space and you'll never get it back. Mm -hmm. So currently the best estimates of the density of the universe are that it is at the critical value. We are not sure, it's not enough to collapse it for sure. It's not enough to expand it for sure. It seems to be at that sweet spot of being flat. What, what they mean by flat is it's at the cusp of being able to collapse or expand forever. And we don't know that. So that's an interesting question too. Why is it that it's flat? Because it seems so unlikely that the density of the universe could be such that it would be exactly flat. And that's again, another one of those big unsolved questions in physics. Something to learn and more reasons for people to go into science and, and answer these big questions. Um, Rob has, a question for you. He he will ask me to ask you his opinion, your opinion on the sim hypothesis, which Neil deGrasse Tyson indicates maybe fifty percent, and Mask. I don't know who Mask is. Says ninety nine point ninety nine nine percent. Elon Elon Musk typo. Oh, Elon Musk. Musk. Oh, Mask Musk. Yeah, you know him. So the idea is that you know. And when, explain what that is. The sun hypothesis. Yeah, as, as I understand it, so. As technology advances and we are capable of producing more and more elaborate sim computer simulations, it could be that at some point we create computer simulations in which the characters in the simulations have the, think that they are actually real. The characters in the simulation develop a consciousness or have a consciousness that makes them think that they are real and not in a simulation. If that is the case, could it not be that we have reached that stage and we are the characters in that simulation? thinking that our existence is real when actually we are in a simulation of a superior. Uh, right. So, I mean, I, I, I find it interesting, but I don't know what I would do with it. I mean, okay, so if you are in a simulation, we are in a simulation. Okay, but we still live a life. It doesn't change my life in any way. Oh, come I, on now. You, no, you I live mean, differently if you found it. Well, I guess you don't, if you don't know. You, yeah, yeah, how would, how would it change anything? At least it wouldn't change anything for me. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's like, you know, it's an interesting idea, but I can't see any practical significance. If we're living under a globe in a in a hollow earth or a matrix, All on the matrix. Sort, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not gonna make any difference whatsoever. So um what I'm gonna do, since you're still gonna hang around a little bit. Is I'm going to bring us back to the gallery and then that'll give us a little bit of break if people need to go to the bathroom or whatever but I I'm hoping that you'll be able to stay and answer any questions that people have because sure. we, we start up again at 3 15 so it's only just a few minutes from now but okay. um, I think I'll throw it open to the grout and let everybody just you guys can talk science for a little bit because it's kind of cool <laughs> all right thank you so much Mono it's always okay, great by, listening the, to you. So by the way, I, uh, Jim Stubbe, the comments is makes a good point that the inflation theory uh, mm -hmm. is one of the explanations for why the universe is flat. I said it's, you know, so the question of why the universe is flat, there are theories as to why it's flat, but why inflation is one. Okay, I missed that one. All right, so let's go back over to the gallery and let's go and um, if you guys have questions for Mono, 
that would be great to talk about. And then we could, we're going to be reconvening in just like 10 minutes, 12 minutes. So have at it. First question, Mono. Are you going to make a trivia category on this subject? <laughs> oh, we've would got many you, trivia would I, would I tell you in advance, Rob, so that you can <laughs> read up? No. No. <laughs> I don't know if he sees that. But, but yes. Eric, and I apologize if this question doesn't make sense, but <clears throat> presumably, whatever the density of the universe is now, it. It, it was denser some time ago because it's expanding, right? But there's, this, there's presumably roughly the same amount of matter. Or right. is there something wrong with either of those assumptions I just made? Uh, okay, so when we talk of the density, we have to talk of three kinds of density. One is the ordinary matter. Yeah. Uh, that is protons, neutrons, electrons, the usual stuff that makes up our tables and chairs and so on. That density is definitely decreasing. Because for the same, that, that amount right. of matter is fixed, but the volume of the universe is expanding. Uh, dark matter is also a finite size. It's sort of unknown matter that has been not been directly detected as yet. And it's a whole, in a halo around galaxies. And that is also a finite size. So the density of dark matter will also decrease with that. Right. Dark energy is a different fish altogether. It's believed to be constant in the universe and as the universe expands in fact that is what's causing the universe to accelerate its expansion the dark energies are believed to be unchanged even as the universe expands so that is un unchanged well that leaves me perfectly confused so thank you <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but that, that okay so so the dark energy is a big mystery we don't really know uh, what what it's uh, what it's made of it's well we say it's energy we assume it's not matter but can, why it is the way it is why it is exactly the amount needed to make the university flat is still an unanswered question we can say okay the inflation theory says the universe should be flat but then that's assuming that the inflation theory is the correct one some years ago on star talk neil degrasse tyson had a question and answer show and the question was what is dark energy and dark matter and he said, well, I actually am sorry they ever call them that because we don't know it's energy and we don't know it's matter. They should have just called them Fred and Ethel. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's we think it's matter because we think it has mass and we think it's energy because we don't think it has rest mass. So uh, I think the word, the names are not bad ones. I mean- You think something has changed? That was probably a decade ago. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's dark. They call it dark matter because we can't directly see it. We can't detect it. Uh, and that not that people are not trying. That people are trying very hard. A couple of colleagues of mine are working very hard to detect dark matter and they're coming up unsuccessful, and which is frustrating for them, but they keep trying. And so it's dark, it's, but we, they do believe that these dark matter has mass. It's like matter, except that we haven't detected it. Dark energy, again, is like energy in the sense that there's no mass, but we also haven't detected it. So I think the labels are pretty good. Well, about uh, the naming, I heard complaints about the opposite, that people didn't like dark because it connects them as though they're siblings and they need not be, that these could be independent things. Is, would you agree, Mano? Oh yeah, I think they're independent things. I think the, the word dark is simply to show that we haven't detected them. They're, they're, hard, they're hard to detect. Like, you know, if you're in the dark, it's hard to find things. and. Yeah, so that's, I think that's the only significance I give to the word dark. I don't think it implies that they're connected in any way. So you showed the formula, which <laughs> used the amount of dark energy and dark matter to estimate the age of the universe. And that, and that kind of surprised me because I thought it was something in reverse that they had figured out the age some other way. And then they would say, okay, this is how much matter we know about and therefore it has to be this much. And so how do we know how much dark energy and dark matter there is if we haven't detected either of those things? Oh, okay, so the idea is we, we know if the universe is flat, then we know that the sum of them adds up to 100%, uh, percent, right? If the universe is, uh, sorry, if the universe is flat, we know what the total critical energy density of the universe is. 
because if the critical there's a certain number called the critical energy density if the energy actual energy of the universe is greater than that then the university is the universe is closed meaning it will collapse again if it's greater than that value it will expand forever if it's exactly that value it's called the critical density if the universe is said to be flat in the sense that overall it has no curvature but so we, we if you start out with that assumption that the universe is flat then we have a way of estimating the actual amount of uh, ordinary matter uh, by you know just the way we calculate the density of stars and matter in the universe we have ways of calculating the dark matter because we know we postulate that their mass has to be such that it explains properly the properties of galaxies like the spiral uh, velocities of the stars in the spiral arms of galaxies so we have ways of calculating uh, dark matter and then since the total adds up to 100%, we can then infer the value of the dark energy as what's left after you've taken into account the ordinary matter and dark matter, and assuming that the total adds up to 100%. So the expression for the age of the universe, if you is based on the assumption that this that the three matters add up to 100%. If that is not true, the expression for the age of the universe becomes more complicated. You know what I gave you was in that case it becomes very simple, and that's what I gave you. So that ratio of the dark energy to total energy is because we have uh, subtracted out the other two masses because we assume that they can be related to the uh, uh, dark energy ratio. Am I? Do you understand? Am I being very? Oh, sort of. I'm not getting the equation in my head enough to know that that's not circular though, regarding what the age. Okay. Is. Shall I uh, shall I put the equation up again? Yeah. Well, we're going to have to go on oh. because we're at we're at that time. I'd like to. I would love to have the conversations continue, but uh, fascinating subject. Yeah, very interesting subject. So, thank you again, Mono. Thank you for even uh, having that impromptu ten minute uh, Q and A. That's uh, kind of in a gallery view. I really appreciate that you're able to do that. You could just go on and on, and and we would just be listening, and that would be great. Um, but please don't do a trivia topic on it. I. I I, think I could handle it. <laughs> I don't think I don't think I'm really going to be able to do it. Um, oops, I was trying hitting a button I shouldn't have. Okay, so here we go. We're back with a new speaker now. Craig is a oh, you've been a Facebook friend and so on for a while, and I've known of you, and I guess you've known of me for a long time. But this is the first time you're speaking at a, a Monterey County Skeptic Camp, which is really cool. And welcome to the to the, the universe of uh, Monterey County Skeptics, which is always fun. And I love your shirt, by the way, the Skeptoid shirt that you have. Not Mark bad. Edward has that same one. Um, science is greater than pseudoscience. And it's really, really cool to see that. Um, I love it. So Craig is gonna be giving us a talk on food and how to eat uh, skeptically. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I've just been eating junk since we started this. I had a piece of leftover pizza which wasn't all that appetizing. So uh, hoping you're going to be able to give us some great information, but, and plug your book. All right, you're set. All right. Uh, is that showing up all right? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, one thing that'll probably, thanks for, for having me, by the way. One thing that'll probably change is that after this, you won't call any food junk. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start off by, oh, start off by getting the keyboard focus where it needs to be. Um, start off by letting you know that everything I'm going to tell you is good news. I have to preface it that way because it's entirely possible that at some point you may feel a little threatened or defensive. And that is not your fault. Uh, it's because some very big industries have spent millions of dollars and decades of time uh, filling our minds with misinformation. Uh, I do have the science to back all this up, but don't have the time to give you all the footnotes in this presentation. Uh, but I hope that uh, what I'll be able to accomplish here, oh, I need to move some faces so I can see my notes. How's this going to work? There we go. Uh, I hope to uh, not only help you get a little healthier today, but help you save some money. And I'm going to go really fast. First, we are so incredibly lucky. We live in a time when that's 
unprecedented in, in the history, as we know, the variably long history of the earth. Uh, our ancestors all evolved in scarcity, right? You ate what you could when you could. We get to choose what we eat. Most of the people on this call get to make that choice, and that's just an amazing thing. Uh, we have the safest food supply in history. It's amazing how good it is. And yet, why are we so stressed about our food? Everyone worries about food. We're going to learn why. But just before I tell you why, uh, I'm going to give you all the information you need about nutrition. You should enjoy a variety of foods, mostly plants, including plenty of fruits and vegetables, not too much and not too little. Anybody giving you advice more specific than that is probably selling something. Uh, an important disclaimer, listen to your doctor. If your doctor tells you something different than what I'm telling you, go with the doctor. I'm not going to, I'm not going to claim expertise I don't have. Uh, I do ask that it be a, a real doctor or a qualified practitioner. Uh, n that means not a naturopath, homeopathist, chiropractor, anybody like that. Stick with actual medicine. But yeah, if they, if they tell you something different than what I say, go with them. Uh, let's talk about what food, oh, this talk also, sorry, it, it does assume that we're talking about people with no specific food allergies or conditions that impact their diet. This is just normal baseline sort of case. All right, what the heck is food? Uh, food is just something that gives you some combination of one or more of the following seven things. You can get carbohydrates, proteins, or fats. These are known as the macronutrients because most of the nutrition you get are from these. Um, you also get hydration, which is just a fancy word for water. And then there are vitamins and minerals, which are chemicals your body needs, but which it can't synthesize itself. Uh, you either need uh, some other organism to synthesize it, or you need to get it out of the ground. And there's fiber, which is a sort of weird category because your body only sort of uses it directly. It mostly uses it indirectly, but it is something you need, and it's something that's part of food. So that's all food is. Gives you some combination of those seven things. Uh, this implies a number of interesting things. It means that there is no such thing as a superfood. There are no health foods. There are no unhealthy or junk foods. Feel better, Susan? Uh, there is just food. If it gives you some of those seven things, it's just food. So this also means that all food is healthy. Now, this is where people usually, I hear record scratch sound effects. People, what? What are you saying? Are you saying all food's the same? No, I'm not saying all food is the same. That would be silly. Uh, what I'm saying is that any food can be part of a healthy diet. And what I want you to start thinking of is in terms of your overall diet and not individual foods. Uh, you can't compare two foods and say one is healthier than another because there's no single axis metric for healthy. Uh, let me give you a hypothetical. <clears throat> Pardon me a sec. If I say, which is healthier, broccoli or Nutella? The correct answer is it depends. If you happen to be a recovering anorexic, that Nutella will probably save your life. Uh, if you're a diabetic, you should probably minimize the Nutella and have a little more broccoli, right? You just can't call one healthier than another. Uh, so there are no unhealthy foods, but there are many unhealthy diets. Here's another way to think of that. What you eat today doesn't matter. What you eat this month matters a lot. Getting, getting the idea? I want to talk big picture. Um, by the way, you are not what you eat. When you eat a hamburger, the hamburger becomes you. You don't become a hamburger. So you can, <clears throat> you can forget that old idea of you are what you eat. Myth. Um, so I promise to save you some money 
reduce your fear, let's take a look at some fear-based marketing. Uh, first, why does fear work? Because as everybody in this audience knows, it's much easier to frighten people than to educate them. That's, that's our burden as skeptics, right? <clears throat> so where do food fears and fads come from? Uh, one is just misinformation. We will talk about some sources of that misinformation in a little bit. Uh, there's also confirmation bias. We're all familiar with that. That's exactly how the MSG scare happened. Um, and then a really interesting one is the fear of modernity. This is something we're actually battling on lots of fronts as skeptics, fear of modernity. What does the fear of modernity give us? Well, it gives us myths about how things were better long ago. Things are bad today, but long ago things were better. So you get things like the Garden of Eden. You get legends like Atlantis. And you get a uh, bunch of stuff. So here are some fear-based marketing terms. These terms are only about marketing and they're just designed to invoke fear uh, to sell food. Organic, completely a marketing term. We're not talking about organic chemistry, right? Uh, natural, well, you know, there's nothing more natural than getting attacked and mauled by a bear. Uh, GMO free, clearly fear of modernity. Gluten free, unless you have celiac, this is one exception. There are some people who do need to avoid gluten. For everybody else, it's uh, just a nutritious protein. Uh, but in terms of marketing food, none of these have any scientific or nutritional basis. Uh, the fear of modernity also gets us the anti-GMO movement. Uh, it gets us the naturalistic fallacy. Again, believing that natural is somehow better. Uh, gets people worried about toxins everywhere. Uh, I think it was Neil deGrasse Tyson who said the extent to which someone uses the word toxins is usually inversely proportional to their knowledge of chemistry. Um, but there really is no such thing as a toxin. There are only doses. There's actually a safe dose for anything and, and a dangerous dose for anything. And then uh, one of my favorite symptoms of the fear of modernity is the paleo diet. Okay, this is just the poster child cartoon version of the fear of modernity. Because even if we knew what they ate, which we don't really, uh, it would be impossible to eat their diet because the food supply has evolved even more than we have and the ingredients just don't exist anymore. That doesn't, however, prevent people from uh, doing things like this. I actually shot this in my local Costco. Yes, they're selling paleo pancake mix, just like cavemen <laughs> used to cook, I guess. Uh, some people worry about pesticides uh, on their food. Well, a couple of things to know about that. One is organic food, at least in America, does use them. Uh, and they tend to be more toxic and get used more because they're not as effective. Um, if you wash your produce, the dose of pesticide you get is going to be so far below anything that could possibly harm you that it, uh, that it does, doesn't even matter. And most of the, the uh, pesticides used on our crops aren't really very toxic to people anyway. Um, a lot of people don't know that glyphosate is less toxic to people than table salt. Uh, and the reason for that is that we aren't plants. It's kind of that simple. Uh, but most of the pesticides you eat are actually produced by the food you eat. Uh, for example, cabbage produces about 46 toxins on its own. Okay, so some common sources of misinformation. A really big one is the organic food industry. Uh, we'll talk about why they see that as a key part of their plan uh, a little later. Another one, of course, is the supplement industry, that giant unregulated monster that it is. Uh, there'll be more about them in a minute. Uh, there's also the alternative medicine or wellness industry. 
Has anybody seen the word wellness attached to anything that didn't turn out to be bullshit? I'm still waiting myself. Um, except for my pasta machine, which for some reason is called a wellness pasta machine. That, but the Italians, go figure. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> and then ideological groups, we could all name a few right now, <clears throat> Q. Um, they will come up with some weird misinformation. Religions are a big one. Uh, religions tend to come up with all sorts of strange ideas about what you should and should not eat. Uh, Ayurveda turns out to be a huge one of these. Some, some really crazy ideas about food come out of that one. And then one that, when, that surprised me a lot when I was researching the book and doesn't surprise any of us anymore, Russia. Uh, the two biggest sources of funding for anti-GMO misinformation are the organic food industry and Russia. But we all know why Russia is in the misinformation game these days. A uh, couple of other sources to be aware of. Gurus. Be aware of anybody who claims they've got the way to eat, right? The ideal diet, because there is no one ideal diet. Uh, this goes especially for lone wolf doctors. Uh, extra points deducted if they appear on their website wearing smock or scrubs, worse yet with a stethoscope around their neck. Um, another way to spot misinformation online is that there's a shopping cart. Don't get your nutritional information from any place that's selling stuff. It's pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory when you think about it. Um, and never trust anybody who tries to frighten you away from a food or an ingredient. They're almost always selling something, either that or they don't know what they're talking about, or both. Uh, just get the fear completely out of your vocabulary there. Uh, so <clears throat> that means we can now relax about all of these because they're safe. Sugar, bacon, artificial sweeteners, GMOs, salt, MSG, and gluten, unless you have celiac. All nice and safe. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So what matters really is just your overall diet. Always think big picture. Don't stress over single meals or single ingredients. Remember, what you eat today doesn't really matter. Uh, some red flags to watch for on labels when you're shopping. Of course, watch out for organic. They're trying to scare you into spending more uh, natural, GMO-free, gluten-free, unless you have celiac. And the quack Miranda warning. Uh, most of you probably know the quack Miranda warning, but for your edification, it is, these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. For the most part, when you see that on a product, just don't buy it. Again, the exception is if your doctor specifically tells you to get it, there are products that you can take under medical instruction that have this warning on it. But for the most part, uh, unless you haven't been, unless you've been told by your doctor to get it, if you see that on something, just put it back on the shelf. Uh, I said we we're going to talk about supplements. Supplement industry is really a piece of work. Uh, when you buy supplements that have that warning on them, uh, you are getting an unknown dose of an untested ingredient at an unknown purity with unknown contaminants that has not been shown to work and may not even be in the bottle. Uh, they've found lot, lots of cases where it's just not even there. Um, so red flags to look for on supplement packages. If it says it boosts the immune system, that's not really a thing unless you mean vaccines. Uh, supports something. That's a claim they can get away with. Uh, clinically proven to. Now, it, uh, you don't clinically prove anything, really. Uh, and then also watch for the quack Miranda warning. Uh, okay, let's save a little money. Uh, there are no nutritional advantages to buying organic food. Uh, there just aren't. There's nothing inherently wrong with organic food. It's all fine food, uh, except for its uh, rather poor environmental impacts. 
but the food itself is okay. It just tends to be two to three times more expensive. So if you have the option to buy uh, the non-organic version, do that, save a lot of money. Uh, you don't need to buy supplements, again, unless your doctor tells you to. You don't need vitamin supplements. If you get a, enough variety in your diet, it's very unlikely you'll need a vitamin. Uh, again, your doctor may tell you to, to treat a diagnosed deficiency or condition. Uh, other than that, it, at the best, it's a waste of money that gives you expensive pee. And at the worst, uh, too much of some vitamins can actually be harmful because they do accumulate. Uh, mega doses of vitamins don't help with anything. Uh, another potential exception, though, is if you eat vegan, uh, you want to make sure you are not deficient on vitamin B12. Uh, so it's okay, okay to eat vegan, uh, but do make sure you get enough B12. You can skip buying probiotics. Uh, this is a really funny one because uh, there's, there's a lot of exciting science going on right now about our microbiome uh, in our gut. A lot of interesting things are likely to be found soon. Um, but there's currently no evidence that any probiotic supplements do anything or really that many of them survive the trip through the acid vat that is your stomach. Uh, so it's harmless if it's there. I mean, <clears throat> if you eat yogurt, you're going to get some probiotics, whether you want it or not. Harmless, but you don't need them. Uh, okay. <clears throat> on to the big thing uh, around which there's a lot of anxiety and misinformation, which is weight loss. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I'm going to tell you there are exactly two ways to lose weight. Surgery, paying someone to cut it out of you, or a sustained calorie deficit. That's, uh, that's the end of the list. Uh, so... Everything you need to know about weight loss diets is that diets don't work. I will flat out say weight loss diets don't work. Uh, that's because temporary efforts don't yield long-term results. So never go on a diet. That's diet as a verb, like don't diet, right? Uh, this means a number of interesting things. One is that there is no such thing as a fattening food. There are no weight loss foods. Nothing you can ingest burns fat. It's another thing you can watch out for in marketing. Long-term calorie balance is the entire game when it comes to weight. Uh, the diet and wellness industries, again, there's that word wellness. They mostly target women, but they're happy to take everybody's money. Uh, they're pretty predatory. Um, All weight loss products and programs are scams. You can really just treat them that way. Uh, the few weight loss drugs that might work, and it's still kind of iffy, uh, only help to maintain that calorie deficit. There's no other magic that, that they're doing. Uh, and if they're available, they're available prescription only. So there are no valid, worthwhile, over-the-counter diet drugs. Uh, you can skip those. Uh, and the people who sell these and run these programs, they know that diets don't work, and that's good for repeat business. So that's, they're not going to tell you that it doesn't work because they know you're just going to cycle through. So the way to eat is to think about variety. Uh, a fun way to gamify this is eat as many different species as you can. Just see how many you can have. Uh, if you go through the store looking at the main ingredient on things and noting what the main species is, you'll notice that it's pretty easy to get a narrow diet. But if you get plenty of veggies and fruits, you're going to get uh, more variety and vice versa. Uh, so, you know, for example, uh, potato chips and french fries, they just count as potatoes. They're both fine to have in your diet, but they don't give you variety points, right? Um, don't think about how healthy a food is. Again, you can't really measure healthy. Just think about what proportion it should play in your diet. You know, can I have a lot of this this month or should I have this as a treat every now and then? Uh, 
so the real key is to just uh, oh yeah <laughs> like i said think about the proportion of your overall diet so how should you eat enjoy a variety of foods mostly plants including plenty of fruits and veggies not too much not too little or in other words relax and enjoy your food available on amazon in paperback kindle and audible read by the author and uh thank you very much wow that was great i i do have a bunch of licorice over here that i'm not going to talk about <laughs> i i do like sweets i really do have some well uh, the problem is i'll try to eat it as a meal <laughs> Probably don't do that idea. don't do that very often i would say yeah okay yeah very good that was great and boy what a great mic you have there too that sounded really good richard okay. should have listened to that I'm, I'm glad it was worth all the money i spent on this thing yeah. that sound is, sounds really really <laughs> good I'm letting more people in the room here as we speak so we have a few questions let's see where we are here all right um let me get to the top of the list here okay this one was asked way early in the in the and you in the Q&A, so you may have answered it. It was from Glinda. She wants to know when washing your produce for pest, pesticides, is it is just water okay? Do we need some sort of cleaner? Is a, is veg, veggie wash a scam? And I did say um, wash. <laughs> veggie wash? Yeah. yeah, I mean, water is pretty much all you need. A, a really good rinse. A veggie wash won't hurt. Uh, I sometimes depending on the produce, I, I use a solution like 50-50 vinegar and water you can spray it on things. That would be more like um, uh, for, you know, strawberries and things that I want to use. That's, that's more for bacterial things than pesticides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is, is it fair to be concerned about farm worker exposure to pesticides, even if consumers don't have to worry about them? That's from Deborah. Yeah, that's totally fair. It's outside the scope of the book. Um, I'm just talking about the your relationship with your food. Uh, there are there's specialized knowledge. Like I learned fairly recently that the pesticides used on organic bananas are less toxic to the people harvesting bananas than than the regular. But that takes some specialized knowledge, uh, and I'm trying to stay really general. Yeah, the the points you made were a lot of great talking point. And how do I say? Great, the way you summarized it was just really simple. Like there is no such thing as junk. Ham, you were never a hamburger. You know, <clears throat> they were just all easy to. to I tried understand. to make the book right very down. accessible, and I think that's a yeah. really great way of starting out. I'm sure there's probably extremes and so on at the end. Uh, but at that, it's a, it sounded really easy to understand. Okay, here's from Janine. Um, I don't know if it's a question so much as organic may have a higher risk of contamination with E. coli and other bacteria because of production methods. Also uses more land for the same crop yield, so it's not good for the environment and pesticides. Is this the case, she said? Yeah, that, that's true. Organic uses about 20% more land, so it's a really serious hit. The, the world if you want the world to eat organic, you get to pick which billions you want to starve. It's kind of how it works. Oh, ooh. Yeah. Um, we're, we're trying to have a, a you were here earlier, yeah. or were you here earlier for Linda Rosa's <laughs> talk? And that was like, the movement. Mm, oh, it was, that. It was no. pretty bad. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, I, I, some organic is fine, but it does use more land. Yeah. Okay. So I think, is this from... I'm not sure who this is from. There's a name at the top and there's a name at the bottom. There are vitamins and supplements that do meet FDA standards, but they are designed for I get, patients. I think it's the people who have um, had surgery for their, you know, had their stomach reduced. I think it's- Sure. Standard. Again, if the doctor says to take it, uh, I know someone who uh, was uh, prescribed melatonin to help with their um, uh, headaches. And the doctor was able to give a brand specific recommendation is they said she said i know that the this brand has the actual dose of melatonin it says on the label right um so yeah there's there's always that if the doctor says so and i'm sure there are vitamins you would get in the hospital that it's not that vitamins are bad it's just that you don't need to go you don't need to go buy multivitamins right i know i i'm my doc my oncologist told me i all i need is a vitamin d 
and a vitamin B complex and he doesn't yeah. want to take in anything else and you do what your doctor says. Um, we only have a little bit more time. So what's the okay. skinny? I like the way they use this word skinny on diet drinks. Are they harmful in the long term? Are they a good alternative to sugar, sugary sweets if they're calorie free? Uh, they are not harmful. Uh, the only exception is if you have a very rare genetic condition, you want to avoid aspartame. Other than that, for, for the vast majority of people, they're completely harmless in the doses you're going to get and an excellent uh, alternative to sugar if you're trying to lower the, the sugar in your diet. Okay. Um, maybe fill in and just if you don't have a chance to eat something, maybe a quick drink that has a lot of that in it would probably fill a mill, I guess. It's better than not having nothing, right? Well, they're non nutritive uh, you know, diet drinks have essentially no calories or so few calories that they don't count. So all, oh. all, all you'd get from them is, is hydration and nice flavor. Okay, so here we go. As a toxicologist, biochemist, I see most of this is valid. I guess that's what you mean is most of this is what you're saying. Uh, for example, but some things are not as valid. For example, right. French fries are not equivalent to eating potatoes. This is from Reed. But I think you were right. trying to be simplifying things. Yeah, what it, it, it's a valid point. I'm not saying they're equivalent. I'm saying that if you're if you're playing the how many different species can I eat game, you don't get to count uh, French fries and uh, baked potatoes as separate species because they're mainly just potatoes. That's what I meant. Okay, and fried foods, that kind of thing. French French fries. <laughs> I love French well, fries. <laughs> I mean, it would be, and, and you also, you know, uh, uh, a hamburger and a steak wouldn't count as two different species. They're going to be one species, right? Me. It's just, uh, <laughs> it's just really thinking about what the main ingredient of the food is if you're trying to get enough variety. Oh, okay. One more. I'm going to sneak this last one in because it just snuck in here from Reed. What do you think about vitamin D for residents, residents of cloudy areas at Northern latitudes? Um, I'm not a doctor. If if you live at one of those places and your doctor tells you to supplement with vitamin D, then go ahead and do it. Um, there, there, vitamin D has become kind of a, a cult. Mm. So watch out for that. There are people pushing vitamin D and think, claiming it can do all sorts of, of crazy things. You do need it. Uh, most of us get plenty. Uh, but yeah, depending on where you live, that might be a different thing. And yes, Hawaiian pizza is just fine. Everyone enjoy the food you want. I love pineapple on my on yeah. my pepperoni pizza. Craig just said it was, I could eat that. So if anybody has a problem with it, he said, oh, yeah. that's right. You have my permission. Let me know. I have this on tape too. So uh, that's going to be yeah. really great. Um, well, thank you so much. This was really a good talk. I think I'm going to have to rewatch it again to get even more information and share this with some of my friends that are always on some sort of diet, <laughs> well, <laughs> which is kind of scary, but it is. I mean, you know, we've, we go up and down and up and down and it just doesn't seem healthy. And the way we even think about food, the way we use the words, like you said, I was saying junk and the things we say, it's just, and it's so targeted at women and we should, we should, we should end that. I mean, come on. Yeah. That's not, it's not nice. It's not nice to do that to people, but anyway, thank you so much. I really My pleasure. It. And Thanks everybody check me. out his book. All right. Fantastic. Um, sorry, taking your permissions away from me there, Craig. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> and we have a new, um, very purple person today, which is great because we need a little color at this moment in the day, because this is kind of going to be, we're getting down towards the end. We have our last two speakers are in the room, so to speak. And Allison is going to be talking about, she's, uh, Allison is a part of my, um, uh, GSOW, the Girl of Skepticism on Wikipedia Project. She's going to be explaining that to you. I'm so excited that she was able to make it today because we were kind of iffy that she thought she was going to have to be, she was going to be away. And um, she gave this talk at Skeptic Camp, uh, Skeptic Hal. So she's going to um, kind of go over it again and talk about it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what uh, Allison's got is updated for us. So Allison, you're on. It's all you, all you, all, all all the time. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. And I can see your slides. All right. Um, thank you so much. I This has been awesome today. I've caught a lot of the talks and they're really, really so interesting and diverse. And Craig, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I, mine's 
yet again, different from the previous ones. Um, I'm taking a little bit more of an angle on like politics um, and stuff like that. Um, so my name is Allison Long. I live in Western Maine. That's approximately where I am in a little teeny tiny town. Um, I used to be a high school English teacher and that doesn't seem super relevant to this group, but um, I taught research as a big chunk of what I did with my students. And my big emphasis was sources, the credibility, currency, and accuracy of your sources. Um, and they were so tired of hearing me talk about that all the time. Um, but it really has informed my interest in, in doing this work also. Um, in 2015, I left teaching to be a stay-at-home mom and most of my socialization came on the computer. So um, I was actually kind of active in a, like a statewide um, mom's group, which as you can imagine was full of claims of pseudoscience and all kinds of things. And I was recruited out of that um, because of my strong advocacy for vaccines and science and listening to your doctor um, to help on a referendum campaign, which I'll get into in more details. So that's sort of how I got into pro-vaccine activism um, and then which eventually led me to GSOW. So <clears throat> that's kind of the overview. So in spring of 2019, um, the Maine legislature passed a new law that eliminated religious and philosophical exemptions. This headline is a little bit misleading. It um, pertained to, to school, excuse me, like child, children's vaccination requirements for, for attending school. Um, and our law actually rewrote it to pertain to all schools, anybody, private, public, um, colleges and universities, any vaccination requirements for any of those things. Um, so, and this is the this is the law as it, as it is now. It talks about schools specifically. Um, so, within the ninety day window that they had um, after the law was passed, and I was not involved with getting the law through initially, which as you probably have seen around the country is quite a feat. Um, so the anti-vaxxers were livid and they collected over 79,000 signatures. In Maine, you can do a people's referendum that way. I know different states are different, um, but they did everything you know, by the book and by October, um, which was the deadline, according to the law, they had collected enough. And um, question one was born. And according to the law, it had to be on the next statewide election ballot, which was March of 2020. Um, and that coincided with the presidential primary. Um, just that became an issue later. So, um, so we were off and running and I joined right about then. Um, I did a couple different things um, on the campaign. So Maine Families for Vaccines is the group that I worked with. It's a political action committee that ran the No on One campaign statewide. Um, it's a great organization. Um, they're, they're just really, really great. Um, so the first thing I did was I was on the social media. We called it the rapid response team. Um, and we tried to keep an eye on comment sections, mostly on Facebook, which as you can imagine, it was a giant undertaking. Um, and we sort of tried to manipulate the algorithms, get our comments high up, um, boost each other's comments with conversation and things like that. Um, always sourcing, you know, always making sure that we were hitting the talking points. Um, the other thing that I did was I helped coordinate um, the statewide letters to the editor campaign portion of the campaign. Um, I helped people edit and come up with ideas. Um, and I kind of kept an eye on what got published and we had a big spreadsheet where we kept track of all that stuff. Um, and then lawn signs, everyone was on the lawn sign team. Um, I collected and distributed and also drilled some into the ground and it was March in Maine. So 
We had long um, drill bits that we drilled through the ice and snow to get them in the ground. Um, our victory was overwhelming. 74% um, of the voters rejected the veto, so wanted to keep the law eliminating the exemptions. It was very confusing. And that was a big push that we made was to help people understand why it was no and all of this stuff. Um, so it was a pretty awesome victory party and it was pretty much everyone's last social event for going on two years now. It was like the weekend before everything shut down. Um, and we became only the fourth state to eliminate religious and philosophical exemptions for kids vaccine requirements. Um, there are six states now, and you're welcome to hazard some guesses as to what they are in, in the chat if you want to. Um, I can tell you during Q and A if, if you want which ones they are. So how did I get to this group all the way from Nowhereville, Western Maine? Um, during the campaign, a lot of us joined some national Facebook groups dedicated to um, pushing back on vaccine misinformation. And so I was in Cicada and um, a bunch of us were. And Cicada is the Community Immunity Champions and Defenders Association. Um, and they kind of just pay attention around Facebook to like people who are getting harassed or misinformation stuff. And this post showed up in there, um, which says that they're, that the guerrilla skeptics are looking for volunteers to edit Wikipedia pages of anti-vax groups and personalities. And I was like, okay. Um, so right there, I, I thought it was a, a pro-vaccine effort. Um, had no idea that there was so much else going on and I've learned so much um, since then. But I emailed Susan, I was like, the post was in Cicada. And she was like, what's Cicada? And it was kind of funny, <laughs> but... Um, so I reached out to Susan um, and she just got me right in immediately and we got to work. So I'll pause here if you are um, thinking about joining us or have more questions about joining us. Um, this is one way to get a hold of, or two ways to get a hold of the team. And I'll have this again at the end of my little talk. Um, so these were, and are the draws of this team for me. And hopefully if you're listening and wondering, um, they might be draws for you as well. Um, the first one is something that Susan emphasizes a lot, which is that we're not like manipulating anything. We're not going around anything like Wikipedia's policies favor science and scientific evidence. So it's not a stretch to do this activism work on Wikipedia, which is really cool. Um, probably the biggest convincer for me, having just spent four months arguing in comment sections, was the reach of Wikipedia is so much greater than you're going to reach in, you know, a local news comment section. Um, the six, or it was at the time, the sixth most visited website in the world. Um, and so for example, this is my stat right now, as of today, the pages that I've edited for this project has over 462,000 page views. And like we say, you know, not everybody's gonna be digesting everything on the page when they click, but um, still that's way more than I was getting um, arguing with the same 10 anti-vaxxers over here in my little corner of the US. So, um, one example of one of my pages that has really been crazy was Dave Ramsey. Um, he, I don't know if you guys know who he is. It's not really worth knowing who he is, but um, he, Susan threw out that he was in the news and I knew who he was, so I snapped up the page and um, it's had 384,000 page views since I edited it just about a year ago, it looks like. Um, he gets, I mean, huge spikes whenever he's back in the news, but um, big COVID denier, big, like, I don't know why we're wearing masks kind of, kind of guy. He's really charming. Um, so that was a big one. Um, in the fall, I don't remember what day it was. It was before the last time I did, or after the last time I did this presentation, um, the team reached a hundred million views on Wikipedia, which is just so cool and so crazy. And I'm 
so humbled to have been a part of that number, even for just a year. Um, another draw of the project is just how many different ways you can contribute. Like I love to rewrite pages, but I don't always have time or like focus enough to tackle that. So if I find a good source for something that I follow, I'll stick it, I'll go make sure it's in the page. That's what we call a backwards edit. Um, I just keep an eye on my watch list, see if anybody has vandalized the Christian Northrop page lately, more on that in a little bit. Um, and then there's a whole section of people that do translation, which is so important um, and so cool because I don't even really speak that good English. Um, so there's so much, there's so many different ways that you can contribute on this team. Um, the training as a teacher, I so appreciate also. Um, this little comment from our training spreadsheet really kind of encapsulates what the training, the attitude of the training, like she's, Susan's just like, I'll kick you in the butt or whatever you need, I'll answer your question. I'll, and I, I asked a thousand million questions and she was so patient with me. And um, it was just a light, fun learning experience. Um, Wikipedia doesn't offer anything like this training. Um, I can't imagine trying to learn how to edit Wikipedia without this training. Um, everything that they offer on the site is just complicated and specific. And um, this training has really, as Susan explained to me, um, been refined by teachers and educators who've been on the team, like giving her feedback and, and making the training better. So um, it's really, really excellent. Um, and then obviously the cabal of the team. Um, I love being, making friends around the world and um, talking to people from other parts of the world because I'm in such a rural part of, of the world. Um, and it's just, they're so supportive. Um, any question that you have, big or small, um, nobody's like, nobody pretends to know everything. Like everyone, everyone has questions. Everyone learns from each other. Um, it's a great, great supportive group of people um, to be part of. And it's cool. Um, sometimes I'll see something in the news and I'll say, oh, I hope their Wikipedia page is you know, up to snuff and I don't have time to look at it. So I'll post it to the team and somebody will be like, oh yeah, I can do that or I'll check that out. Um, it's truly a team effort. Um, so some things that the team is not, um, it's definitely not lonely as I um, explained just a little bit ago. Um, it's also not something that requires prior knowledge. So I had never even clicked off of the regular article page on Wikipedia before. Um, so you, you'll get everything in training in a very logical way that builds on itself. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, and then it does take a little while to kind of get your groove and know what your projects are gonna be. Um, so it's not something overnight, but um, it's definitely self-paced, which is excellent. Um, all right, so here's a little bit of what I've done um, in the last year. I'm right about at my year anniversary, a little past it um, of getting on this team. So my interests are local politicians, um, pro and anti-science, um, pro-science, candidates, so kind of building up people who are maybe going to replace the anti-vaxxers in the state legislature. Um, and then we have a global anti-vax figure um, right here in Maine, and I will talk about her a little bit more, but um, I keep an eye on those pages. I also do a lot of racial justice work, so I like to write about Black scientists and activists, and then I've done a couple pages for um, racial justice organizations and movements. Um, here's a couple of the pages I've done. Um, okay, quarantine is a um, COVID-19 South Korean strategy. It's really interesting. Um, Linda Mead Tolan is a black scientist. Um, Stacey Brenner is a local senator in Maine who's very pro-science. And then Dave Thomas, um, I think was a member of this group or knows people in this group. Um, and I, re I rewrote his page also. Um, this is one thing that I try to do. I will, um, if I see a meme on an anti-vax, in an anti-vax area, um, I kind of check it out and make sure that there's the right information. So I saw this 
meme about Julie Gerberding and um, I went and rewrote her page. She's so fascinating. She's had so many different experiences, amazing scientist. Um, and she's had quite a few page views since I um, did that. So that, that was really interesting. Um, all right, so Adrian, I'm gonna talk about you a little bit here. Um, <laughs> so this is Christian Northrup. I don't know if anybody else um, has the pleasure, but she is one of the so-called disinformation dozen. She disseminates repulsive amounts of anti-vaccine information, all, among other things, all over the world. She has a huge following. Um, and I was kind of keeping an eye, she didn't have a page. And um, we kind of got around, there was enough coverage and Adrian said, all right, I'll tackle this page. And one of my proudest moments um, in my work so far was when Christian Northrup herself in one of her nightly um, great awakening video addresses to all of her like minions, um, she was really irritated that she had it with a PD page with all these lies on it. Um, and I was like, this is pinnacle, this is great. Um, one of my favorite things to do is make her life miserable, which is probably terrible, but, um, and I'll tell a quick story about that. I think I have time. Um, so in April of 2020, now pause for a minute and think about what the world was going through in April of 2020. Um, Maine Women's Magazine put her on the cover of their April issue. And it was a fluff interview, totally nothing about her insane anti-vaccine, anti-COVID as a hoax um, ideas. So my campaign friends and I, who keep a close eye on her, she was very involved with the um, referendum campaign and wanting to eliminate the new law. Um, we got a hold of all the advertisers for Maine Women's Magazine and let them know about what her deal was. And Coffee by Design, which is an awesome coffee company in Portland, um, Portland, Maine, um, they pulled all their ads and they made a public statement as to why they pulled all their ads. And um, it created this big kerfuffle and the editor came after us and it was, it was pretty awesome. Um, they didn't take back the issue or apologize or anything like that, but um, she definitely, I mean, she knew it was happening and it irritated her. So that was another little point. Um, anyway, so may, um, GSOW has 106 as of today, vac vaccine pages tagged um, as having to do with vaccination. Um, and the page views as of today are over almost 5 million, which is super awesome. Um, yeah, so that's my little corner of GSOW. Um, I love doing the vaccine stuff. I do some other stuff too, but um, if you're interested, please reach out. Susan likes Facebook Messenger, um, and that's a little glimpse of what her profile looks like right now, so if you need to find her. Um, but then there's the email um, and our team website also. So thank you very much for listening and being interested in the team, and come join us. That was great. Oh, that was so fun. I forgot about the picture with the cracker on the head. <laughs> that makes me laugh so much when I see that. I think, oh my gosh, I have, there's a picture of me with a cracker on my head. <laughs> that was so fun. I, I, I really enjoy, I really enjoy that you're talking. I'm so glad that you, you were able to do it again with updated numbers. What a difference. Oh my yeah. gosh. I was looking I at know. that going, wow, look at how, how much different we're over a hundred. I think we're at 105 million page views now. So we've had 5 million page views since he wrote this in, um, awesome. Wow. September, something like that. Oh, I can't remember. October, when. October. Yeah. October? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we only have a couple questions that I think that are here. So, uh, let's see. The first one is from Jim. He says, I'm a Wikipedia editor too, addicted for more than 10 years, and I haven't touched an anti-vax or a vax page yet. So what do you want to say about that? I'm a little scared still of the big ones. I don't do a lot of edits or I don't do a lot of rewrites on the big ones. Um, I've kind of just done a lot of snooping around locally and I don't, I'm not sure where this person's from, but I'm sure they have both pro and anti-science people looking at state offices and local offices um, and start there. 
it's less intimidating. Um, you won't get a lot of like edit warring. So, yeah. We don't have a lot of pushback on the anti-vax pages, except from fans of the anti-vaxxers and they, they leave such obvious, I mean, it's so obvious when they put stuff in, like we'll say, you know, that they're an anti-vaxxer. We say it in, we do it correctly is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And they'll go in and they'll try to take it all out. And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. well, let me just revert that. That was 10 seconds of work. You know, it's not like they're doing anything major. The article, I don't think they really understand the rules. I don't think they really get it. No, no, most people don't know. Yeah. So it's not so much pushback on the anti-vax pages. And a lot of the anti-vax pages, like for Robert Kennedy Jr., and things like oh, that have yeah. already been written to some extent. And so there's mm -hmm. not that much to do. So we've just been working on the up and coming, but now they're very famous, like Dale Bigtree and um, yeah. Christian Northrup or Simone yeah. Gold. Yeah. Man, yeah, just awful. So our next question is for you is, oh gosh, I have to scroll up. Here it is from Eric. Uh, he says, if who, if anyone checks individual girl skepticism work edits, in other words, who watches the watchers? Uh, like, the, who's I, watching? I, I guess. guess. Well, I mean, the rest of Wikipedia, you know, anybody can stick. Um, <laughs> anybody can stick any page on their watch list. So I usually go in once a day, once a better day, and just see like what kind of action's been happening on the pages that I watch. Um, but Susan's not in there like checking our, you know, checking out everything we do by any stretch. Um, it's a very, Wikipedia yeah. is a very like, it's cool how it all shakes out. And, um, you know, at, vandalism doesn't last long. And um, there's a lot more people on there that are dedicated to like the rules and policies than people that aren't, so. And there are editors uh, who are pro-science, who are often, if not uh, fanatically, trying to find trip us up to find some find us doing something wrong and they make a big mm -hmm. case out of you know something that's just slightly wrong or whatever slightly <laughs> worded weird or, I don't know whatever <laughs> and they just go they just <laughs> will go all over us but anyway um what is the top GSOW vaccine page do you know you were just looking at the vaccine I'm not off the top of my head that's a great question how do they I guess I could look really quick hopefully um I'll sing a song. I'm a little teapot, short and I can look stop. at the question. I'm looking now as it's loading and it's there. And we have 106 pages. Yeah, you're absolutely up to date on that. That's perfect. 105 million. Okay, for um, in total. So the top of all the Wikipedia pages we've written. Oh, this is great. Of all the Wikipedia pages that we have written that are vaccine related, the number one viewed is at 441,000 is the 1976 swine flu outbreak. And that's because we wrote that page a long time ago. Oh. But I learned a lot about that. That was really interesting about should they give the flu vaccine to people not knowing if we were going to end up having an outbreak? Because that could have been a that could have been a pandemic, but it yeah, it wasn't as bad as everyone thought it would be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huge yeah. amounts of money spent on that. It was, it was very scary. So anybody want to look at that at 1976? But the Dell Big Trees next. Uh, we've yeah. also wrote America's Frontline Doctors. Yes, that's right. That was pretty recent, wasn't it? Yeah, 323,000 page views. Wow, Ooh. nice. Simone Gold, um, Paul Offit, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, but most currently, in the last week, the page that's gotten the most views at 11,000 views is Robert Malone. Do you remember who he is? I can't quite remember who he is. Is he the guy who thinks he invented uh, RNA uh, vaccines or something like that? Oh yeah, I think so, yeah. He's all over the news yeah. right now. I, I mean, just like everywhere. <laughs> Somebody goes, oh my God, that guy. <laughs> when you put up the other one, um, when you put up the other question, you asked a question if anybody's heard of this person who was it that you was it was it Christian or somebody? Dave Ramsey. Oh yeah, yeah. Dave Ramsey. He's he held yeah. Christmas parties that are unmasked. No one's allowed to wear a mask near him. Just amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Is that all the quick wait? Here's some oh, somebody knows him. Yep. Portland, Oregon banned for uh fluoridation. 
Idaho has been called Mississippi of the mountains along with the deep south. Wyoming has very low rax, vaccine rates. However, the far oh, northeast man. has a high vaccine rate. What do you think is more, what do you think is relatively unique about the culture and teacher, people in Maine? That's an awesome question. Ooh. How much time do you have? <laughs> and that's um, it's super diverse. So we have um, a very densely populated first congressional district um, around the city of Portland and Southern Maine. And then the rest of the state is our second congressional district. And they're so different. Um, and the second district is really interesting because it flip flops between red and blue. It's very purple. Purple. I live in the second <laughs> district. Um, and it's politically fascinating, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. Our vaccine rate for COVID has been high also. Um, I mean, I think people are mostly sensible, but as you probably know, like anti-vaxxers are just really loud. So I think the campaign that I was on was fantastic and just confident and played to people's strengths of just being logical and caring about our communities and caring about our kids. That was the, the slogan was protect Maine's children. Um, so yeah, that's what we kind of ask ourselves that all the time yes, though. That was a very strange, um, when you sh first joined GSOW and you were telling me about vaccine, uh, I mean, the campaign, what was it called? Campaign one, question one? Ours was no on one. Yeah. Yeah. It was one. so confusing because it was no on something, but yeah. the no was to keep, keep it. So it wasn't to keep the new law. It, it was yeah. just. Yeah, I hate it when the media, whenever it's done that way, and it just seems like that's done that way on purpose to confuse the, the voters. Well, in Maine, the law is that if you have a referendum campaign, the wording on the ballot has to be exactly the same as the wording on the petition that people are signing. Mm -hmm. So the petition wording was like, do you want to overturn the new law? So we said, oh. no, it's great don't no. overturn the that law was, right gotcha yeah yeah it's just i've seen this in california but it's oh, very confusing what were the other six states i think california's one that california is one um i remember that passing and man that was a big deal ted ted no, what yes. was his name our our paul uh, ted lou right ted lou yeah he's a pediatrician yeah yeah he had heinous things thrown at him on sidewalks I mean, oh i would yeah i would not yeah. be surprised it's still happening wouldn't be shocked um, so Connecticut, Maine, New York, California, Mississippi, and West Virginia, which is surprising, but I've actually heard that West Virginia might be walking it back. So I'm not positive what their status is right now. Um, but yeah, only six so far. Which is the side? Oh, uh, Joel, Joel says, what side appears to be making gains, pro-vax or anti-vax? now i mean before so this was right up until covid started and so all the conversations we were having were about routine vaccines that have been around forever um and then we just launched directly into like this new ridiculousness um it's hard for me to say like i'm so entrenched in the pro side um but also like have had experiences with people that have been close to me who have been drawn in by the anti side um, so I really, I'd like to say that it's pro, I think most people approve of and support vaccines, but the anti-vaxxers are so persistent. They're so loud. so loud. And I mean, yeah, absolutely. You're not seeing people going in and marching in and saying, we are going to wear a mask. How dare you not let us, I mean, you're not right. seeing that kind of stuff and it, it, it's, it's not making the news too. And again, we got to sell newspapers. We got to get clicks on our articles. So we got to make mm -hmm. it is big and is loud and is obnoxious all we're doing is we're trying to keep just go forward i mean this you guys got to remember when we started um on these vaccine pages was there was no covid even slightly we've been doing this for right 10 years so <laughs> whenever we first started with the covid lockdowns i can remember having the conversation with everybody in the cabal hey you guys we really should concentrate on these vaccine things because i think it's going to be a big deal we're yeah. going to get a vaccine in a few years so i think we really need to get <laughs> yeah it happen a lot faster than we thought that was for sure but we let's get these things in order because people are going to want to know and we've been doing it in other languages too the pages that um 
that she was talking about the 106 they're not all english there's a lot no. of misinformation in languages outside of english english is in pretty good shape compared to a lot of languages it's really sad so we have a lot of people on our team that are editing in languages other than english 45 percent of the work we do is not in english so that's that's pretty awesome we're almost at 2000 pages so <laughs> oh i gotta get on that i, I know we're getting more out 19 <laughs> 68 or something like that it, it's, oh, it's cool. really getting all close right. so I, i'm wondering who's going to hit the 2000th mark all right allison thank you so much for giving us your time today that thank you so great. much everyone it was great yeah i'm great seeing you here and i love your hair i think it looks fantastic fantastic okay so how do i do that oh uh, there she goes okay so we have one more talk, one more talk. This is also a current talk, but before I get to that, I just wanna mention real, real quickly, if you're having a, a good time, you're enjoying the show and you think this is a valuable um, that we're doing, please consider making a nice donation to our um, nonprofit, which is called About Time. You can also uh, subscribe to us on Amazon Smiles, which will give you a small, donation of your sale so you don't pay for it it's all the that amazon and you know amazon's okay with could could get rid of some of their cash on hand and the small percentage of it will go to our um will go to the nonprofit that you say that you wanted to go to so never purchase anything off of amazon unless you have some kind of nonprofit that is receiving some kind of money i think the uh, anti-vax group uh, Robert Kennedy's, I think they got $42,000, I think last year from Amazon Smiles, believe it or not, because people have have uh, been using that as their nonprofit. Um, it's, their group is called something that looks totally innocuous, and like uh, Children's Health Freedom or so. I, don't, I can't remember, but you know, a lot of people will be taken in by the name that think it might, it's a Provax group. So, um, uh bezos is gonna help us out with a little bit of donation so that's amazon smiles and i've just given you the link to our uh donate button on paypal thank you to those uh, few people who have already given a donation we really appreciate it it really makes a big difference not only does it keep me wanting to do more events like these kinds of things but it's going to help out in the long run and um and this supports a lot of people in a lot of places so i appreciate that so our next speaker is going to be our last speaker of the day, and we're running pretty much on time. Just a couple. I'm I'm going a couple minutes long because I can, and we're at the end, and we've done so good the whole day. Now this is going to be JD Sword, and he's one of the people you should be watching for because he's he's getting his name out there, and he's starting to do a lot more in um, uh, in just I'm running across him and his work a lot more often and i think he's going to talk about himself so i'm not going to talk too much about him but jd sword is um gave a talk for skeptical um, this last fall but it was on operation onion ring as because he was one of the participants in helping making that work so uh jd's going to be talking about something completely different so i don't know what this is really it's about the satanic panic which is going to be fun so wait I have my Satan devil hat that people have actually been loving this as I wear it around town. They've been stopping me and, and telling me how much they adore my hat. So I have to put my devil's hat on to listen to JD's talk. So um, is JD pinned over here or about to be? Here? Yeah, no, you have to make him a co-host before I can pin him. Oh, well, fine. That means I have to look <laughs> at my little list again. Oh, gee, I've been so good all day. Oh, I've got to go to gallery. That's what my problem is. Okay. Oh, look at all these people. Open the doors and there's all the people. And JD, where are you on this massive wall of people? Okay. There he is. Okay, make co-host. I love this Zoom. I didn't even know what it was at the beginning, but now I'm learning so much about these things. Okay. JD was making dinner with his kid. He needs to turn on his camera before I can spotlight him too. Oh yeah, you got to turn the camera. He was—he's a good dad. He was there making, we go. Thanks, he was JD. Making dinner and 
And, you know, he's on the East Coast, so he kind of got confused about the time. Oops, <laughs> wrong person. There you are. Sorry, Deborah. <laughs> Deborah. Gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm really hungry now. Craig's talk really made me want to go get something good to eat. There, there we go. All right. All right. So if you want to, is he spotlighted? No, oh, I've got to go on. Oh, I've got to go on that. Speaker view. There you are. It's so hey. good to see you. Okay. Yeah. So you ready? You're, I'm ready you're our closer. How does that feel? Good, good. <laughs> okay, I'm going to disappear. You go ahead and you have okay. your little, and I'll be right here. Remove me. Um, where is... There we go. That's better. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, coming out to listen to me uh, speak. Uh, tonight, I'd like to start by introducing myself briefly. So my name is JD Sword. I'm the host of the podcast, The Devil in the Details, where I talk about topics of interest to both skeptics and Satanists. So a lot of exorcism, demonic possession, uh, the satanic panic, which of course we'll be talking about tonight. I'm a writer for Skeptical Inquirer. I've done articles about Catherine Hepburn's haunted house, demonic text messages, demonic possessed cats, um, a live exorcism by the one and only Bob Larson. Um, I write for AIPT Comics. Uh, I give skeptical analysis of movies like The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, and TV series like Fall River and The Sons of Sam. Uh, I'm a member for the Center for Inquiry, the Gorilla Skeptics of Wikipedia, like Susan mentioned, and the uh, Church of Satan, although tonight I'm not going to be uh, speaking on behalf of the Church of Satan. So today I'd like to talk about the belief, a uh, very dangerous belief, that a highly organized and clandestine cabal of devil worshippers are trafficking children across the country and whose members occupy the highest echelons of power. And that definition applies equally as well to the satanic panic as it does to QAnon. And the reason for that, I will argue, is very simple because they're the same thing. According to a recent poll by the Public Religion Research Center, roughly 14% of Americans, that's 30 million people, uh, fall into the category of QAnon believer. Um, that's as many as all white evangelical or mainline Protestants. And it's not just people on the lunatic fringe. 36 congressional candidates for the uh, 2022 midterm election, that's this year, uh, have expressed some level of support for QAnon ideas, a very dangerous set of beliefs which have inspired real world violence. From the uh, member of the Gambino, crime, the Gambino crime boss, Frankie Calli, who was murdered for being a member of the uh, deep state, to uh, Matt Coleman, who murdered his 10-month-old and two-year-old because he believed they had reptile DNA. QAnon is something that skeptics, neither skeptics nor Satanists, can take too seriously. Uh, and as such, we need to begin by understanding where it came from. You know, how did we get to this point? So accusations of uh, ritual child sacrifice and cannibalism are nothing new in Christianity. The Romans accused the early Christians of the same. Uh, rival Christian sects accused one another. Throughout the Middle Ages and uh, the more than 200-year history of witch trials and heretic trials, uh, people were hung or burned at the stake for uh, such, a, such crimes. But for our purposes, we're going to start with the satanic panic of the 1980s and the 90s. So what was that? How did it begin? In a nutshell, the satanic panic was like QAnon, but on a much wider scale. Uh, you had police officers, social workers, psychiatrists, all believed this idea that these devil worshiping cults were real and killing millions of children every year. 
And the public came to believe this because the idea was validated and disseminated through TV talk show hosts like Oprah, Sally Jesse Raphael, and of course, Geraldo Rivera. So how did that all start? So let's begin with the 1960s. There was a tremendous change in the cultural landscape, along with interest in mind-altering drugs and the sexual liberation. Uh, there was an explosion of interest in alternative religious practices, the occult, parapsychology, astrology, uh, what was called Eastern mysticism. And as a response to that, we saw not only the birth of the modern skeptic movement, but also the founding of the Church of Satan in 1966 by this man, Anton Xander LaVey. Uh, Satanism, as codified by Anton LaVey, was and always has been atheistic and law-abiding. It holds both animals and children in the highest regard as the purest forms of carnal existence. Nevertheless, the prejudice uh, persists that Satanists are lurking around every corner, looking to snatch up your children. Uh, and part of the reason for this uh, was that Christian, Christian evangelicals at the time really believed that they were living during the end times, that their Christian way of life was being, uh, was being threatened and uh, undermined by secularism. Uh, part of that response was to uh, try to use the medium of entertainment to spread the gospel and call people back to the church. So these two movies, Rosemary's Baby, which was released in 1968, and The Exorcist, which was released in 1973, really scared the hell out of people, or rather into them. Uh, it really brought people uh, kind of, kind of, you know, back into the fold. Uh, but then you also saw an industry of uh, so-called ex-Satanists crop up, folks like Mike Warnke, America's number one Christian comedian. And Warnke made millions talking about his time as an alleged satanic high priest, uh, starting with his 1972 book, The Satan Seller, and throughout his uh, comedy act. Now, Christian comedy, you might think that sounds like good, clean fun for the whole family, but Warnke's act was he would intersperse uh, lurid tales of his time as a satanic high priest throughout his, his jokes. So then in 1980, the book Michelle Remembers was published, uh, purporting to be a memoir of Michelle Smith as she recovered repressed memories of childhood abuse at the hands of devil worshipers under hypnosis by her therapist and future husband, Lawrence Pazder. Uh, and Michelle Remembers really kickstarted the satanic panic proper and would go on to become the blueprint by which future cases of satanic ritual abuse, uh, which is a term that Lawrence Pazder made up, uh, would be evaluated. And even though uh, Michelle tended to kind of avoid the limelight, uh, uh, Pazder, on the other hand, would go on to uh, travel the country and give uh, talks to law enforcement. He was part of this group called the Cult Crime Impact Network, uh, which would kind of go around and lecture to law enforcement and kind of push this narrative of uh, cult crime and what to look for. Uh, both Pazder and Warnke would go on to appear on primetime TV. They were on the 2020 program uh, called uh, the ABC program 2020 in an episode called The Devil Worshippers. And Pazder, of course, would later go on to be a consultant for probably the most infamous uh, court case to come out of the satanic panic, the McMartin trial. Now, you might think that if it were really true that millions of children were being killed every year as believers of these uh, in these cults claimed, at least some evidence of these crimes uh, would probably be found. If satanic ritual abuse survivors like Michelle Smith and ex-Satanist high priest Mike Warnke were coming forward with the truth, you might believe that at least some of these cultists ought to have been uh, accused, if not brought to justice, right? Wrong. In fact, uh, absence of evidence was actually taken to be um, proof as to how powerful and influential these cults were. Uh, apparently, they could destroy uh, any and all forensic evidence, but they just couldn't shut up a six-year-old girl and a, a Christian comedian. Um, and what kind of evidence was presented as proof of these cultists, you might ask? 
Well, virtually any piece of graffiti depicting uh, an upside down cross or a pentagram was interpreted as being uh, proof that cults were operating in the area. And the second most pervasive piece of evidence of defective detective work was uh, animal mutilations. In the 70s, there was this panic in the Midwest over uh, livestock deaths. You know, farmers would find their livestock supposedly drained of blood with marks that were made with allegedly surgical precision. And in the 70s, they were blamed on aliens and UFO abductions. Well, during the satanic panic, the blame shifted to cultists. And in each case where proper investigations were performed by qualified professionals, the marks on the body were found to be consistent with natural predation and scavenging. But what about the recovered memories of satanic ritual abuse? Can memories of childhood abuse really be repressed, then recovered years, even decades later? Now, this is a very controversial topic. Memory researchers and psychologists such as Elizabeth Loftus say no. Our best current understanding of how memory works is not compatible with repression. There's no explanatory mechanism that's currently uh, accepted. It's much more likely that alleged repressed memories of childhood abuse are uh, what are known as false or pseudo memories. Even so, psychiatrists and repressed memory advocates continue to insist that uh, memories recovered during therapy are genuine, and some subset of them continue to believe that satanic cults do in fact exist. How did skeptics and Satanists respond to this back then? And you know, what can we do moving forward today with, with QAnon? Uh, well, representatives of the Church of Satan appeared on various TV talk shows at the time, like Sally Jesse Raphael, dispelling myths about Satanism. And the administration uh, consulted with and continues to this day to consult with law enforcement on cases of alleged cult crime. Um, they also consulted with the Committee for the Scientific Examination of Religion when they published their report, Satanism uh, in America in 1989 at the height of the Satanic Panic. Anton LaVey would uh, grant interviews occasionally. He was very selective of who he spoke to though. Uh, one of the more important interviews at the time was to investigative journalists, John Trott and Mike Hurtenstein, who were ultimately the ones who published the expose article that outed Mike Warnke as a fraud. So one of Warnke's many uh, claims was that he had flown to San Francisco in this satanic meet and greet where he met Anton LaVey. Excuse me. And Trot and Hertenstein, to their credit, actually uh, interviewed Anton LaVey, and he set the record straight, saying uh, in no uncertain terms, the idea that I called a meeting in San Francisco, or if I had, that I would have invited him is absolute bunk. There's no way I would have had any dealings with Warnke. Uh, another example of direct action was a lawsuit filed by Anton LaVey against Pazder and the various publishing and distribution companies responsible for Michelle Remembers, claiming that the book was defamatory. Um, while the lawsuit did nothing to stop the sale of the book or undo the damage that the book would cause, uh, it did, however, squash a movie deal that was in the works at the time. So much the better. Finally, in 1992, FBI Special Advisory Agent Kenneth Lanning published his Investigator's Guide to Allegations of Ritual Child Abuse, in which he concluded absolutely no evidence to support that satanic cults exist. Which brings us to today. A lot of people point to Pizzagate in 2016 as the birth of QAnon, but the same kind of fears and conspiratorial delusions that fueled the satanic panic drive QAnon today. The difference is that the ideas no longer need to be validated or disseminated by the mainstream media because the ways in which people are exposed to information is vastly different. Uh, it's much, much easier in the age of algorithms to be led down the rabbit hole, and the general public already believes that by passively consuming uh, suggested videos or reading tweets that they're doing their own research. So what exactly can we do about this? And, you know, the kind of true crime model TV shows that, that I've talked about for AIPT comics and stuff, you know, they also don't help. Uh, first, I think that we need to get serious about it. It doesn't matter how silly or ridiculous or inconsequential something is, uh, no claims should go unchallenged. What we as skeptics think is dumb could be what starts someone down the path of QAnon. So, you know, the, the, the two 
the two TV series here, Fall River and Sons of Sam, you know, by no means were were they huge hits. I, I think maybe uh, Sons of Sam was trending on Netflix for maybe about a week, um, but you know, ultimately it wasn't really anything to write home about. But that's not to say that some people might not watch that and think, you know, oh wow, that was really compelling, or I didn't know that. And you know, that could be all all it takes to to kind of lead them down the rabbit hole. Uh, Another great example is um, Emma Romero, PhD grad student at the University of California, just published an article in the first Skeptical Inquirer volume of this year discussing the current state of satanic ritual abuse. So yes, despite undergoing a name change and a facelift, it's still an idea, a set of ideas that's very much alive and well today. Uh, and QAnon simply isn't going to go away. Those of us who advocate for a scientific worldview and critical thinking, I, I personally believe, must defend and promote those now more than ever. The, the hardcore believers of QAnon might be set in their belief, but hopefully some people are not too far gone and they can be reasoned with. Um, and, you know, I'll be honest, this is not an area that I'm particularly good at. I, I think it's important. I think it needs to, to happen. But like with, uh, anti-vaxxers and COVID deniers, personally, I'm to the point where I'm like, you know, okay, just, just get away with, get away from me. I don't even want to talk to you. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's important. It's, it's a dialogue that needs to happen. And someone who does do an excellent job talking with conspiracy theorists and whom I think we could all learn a lot from is the author of Escaping the Rabbit Hole, Mick West. I highly recommend his book. Um, to anybody who you know is interested in how people come to believe in conspiracy theories and you know how to carry on a dialogue uh, a dialogue with them and if we want our ideas to be heard you know we need to understand how to talk with people instead of talking down to them because nobody wants to be condescended to um it's like my friend kenny biddle always says you know listen to patrick swayze be nice so it's my hope that together uh, we can conjure the devil of doubt to come forth and call mankind to challenge all things and question all things with the Luciferian light of reason to guide our way ever forward through these times. Because, you know, QAnon, it's, it's not, it's not going to go away. You know, here we are, we've had a change of guard and they're still going strong. It's kind of like um, the Millerites, you know, some people have, have drifted away, others they're going to carry on until who knows when. So if anybody wants to learn more about the, the satanic panic or QAnon or any of the other topics that I've mentioned, you can find my podcast, The Devil in the Details, on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, pretty much anywhere that you listen, you know, listen to podcasts. You can read my articles for a Skeptical Inquirer at skepticalinquirer.org or, you know, go grab yourself a physical copy. The November-December issue, um, I talked about the true case behind The Exorcist. And Ben Radford and Kenny Biddle did an excellent uh, examination of, of the true story behind a, another film, The Entity. Uh, you can read my articles for AIPT Comics at aiptcomics.com. And I've made appearances on uh, Kenny Biddle's Skeptical Help Bar on his YouTube channel, I Am Kenny Biddle, and the YouTube channel that he co-hosts, Three Tortured Souls, uh, as well as uh, another satanic podcast um, similar to mine, The Demented One. So with that, uh, thank you all very much for your time and attention, and I wish you all well. Fantastic. What a good speaker. Just great. Nice way to uh, end the, the series with a nice upbeat talk on sa satanic and Satanism. <laughs> but actually, it was very, it was very positive. It's very positive. I, I really like that. Let me get me to there I am. Oh, look, I am be cutting off my horns. Is in here holding. I love that hat. That's, I love that hat. It's so cute. I've been wearing it all for months. And, and I'm not <laughs> kidding. People will come out and they will. Uh, um, talk to me and say, hey, I love your hat. That's so great. I might wear something like that. I'm thinking, well, go ahead. I think it's great.
Oh, it looks very warm. I think I could use it. Oh, it warm. is very warm. Yeah. I, <laughs> well, you're colder in a colder place than I am. Okay, let's see what questions we have. So, although the Church of Satan may support rational, constructive ideas, is it a good or bad example of bad marketing or being self-defeating? I mean, no offense, but would you not agree that a group that associates itself with Satan would likely turn away people who might be sympathetic to the skeptic cause? So I, I just kind of had a, um, a similar talk about that because um, there's, there's a group and I'm not going to, I'm not going to name, I'm not going to name who they are, but purportedly they offer uh, services to people who have been accused of satanic ritual abuse. Um, I guess in terms of, you know, counseling or understanding what their legal rights and everything are and you know my whole thing was there's maybe there's not other groups that do that currently i, I know there used to be one I, I think it was called like the false memory association or something something like that but i think the group ended up enfolded but but my whole thing is if if you are allegedly part of this conspiracy, if people think that you are to blame, it seems like a bad idea to put yourself out there trying to help somebody's cause, you know, while kind of beating the drum. So, you know, maybe in a sense, some people might be turned away from skepticism, you know, because they kind of see the, the branding that I have. And, you know, that's, that's fine with things like satanic ritual abuse and false memory. I would never kind of put myself out there with, you know, I would never involve myself in somebody's particular case, you know, because of, you know, it, it, it very well might hurt them. I think, however, some people might kind of see what I see in the sense that, you know, if a certain kind of religious mentality is closed-minded and detrimental to science, you know, and the idea is that you're supposed to take things on faith and not question, then having that kind of belief and reason and the element of doubt is something that's satanic. So I think some people, you know, might appreciate that and pick up on it. And it speaks to uh, it speaks to skepticism in a way that other people don't pick up on. You know, for example, with the Church of Satan, uh, ritual magic is an undeniable part of the religion. You know, Anton LaVey believed in and practiced magic, and that's not to say that as a, as an individual Satanist you have to, but you can't pretend that it's not part of the canon and it's not part of the history. And I think some Satanists have an idea of skeptics as, well, those are the people that they just want to debunk everything. You know, they don't, they don't believe in it. They, they, they're not willing to, to even kind of examine the evidence for it. They think it's, you know, they think it's bullshit. They think that, that we're crazy, we're stupid. And that kind of turns them off. So what I hope to do is kind of present sort of a different flavor of skepticism and kind of bridge bridge the gap between. So I think that was a very rambly kind of answer, but I hope it, I hope it addressed well, that. I have an answer too to follow up on that, JD, is um, I don't know if anybody remembers uh, Penn and Teller Bullshit, the show mm -hmm. that we played on Showtime. And when years ago, when that came out, gosh, it's been years ago, the, um, we used to have a forum at the JREF where was before Facebook, where we could actually talk to each other, kind of like, you know, we could gather. And so there was a huge community. People would say, what brought you to skepticism? And a large chunk of people said they had seen bullshit, uh, the Penn and Teller show. And that brought them to the forum and, and to skepticism and things. And I thought, I hate that, you know, they just, the TNA, I just couldn't stand it. And the, <laughs> and the use of profanity and I, I just didn't like the personality. I like Teller a lot, but he never really says anything. But I really like the person. Uh, I liked uh, the message they were doing. Sometimes they got a little simple, simplistic, 
but I, I, I really wasn't into it, but so many people told me, I loved that. That was great. They were just right out there in your face telling you this. And, and I got a lot out of it and I liked the TNA and all that. And I thought, and, and the consensus within our, within the discussions we were having is it takes all kinds of places, all kinds of areas of people doing it in a different way. You know, maybe this satanic, uh, Satanism might not be the way, but maybe this other area is, and to pull it all in, whatever it is that draws people in and getting to become critical thinkers. Do you want to talk about the after-school Satan program? Do you know anything about that? Well, I know that the acronym, I know what the acronym spells. Um, I don't particularly. <laughs> I didn't even notice that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I mean, it, it has no affiliation with the Church of Satan. Um, I have my personal opinion on it. If that's if that's what people are asking for. No, I was uh, the GSW project wrote the after school Satan project, right? As it was kind of just hitting the news just at the very beginning. And it's already had 184,000 views. So it was it's a it's was at, it was made because the Good News Society, which is that very Christian right. um, after school program that is very dangerous to children. I mean, it teaches hellfire and 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 just this awful world but i think the after school satan um teaches like a non-bully non you know just kind of a ah, you know uh science pro science um pro science kind of thing but you could talk a little bit about some of the satanist things that they do too because i've seen some amazing things that the satanist uh the church of satan has done well uh, i mean after school satan that that was not actually the church of satan no, uh, it's not. It's something else, but it's yeah. I mean, as far as, a messaging. I mean, as far as, you know, I, I don't think religion has any place in schools. And I think that there's other organizations and clubs that already do a you know, very fine and commendable job of uh, teaching science and advocating for science in schools. Mm -hmm. When uh, when I read a lot of the uh, him at Metha's uh, posts on, he was used to be posting on Patheos, the friendly atheist. And he talks a lot about what's happening in religion. And it was post after post where, you know, some religion in the South or wherever the Bible belt was trying to push through something, you know, a, a tablet, one of those mm -hmm. 10 commandment tablets or whenever they're gonna put, uh, they were gonna hand out, they were handing out Bibles or whatever. It always came down to, all right, call in the Satanists, because that was that was the ultimate answer. You know, whatever you couldn't get them to stop pushing whatever religious thing was going on, the Satanists were like, okay, well, if you're ask, if if it's okay for this religion to do it, then we, it's okay for us. We're going to put up our what's his name, Bo, Bo the Bo Baphomet. Yeah, Baphomet statue right next to the Ten Commandment one. No problem. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> And shut things down they were like oh well I, I thought very well versed on that but I, I you know i don't believe that it was the the statue that that kind of brought an end to that and the threat of a statue, i would I thought. it you know it doesn't always work i mean then you just end up with one more religious icon you know i don't think they've ever been able to get one up and to stay up. up a state house but it's it's pulled down a lot of other stuff so i had a question from jeff he says, with the understanding that adherents are not a monolith and that there are multiple organizations in play, how much of modern Satanism do you reckon is earnest and how much of it amounts to a cosplay? Like my hat. Oh, I mean, it. I think that depends on, you know, a lot of different things that, that kind of depends on the individual. Um, you know, some people, I think, definitely want to play it being a satanist because they want to just get a rise out of christians or you know maybe they have a certain idea about what that means um you know and other people you know we always say that satanists are born not made that was something that that anton LeBay very much believed in and you know i think that's kind of how you can tell you know who's really sincere about it somebody who will tell you you know yeah i read the satanic bible and 
it was kind of like looking in a mirror. It was like, wow. So, you know, that's kind of putting uh, an identity on how I've always felt and, you know, who I've always been. Yeah, I, I think, I think it's, like I said, it, all areas are needed. And if this didn't work for the one, that's fine. It's, it reaches out to another personality somewhere else that this is like the best thing that they've ever had. I think it's, I think it's great. I think we should embrace all kinds of, um, uh, of avenues. And I, I think it's, I think it's been, I don't, I'm not a member of the, of the, the church, the, I, but then I'm not a member of any churches and I have, I don't even really um, participate much in the, uh, the other, satir the, the satirical group, um, the newly appendage, the flying spaghetti monster. I think it's funny, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. I, that's not my, I mean, I, I will, but I'm really not so much into the atheist community as some people are I'm more into the scientific skepticism stuff because I like that kind of stuff too. But um, I'm hearing lots of comments about what a great talk you did. Great slide presentation too. I'm going to send <laughs> my stuff to you because uh, that's, I'm going to have you do my slides, yours or Adrian. Um, yeah. And oh, the question, the satanic temple is strictly atheist, isn't it? Yes, as well as the Church of Satan as well as the church of satan yeah which is and i think anytime you're having a conversation with somebody too right you know if you can have a conversation and i'm not angry and yelling at you if you if people see your your uh, medallion and they want to have a reasonable talk or whatever if you can talk to them and and give give me your elevator pitch for like one floor jd like if you're in an elevator with somebody <laughs> and they see your medallion you got one floor what is it you're going to say they're going to go isn't that the satanic thing or whatever well typically uh, you know it, it it would it would depend on where i was as to whether or not i you know would be presenting it you know uh what's more you know is, is it more prudent for me to to kind of tuck it hide it or is, you know do i feel comfortable enough that no one's going to bother me i mean if somebody if somebody asked and some some people will have have noticed and found out you know I, I i would say you know yes yes it is and kind of just leave it at that if they have questions you know i would address the questions as they come mm -hmm. it's the same thing with the skeptics i guess too people are constantly trying to get us to change our name to something else with you know the brights or something i don't know what they want to do but it's like, yeah they're like oh but skeptics are like skeptics of climate change it's gonna be it's like you know we're not gonna find a better word we're already skeptical. Let's just embrace the damn thing. And right, it's a chance right. of having a conversation with a person, because that's almost the first thing out of my mouth is, yes, we are skeptics. We are critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. We're not anti-vax, anti-climate change, anti, mm -hmm. you know, we are uh, following the science on things. Mm -hmm. And so, and then depending on their answer and the look on their face, if it looks startled or they're nodding or they're smiling, then maybe you would give them a little more information or you know how many elevator stops you got to go that's one, of the, that, that's one of the things you know people will sometimes ask is you know well, why why the name satanism or you know why the name church of satan you know isn't it just essentially humanism you know why why couldn't it be something that's more uh more welcoming or friendly and it's like well because we don't necessarily want to be welcoming and friendly you know we don't want everybody to kind of come in under the tent flaps you know if if you if somebody finds it as a sticking point then that's kind of on them mm -hmm. and they can approach as they feel comfortable you know but the people that that see it and they are intrigued or they see it and they get it you know th those are the kind of people that i think you're more likely to have a productive conversation with absolutely so i want to uh, in this by saying that if anybody is interested, he gave you a whole bunch of different sites, the things that you could you could look and find more on, uh, find more on JD, but uh, he writes a column for Skeptical Inquirer magazine, and this is the latest, it's in this issue right here. Thank you, I didn't have my, <laughs> my copy yeah, on it. Handy. And Celestia Ward, a very good friend of ours, designed this cover, which is amazing. But um, the latest issue is this one. I just got it and I've been sitting down reading it. But um, JD does a column not only in print in the magazine, but you can find his column for Skeptical Inquire on the websites, um, skepticalinquire.org. I guess it's org. 
and yeah. uh, you can pull those up and they're very well written just like the presentation you just saw it's just orderly factual follows the citations and they go you know but his latest one that he did in this magazine was about the the boy and it was a boy not a girl that was in the exorcist and and who that person actually is or was and uh, the story behind it and how they got outed as to who they were but there's i mean there was a it was an actual story that was real is it really was a, ch a child who supposedly had been possessed by a demon and so on sadly he's dead right yes he died uh, last year yeah so it's a great story i didn't know it before and i think you just did something on the did you just do something in Amityville Horror? I know Kenny was talking about it. No, it was Exorcist. Kenny, yeah, yeah. You were doing The Exorcist, I believe, yeah. right? I have never seen that movie all the way through. I'm sorry to say. We need to have an exorcism uh, party. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm, I'm honestly not a fan. Like, th there's parts that I enjoy, but I, I don't know. I, I just can't find it scary, you know? And, and there, well, there you were it was the 70s it was terrifying in the 70s i was i, was, I, I guess i was 17 i wasn't allowed to go so i never saw it because it was in the theaters and i remember i remember reading years later whenever people were talking about demonic possession and how these people were levitating from the bed and that the priests and the people in the room would be yelling hold her down hold her down <laughs> and then the scientists are all let her go let her go <laughs> let's see what happens <laughs> will she float to the ceiling <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I've, you know, and I at one point in time legitimately believed that that demons were real, and I, I don't know. I just never found it interesting. Never found it scary. Yeah, I, I like the quote from uh, Beetlejuice where he, he says he's seen it. Like, I forget what it is, and my wife's gonna kill me if she knows I didn't get it right. But he's, you know, seen it like sixty-seven times or whatever, and it keeps getting funnier every time he sees it. Oh, a, a, a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a quote from Beetlejuice. He says uh, somebody will know the answer really quick yeah. in the next 30 seconds. How much you want to bet? Yeah, I can't get the number right. Oh, Linda Rosa said she saw the exorcist in Ecuador and people ran screaming from the theater. I mean, at the time it came out, they you know, they talked about people fainting in the theater and how much of that was a promo though to get people right to i think they even said something about like women were having miscarriages in the theater i remember that i remember <laughs> that women were having well what a great way marketing campaign my god um the iv scene was highly realistic yes okay that was a real fun fact that was a real iv that's why it was highly realistic oh. Oh, and if i remember what sorry the movie is I've seen it 167 times and it yes. keeps getting funnier every time. Right. What yes. movie is it? Thank you. That was Michael Keaton in uh, Beetlejuice. Well, what, what movie was he talking about? The Exorcist? Yeah. The Exorcist. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I've seen the Exorcist 167 times and it keeps getting funnier every time. Thank you, Vincent. I knew somebody would have the answer. So let's end this because I know that it's been a long day for most of us, including myself sitting in this chair. But thank you so much, JD. I really you. appreciate it. You did a fantastic sure. job. It's a nice way to end the um, the event for today. And all of these are gonna be on, on video later. I'm, um, so give me about a week. I'm gonna remove the spotlight on you guys. All right, guys, so we're winding it up now. That was so much fun um every time we do one of these things uh, one of these events this is the second, that wasn't me this is the second time we've had online uh skepticam it is the it pro i hope it's the last time that we have we are forced to do this i really want to do modern county skepticam in person but i can see doing these events again in the future because it's so fun to have people from all over the world who would never be able to come out to, to monterey to to um to attend a skeptic camp. I really think that these are important to be able to bring people from all over the world to, to um, on such a diverse set of topics. And boy, we had a diverse set of topics today, that's for sure. So announcements are that there's a lot of different events coming up. You can visit, um, there are, I, I just saw, I just got a notice from Oregonians from, for science and reason. I always say it wrong, I'm sorry, Janine. It's gonna have a meetup, um, your local meetup groups, 
uh, join local meetup groups because there's almost always some kind of event that you can go and visit and hang out and talk to people. Same online as in real person. Some places are actually doing real in-person talks. Um, I will have these videos up probably this week. It's going to be on our About Time uh, channel. And I put the link in the chat if you want to look at that. I believe if you want to copy the chat, if there was something that was said earlier today and you couldn't quite remember what it was, but you'd like to you'd like to have it. Um, I, those three dots at the bottom, I believe you can copy the chat. And that way, when I hang up this, you'll be able to actually see the chat. Um, go back and look at some of the links that were put in. Um, also, I will mention that we we are, you know, thank you people who have donated. Um, I really appreciate that. It makes me, like I say, want to put more events on. And if you will, if you're interested in doing that, we also have a Facebook donate area. We still, it's their still fees. They're still, they got to get their money. So Facebook, um, I put a link to that also in our, in the chat. And um, our donate for PayPal that's on our website. I put that in the chat. And I will put these on our YouTube channel whenever they whenever these videos come out. Thank you so much to Deborah and Adrian, who were my helpers today. They stayed the whole day and they were they were blocking people left and right, banning people. So no, we didn't have any problems at all. And uh, we really had very few technical issues. I mean, I guess I'd have to go back and look, but I, I, I'm not thinking that we had very many. So if you want to put on your own skeptic camp with your group um, and you're asked and you need help, I'm happy to help you out. Um, it's not as complicated as you think. And uh, finding speakers is, is fun. All the speakers we had today would probably be happy to do the same talk, other talks, or to speak to your group. So please contact them. And I put, I think everybody has their contact information on our website on the schedule for today. And um, there's books they've written and there's all sorts of things that they have done. Please check them out. And um, um, Thursday nights, we have Social Trivia by Susan. You can find it on my, on my um, Facebook page. Please come and join us. We've been doing it. 88 times. I think we just had our 88th game. We have never met, missed, missed a Thursday, including on Thanksgiving Day um, and uh, New Year's Day, all that. We 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 always keep going. There's about 30 people who consistently show up. It fluctuates who they are, but um, most of them are skeptics. And yeah, the Facebook page, let me put that in here really quick because I got my glasses on if I'm going to read it at a distance. Our Facebook page is right here. I'm going to put the link back into our the chat. See, every time it it just goes away. You guys don't realize I've got all these screens open, but if I click on something, they go away. So I just put the link to our Facebook account again. It's called um, About Time Project, and our YouTube channel. I think I'll put in there as well. And there are talks. I'm going to be giving a talk to the Commonwealth Club on Monday about Operation Onion Ring. And I believe the Commonwealth Club, you have to join it to be able to watch the video, watch the talk live. It's 2.30 in California time. But within a very short time, they're going to put it up on the YouTube channel. So that is going to be only the second time I've talked about Operation um, Onion Ring, which is something JD talked about not so long ago. I'm looking to see if there's any other questions or anything I got to address. Uh, Adrian produces a great skeptic camp for the Atheist Society of Calgary several months ago. I'm going to ask her to do another. Yeah. <laughs> Adrian is going, oh dear, I just got volunteered for it again and said, ha ha ha. Um, so we could do a lot of these, you guys. I'm telling you, there's so much talent in our community, so much talent, so many great stories. They're all out there. We just got to get them, you know, into a nice format, get them out and do it. And if it's something that you're interested in doing and you need a little help or you want some feedback, I'm happy to help. Um, Bay Area Skeptics is doing a virtual Skeptics in the Pub on Wednesday. It's casual. You don't have to wear pants. I mean, I think Jay Diamond never wears any pants. That's what I've been told. Um, it's on Zoom. And that's, uh, he put a link in there. And Jan asked how you say the chat, I believe you hit the, yeah. So if you go to the chat box at the very bottom, 
there's three little dots. It says if you click on it, it says more. And the first and what you do is you hit the first thing on there. It says save chat and that will save all your chat. And I've never done it, so I don't know where it saves it at, but I'm, I'm stalling a little bit before I end this so that you guys can go over there and you can in the chat. Ah, oh, thank you, Karen. Um, and Jay Diamond did assure everybody that that it's a requirement to show up to the various skeptics um, um, Zoom chat pantless. That's, I think, a requirement or skirtless or whatever they say. And is that all I have in here? Oh, the link to trivia. So social trivia by Susan is what it's called. And let me get the link to that. That's going to be on the Thursday. We start California time. We have a social at six and then it goes late. You do not have to stay the whole time. Oops. I must be hungry. I'm hitting the wrong buttons. I can't imagine that happening. Hitting the wrong buttons. I got to go back and I got to open chat again for here. And that is an event. And there's videos on my personal YouTube site for that. Okay, next Thursday, Barry Skeptics presents Skeptic Talk, Weirdness, What Fake Science and the Paranormal Tell Us About the Nature of Science by Tanner Eads. Oh, yeah. So that's going to be out. I only watch these. Sorry, because I'm doing trivia on Thursday, but I watch the video afterwards. I subscribe to their channel and watch them afterwards. And I suppose you can watch that video countless too. Okay, so Lois says she always saves the chat. It'll create a Zoom file, which has all the chats, if you want to know what's in there. You just have to click the little three dots to the far right in the text entry field in the chat, and it says save chat. Yep, that's all I got to do. Is it Jenner? We can't program. All right, so 508. I think we did really good today. We were on time. This was fun. I enjoyed myself. So it's so great to see you guys. And I'm going to end this because it's going to take about three hours <laughs> to format the video before I can even go on that. Thank Thanks you. for organizing it all. Take care, Susan. Yeah, thank Thanks, you guys. Susan. It was fun. It was so much fun. Thank you all of those speakers. They were great. I really, really learned a lot and it was so much fun. So Thanks, I'm going to- everybody. Thanks, Susan. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Susan. Bye, guys. Go ahead. Everybody say thank you. If you want to say thank you before I cut somebody off and I feel stupid Thanks. cutting them off. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> thank you. I really loved it. It was really what I needed. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, thank, no, you Tracy. Tracy. thank you, guys. It's yeah, I love doing this. I love being around you guys. It's tomorrow, Adrian. Yes, oh, yeah. we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> so I, I, I can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I just drove all the way from San Francisco to LA and I'm listening. Really? <laughs> Oh, how fun, Lori. You dropped out a couple yeah. times. I thought I had to put you back in a couple of times. I know, because I had to get out and go to the bathroom or something like that. You, know? you can go to the bathroom <laughs> in the car. Nobody cares. <laughs> We're not watching. Um, is there somebody in the car with you? No, it's just, just me. Oh, oh, so you have to go to LA with her. You have to go on a drive with her. I'm so I know, going, to, yeah, going down to see my grandkids. <laughs> That is super right. cool. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Hasta luego. Si se puede.